Okay, welcome to the second day of Between Substance and Subject Conference. Uh, welcome also to everyone watching us on uh, stream. Um, just know that uh, there's possibility of asking questions in YouTube stream. They will be answered if there is time for them. Uh, but now, without further ado, I uh, leave the floor to our first speaker of the day, Brigitte Sankaulen. Thank you, thank you so much, good morning. Um, yeah, the first speaker today is Birgit Sankaulen. Uh, everyone uh, knows uh, Birgit Sankaulen. Uh, she is a professor uh, and director of the Research Center for Classical German Philosophy at the Bochum University. Um, she is the co-editor of the uh, Hegel Studien, and uh, um, she directs uh, the new uh, Jacobi Dictionary uh, online. He published uh, uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> contribution about uh, Hegel, about Jacobi, about the relationship uh, between Hegel and Jacobi and Spinoza too. The title of the of the talk of Zankal is Sein in allem Dasein, Hegel's Multifunktionale Konstruktion Spinozas. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and all the, uh, thanks to the organizers to organize this very wonderful conference in Ljubljana. I will give my talk in German, as I know you all understand German very well. Okay. Spinoza, and we have a handout uh, with quotes, okay? Spinoza is Hauptpunkt der modernen Philosophie, entweder Spinozismus oder keine Philosophie. Diesem Satz und weiteren solchen Programmsätzen, die alle im Exposé dieser Tagung zitiert sind, sollten wir den folgenden Satz hinzufügen, aus dem klar hervorgeht, um was es sich bei all diesen programmatischen Aussagen handelt. Jacobi hatte erkannt, so Hegel 1817 in seiner außerordentlich wichtigen Heidelberger Jacobi-Rezension, Zitat, dass jedes konsequente Philosophieren auf den Spinozismus führen muss. Die ungeheure Bedeutung, die Hegel Spinoza zuschreibt, hat systematisches oder genauer systemisches Gewicht und diese Einschätzung hat nicht Hegel originär, sondern zuerst Jacobi getroffen. Das ist die Basis, auf der der gesamte Postkantianismus auch Hegel steht. In seinen Briefen über die Lehre des Spinoza 1785 und in erweiterter Zweitausgabe 1789 hat Jacobi die provokative Herausforderung seiner Doppelphilosophie formuliert. Zufolge dieser Doppelphilosophie meine Spinoza und Antispinoza gilt, dass Spinozas Ethik das einzigartige Paradigma schlechthin konsequenten Denkens darstellt und sie aber auch genau aus diesem Grund intentionale Freiheit, die Causa Finalis, völlig zu Recht als größtes menschliches Vorurteil ausschließt. Dem zum Trotz personale Freiheit zu verteidigen, impliziert darum die Entscheidung, den Sprung auf die Seite des Antispinoza zu tun. Kurz gefasst, Spinozas Philosophie ist unwiderleglich, aber nicht unwidersprechlich. No refutation, only contradiction. Diese Diagnose steht Hegel wie vor ihm schon Fichte und Schelling vor Augen. Bis auf den letzten Punkt gibt Hegel Jacobi in allen Punkten recht. Die schlechthinige Konsequenz der spinozanischen Metaphysik ist ebenso anzuerkennen wie das von Jacobi markierte Desiderat der Freiheit. Während aber Fichte und Schelling versucht haben, ein System der Freiheit durch den Austausch des leitenden Prinzips, Substanz oder Subjekt zu bewerkstelligen, hat Hegel eine andere Idee. Hegel will beide Seiten von Jacobi, Spinoza und Antispinoza zu einem neuen System der Freiheit verbinden. Das heißt, er will den Hiatus des Sprungs zu einem, Zitat, Übergang ermäßigen, und den von Jacobi vollzogenen Widerspruch in eine neuartige Widerlegung des Spinozismus integrieren. Das zeigt die berühmte Formel der Phänomenologie des Geistes bereits an, 
wonach, wir kennen es alle, das Wahre nicht als Substanz, sondern ebenso sehr als Subjekt aufzufassen und auszudrücken ist. Jedoch ist es zweierlei, ein solches Projekt zu formulieren und es tatsächlich durchzuführen. Die Durchführung ist es, die mich im Folgenden interessiert. Dabei zeigt sich, dass Hegel uns an verschiedenen Stellen seines Werks und vor allem sogar innerhalb eines einzigen Werks, der Wissenschaft der Logik nämlich, total verschiedene Versionen Spinozas bietet. Was jeweils der Standpunkt Spinozas ist, auf den man sich stellen soll, um auf den höheren Standpunkt der Freiheit zu gelangen, ist, so meine These, multifunktional konstruiert. Unabhängig davon lässt sich Hegels Beziehung zu Spinoza weder identifizieren noch erörtern. Auch der Versuch, sich gleichsam neutral zunächst an Hegels philosophiegeschichtlichen Vorlesungen über Spinoza zu orientieren, hilft hier nicht weiter, denn selbstverständlich ist auch diese, wie ich sie nenne, exoterische Version von Hegel konstruiert. Mein Vorschlag geht in eine andere Richtung. Hegels multifunktionale Konstruktion Spinozas lässt sich umso besser einschätzen, je genauer man beobachtet, welchen Gebrauch Hegel von der von Jacobi geprägten Formel vom Sein in allem Dasein macht. Jacobi, so meine weitere These, hat mit dieser Formel die Metaphysik Spinozas sehr genau getroffen. Hegel seinerseits hat sich die Formel zu eigen gemacht und setzt sie an vielen Stellen mit oder ohne Nennung von Jacobis Namen ein, um sie geradezu entgegengesetzten Deutungen von Spinozas Philosophie zu unterziehen. Welche Folgen dies hat, möchte ich in drei Schritten zeigen. Zuerst stelle ich Jacobis Spinoza-Formel genauer vor, dann verfolge ich Hegels Adaption der Formel in der Seinslogik und in der Wesenslogik der Wissenschaft der Logik. Im Ergebnis, einschließlich einer gewissen Überraschung am Ende, sehe ich Hegels Verhältnis zu Spinoza kritisch. Jacobis Formel vom Sein im allen Dasein. Sie ist Teil einer längeren Passage der Spinoza-Briefe, die Jacobi im ersten Brief an Mendelssohn übermittelt hat. Ich konzentriere mich hier aus Zeitgründen auf den Mittelteil, der dann auch die Beilage 7 der Zweitauflage von 1789 eröffnet. Allein dieser wiederholte Rekurs, zumal an so prominenter Stelle in einem der wichtigsten Texte Jakobis, also der Beilage 7, unterstreicht die Bedeutung dieses Passus. Kein Wunder darum, dass er Hegel ins Auge gefallen ist, der im Übrigen wie alle Postkantianer die Spinoza-Briefe, in der um substanzielle Beilagen, darunter auch um die Freiheitsabhandlung erweiterten Zweitausgabe gelesen hat. Das Textstück lautet wie folgt, und das haben Sie jetzt auf dem Handout, ich zitiere, der Gott des Spinoza ist das lautere Prinzipium der Wirklichkeit in allem Wirklichen, des Seins in allem Dasein, durchaus ohne Individualität und schlechterdings unendlich. Die Einheit dieses Gottes beruht auf der Identität des nicht zu unterscheidenden und schließet folglich eine Art der Mehrheit nicht aus. Ich hebe vier Punkte so klar und kurz und trotzdem klar wie möglich hervor. Der erste Punkt betrifft den methodischen Aspekt. Jacobi hält die Wahl der geometrischen Methode in der Ethik ausdrücklich für einen Irrtum, auf den Spinozas System, wie er sagt, nicht zurückzuführen ist. Hegel hingegen arbeitet sich mehrfach ausführlich an dieser Methode ab, insbesondere an den ersten Definitionen der Ethik, wie wir gestern schon gehört haben. Wie ernst man dies nehmen soll, einschließlich seiner merkwürdigen These, dass hier angeblich nur ein äußerer Verstand zu bestimmten Unterscheidungen gelangt, ist die Frage. Auf keinen Fall hat aber Jacobi die Grundlage dazu gelegt. Jacobi folgt nicht der geometrischen Methode. Festzuhalten ist im Gegenteil, dass Jacobi die rationale Erschließungskraft von Spinozas Ethik ausschließlich in dem mit äußerster Strenge und Konsequenz verfolgten Einsatz des Prinzips des zureichenden Grundes, der Vermittelung, erkennt. Darin ist er sich mit weiten Teilen der heutigen internationalen Spinoza-Forschung einig. Auf diese Weise ins Zentrum von Spinozas Philosophie vorstoßend, kann Jacobi dann selbstverständlich auch den geometrischen Beweisgang 
Dazu äh, weitere wichtige Dokumente, darunter Spinozas Briefe, vor allem den bedeutsamen Brief an Meyer, von dem wir gestern schon gehört haben, den Brief über das Unendliche mit genauem Zitationsapparat heranziehen. Darauf komme ich gleich zurück. Der zweite Punkt betrifft die sprachliche Form. Mit den Begriffen von Sein und Dasein wird Spinozas Rede von Substanz und Modus übersetzt. An anderen Stellen spricht Jacobi auch von Unendlichem und Endlichem. Für die Rezeption Spinozas um 1800 spielt diese sprachliche Übersetzungsleistung Jacobis eine ganz erhebliche Rolle. Nicht nur wird die ontologische Dimension der Ethik direkt herausgestellt. Die deutsche Sprache erlaubt es zudem auch, bereits sprachlich zwischen dem Sein und dem bestimmten Dasein des Seins, Sein in allem Dasein, genau die intrinsische Beziehung auszudrücken, um die es Jacobi geht. Nicht zufällig hat neben vielen anderen Hölderlin, Schelling, Fichte auch Hegel diese neue philosophische Sprache insbesondere in der Wissenschaft der Logik übernommen und wie ich meine, ist es überhaupt nicht abwegig zu vermuten, dass sich Heidegger dem später angeschlossen hat. Der dritte Punkt führt das bisher Gesagte zusammen. Jacobis in der Epoche neue Verständigung über die Philosophie Spinozas rekonstruiert die Ethik als eine konsequente Metaphysik der Immanenz. Epistemologisch, in der allerstrengsten Umsetzung des Anihilo Nihil Fit begründet, schließt sie ontologisch jeden der Begründungsfolge transzendenten Anfang und damit zugleich jede intentionale, an Verstand und Willen gebundene Handlung aus. Im Interesse einer vollständigen, in sich total geschlossenen Erklärung der Welt im Ganzen und des menschlichen Lebens in der Welt, einschließlich seiner ethischen Orientierung, setzt sie den absoluten Grund in ein schlechthin unendliches Ursein, wie Jacobi sagt, das das endliche Dasein in sich enthält und sich als Causa Immanenz darin manifestiert. Das ist in Jacobis Augen wohlgemerkt ein großartiger und sogar singulärer Entwurf, den er gegen alle möglichen Einwände und Korrekturversuche verteidigt. Für Jacobi ist das der Vorschlag der Moderne. Herausragend ist dabei Jacobis tiefes Verständnis nicht nur für die absolute, unvordenkliche Präsenz des Seins, oder der Wirklichkeit bei Spinoza, sondern vor allem auch für die von Spinoza konzipierte systemische Einheit von Sein und Dasein, die die Bestimmung absoluter, unteilbarer Unendlichkeit mit der immanenten Differenziertheit solcher Unendlichkeit verbindet. Wer dies Jacobi zufolge nicht verstanden hat, ist die rationalistische Metaphysik seitens Wolfs und Mendelssohns, der zufolge, und das ist das nächste Stück, was länger auf dem Hand aus ist, als ich es jetzt sage, der zufolge, Zitat, die unendliche Substanz, nur ein ungereimtes Aggregat aus endlichen Dingen, folglich auch die leere Einheit desselben, ein bloßes Abstraktum sei. So die Kritik von Christian Wolf. Im Gegenteil, so Jacobi, hat sich, Zitat, unter allen Philosophen keiner mehr als Spinoza gehütet, was nur ein Modus cogitandi ist oder bloße entia rationis für etwas Reelles anzusehen oder dafür auszugeben. Darum weist Jacobi auch Herders Vorwurf entschieden zurück. Nächstes Zitat. Sie werfen mir vor, lieber Herder, ich sähe wie alle Antispinozisten das große Ens Entium des Spinoza für eine Null, für einen abstrakten Begriff an, da ich es doch als das Prinzipium der Wirklichkeit in allem Wirklichen, des Seins in allem Dasein, man kann nicht orthodoxer angegeben habe. Spinoza, man beachte es wohl, ist in Jacobis Augen kein Rationalist. Spinoza denkt nicht abstrakt, sondern holistisch. Er sieht epistemologisch und ontologisch den Primat des Ganzen vor dem Teil. Deshalb ist er mit entsprechender Deutung auch von Denken und Ausdehnung als, Zitat, wesenhaften Ausdrücken des Seins in der Lage, nach dem Prinzip der Identität des nicht zu Unterscheidenden eine Einheit zu denken, die eine Art der Mehrheit nicht ausschließt. 
wie heutzutage Gilles Deleuze und Michael Della Rocca, ist Jacobi überzeugt, dass Spinoza bereits vor Leibniz im Beweis der Einzigkeit der Substanz diesem Axiom gefolgt ist. Im Interesse der Integration realer, wesentlicher Differenz hat er die bloß numerische Differenz, die Teilbarkeit von Teilen, der falschen Ansicht der Imaginatio zugeschrieben. Und das ist Jacobis, äh, Spinozas Argumentation äh, ab Lehrsatz 5 im Anlauf auf, die, auf den Beweis der Einzigkeit der Substanz. Das sieht Jacobi ganz klar. In aller Kürze ist ein vierter Punkt abschließend zu vermerken. Er betrifft drei Konsequenzen, die aus Jacobis Darstellung von Spinozas Metaphysik der Immanenz zu ziehen sind. Erstens ist es ausgeschlossen, das Sein gegenüber dem Dasein zu isolieren und es als eine eigenständige Größe oder ein Prinzip zu behandeln, aus der das Dasein allererst abzuleiten oder zu generieren wäre. Die Rationalität und überwältigende Stringenz von Spinozas Konzept besteht präzise darin, Zitat, jeden Übergang des Unendlichen zum Endlichen zu verwerfen. Unendliches und Endliches, Sein und Dasein, bilden ontologisch je schon den Zusammenhang einer in sich differenzierten Einheit, einer Alleinheit. Alles andere wäre ein irrationaler Verstoß gegen das Prinzip des zureichenden Grundes. Aus demselben Grund führt, ja, führt zweitens die Behauptung des Akosmismus oder gar Nihilismus in die Irre. Weder vertritt Spinoza ein akosmistisches Konzept, hier stimme ich Jitzhak Melamed völlig zu, noch ist Jacobi der Auffassung, dass Spinozas Metaphysik nihilistisch sei. Vielleicht kommen wir heute der Frage auf die Spur, warum sich dieses Missverständnis über Jacobis Position äh, eingebürgert hat, dass er äh, Spinoza Nihilismus vorwirft. Vom Nihilismus spricht Jacobi erst im Fall Fichtes, der Wissenschaftslehre Fichtes, aber nicht im Fall Spinozas. Die endlichen Dinge sind als Bestimmungen des absoluten Seins non entia, wie Jacobi unter Beiziehung des Satzes Determinatio est negatio, also von Jacobi äh, kommt der Satz in die Diskussion, sagt. Mithin kommt den endlichen Dingen keine vom Sein abgetrennte Existenz zu. Aber das heißt nicht, dass sie nicht existieren. Wie es die Formel besagt, das Sein ist im Dasein da. Dabei sieht Jacobi genau, dass die endlichen Dinge sogar auf doppelte Weise real und aktual, ewig und zeitlich existieren, wenngleich dies, wie Jacobi argumentiert, zur paradoxen Figur einer ewigen Zeit führt. Und bei allem gilt, dass für sich allein genommen, Zitat, die Gottheit schlechterdings der Wirklichkeit entbehren müsste, die nur im bestimmten Einzelnen sich ausgedrückt befinden kann. Die dritte hier relevante Konsequenz betrifft Jacobis alternative Position des Antispinoza, für die der Passus ebenso einen wichtigen Hinweis liefert. Das Stichwort lautet auf die bei Spinoza fehlende Individualität. Wie gesehen ist Jacobi überzeugt, dass in Spinozas Holismus einer in sich differenzierten Einheit das Einzelne Bestand hat, also nicht etwa untergeht. Jedoch ist das für sich sein individuellen Daseins etwas anderes als nur eine in der Einheit präsente Art der Mehrheit. Bezogen auf das Prinzip des nicht zu unterscheidenden, stellt es also die Einzigartigkeit einer Unterscheidung dar, die nicht in einer übergreifenden Einheit vermittelbar ist. Und hier fokussiert Jacobi das unmittelbare Wissen. Ich überspringe einen Passus über den jungen Hegel in Frankfurt, äh, weil die Zeit äh, vermutlich fehlt. Ich gehe gleich weiter. Also das war eine Sequenz über den Frankfurter Hegel im Übergang zur Differenzschrift. Äh, Hegel ist mit dem Plot völlig d'accord. Jetzt geht es aber darum, was für ein System Hegel aus alledem machen kann. Was macht Hegel unter diesen avancierten Umständen, die nicht mehr nur lebensphilosophisch inspiriert sind, wie in Frankfurt aus Jacobis Vorlage. Oder anders formuliert und dasselbe meinend, 
welches ist denn der Standpunkt Spinozas, der als wesentlich und notwendig zuerst anerkannt werden muss, um darauf aufbauend zu dem höchsten Standpunkt der Freiheit zu gelangen. Wie früher schon angedeutet, gibt Hegel darauf zwei völlig verschiedene und sogar widersprüchliche Antworten, die er jedes Mal mit Jacobis Formel unterlegt. Im einen Fall befinden wir uns mit dem Substantialitätsverhältnis an weit fortgeschrittener Stelle der Wesenslogik. Im anderen Fall sind wir an den Anfang der Seinslogik katapultiert. Beginnen wir mit der Seinslogik. Zitat auf dem Handout, jenes Reale in allem Realen, das Sein in allem Dasein, welches den Begriff Gottes ausdrücken soll, ist nichts anderes als das abstrakte Sein, dasselbe, was das Nichts ist. Dass Hegel hier auf Jakobi Spinoza Briefe rekurriert, sagt er an dieser Stelle nicht ausdrücklich, vielleicht fehlen deshalb auch entsprechende Quellenvermerke in vielen Ausgaben der Wissenschaft der Logik. Wohl aber macht Hegel den Bezug in der kleinen Logik der Enzyklopädie explizit und hier sogar gleich im ersten Paragraphen der Seinslogik, wo auch der Adressat des Satzes eindeutig bestimmt wird. Auf dem Handout, Zitat, in dem Realität bereits eine Reflexion enthält, so ist dies unmittelbarer in dem ausgesprochen, was Jacobi von dem Gotte des Spinoza sagt, dass er das Prinzipium des Seins in allem Dasein sei. Über die Quelle gibt es also kein Vertun. Dringend diskussionsbedürftig ist aber, wie Hegel die Formel Jacobis gebraucht und warum er so verfährt. Die Antwort auf das Wie ist offenkundig und beinahe schmerzhaft. Mit der These, dass das Sein in allem Dasein nichts anderes sei als das abstrakte Sein, dasselbe, was das Nichts ist, verdreht Hegel den Sinn der Formel Jacobis geradezu gewaltsam ins glatte Gegenteil. Wie vorhin beschrieben, steht die Formel in Jacobis Darstellung der Ethik Spinozas für den ganz neuen und einzigartigen Entwurf einer Metaphysik der Immanenz. Ausdrücklich stellt Jacobi dieses Konzept der Immanenz gegen das Missverständnis der rationalistischen Metaphysik, die Spinoza den Vorwurf macht, die unendliche Substanz aus Endlichem zu abstrahieren und als leere Einheit eines bloßen Abstraktums zu denken. Genau das ist jetzt aber, so als wolle er sich auf die Seite der Schulmetaphysik schlagen, die Behauptung Hegels, der es selbstverständlich besser weiß, wie gleich auch im Fall der Wesenslogik zu sehen ist. Hier, an dieser Stelle der Seinslogik, zögert Hegel aber nicht, Jacobis Formel der Immanenz radikal umzudeuten und dabei auch den letzten Satz über die Identität des nicht zu unterscheidenden, die eine Art der Mehrheit nicht ausschließt, wohlweislich beiseite zu lassen. Zustande kommt so die total verfremdete Formel abstrakter Identität und damit das folgenreiche Konstrukt von Spinozas angeblichem Akosmismus oder sogar Nihilismus. In seinen Vorlesungen zur Geschichte der Philosophie hat Hegel diese Deutung Philo äh, Spinozas äh, mit größtem wirkungsgeschichtlichem Erfolg zur Standarddeutung gemacht. Mit Mühe sind wir dabei, uns von dieser offensichtlich falschen Lesart zu befreien. Man kann Hegels Darstellung auch nicht retten, indem man auf eventuelle spätere Korrekturen verweist. Ganz im Gegenteil. Und hier muss ich ein bisschen philologisch werden. Das oben genannte Zitat stammt aus Hegels Überarbeitung der Seinslogik von 1832, die er kurz vor seinem Tod vorgenommen hat. Im Vergleich mit der ersten Ausgabe der Logik von 1812 hat Hegel hier den akosmistischen Akzent einschließlich der merkwürdig verdrehten Bezugnahmen auf Jacobi sogar noch entschieden verstärkt. Dazu gehört auch, dass er offenkundig eine Passage aus der Wesenslogik zuletzt nach vorne in die Seinslogik verschoben hat. Diese Verschiebung, die die Spinoza gewidmete Anmerkung zum Kapitel über das Absolute in der Wesenslogik betrifft, halte ich für besonders auffällig und bedeutsam. Von Hegels Erörterung des Substantialitätsverhältnisses unbedingt zu unterscheiden, dazu gleich mehr, finden sich in dieser Anmerkung, also der Anmerkung in der Wesenslogik zum Absoluten, 
alle kritischen Vorbehalte Hegels gegen Spinozas Philosophie bereits versammelt, und zwar so, dass man den Tenor des Akosmismus hier schon vorbereitet sieht. Der Spinozismus, so sagt Hegel hier, ist eine mangelhafte Philosophie, weil die absolute Einheit der Substanz sich nicht intern differenziert und alle Unterscheidungen vielmehr durch einen äußeren, äh, äußerlichen Verstand getroffen werden. Zitat auf dem Handout, in jenem Absoluten, das nur die unbewegte Identität ist, ist das Attribut wie der Modus nur als verschwindend, nicht als werdend, sodass hiermit auch jenes Verschwinden seinen positiven Anfang nur von außen nimmt. Dass Hegel die Motive dieser Darstellung zuletzt beinahe wörtlich in die Seinslogik übernimmt, also aus der Wesenslogik zurück in die Seinslogik in der zweiten Auflage, ähm, beinahe wörtlich, deutet darauf hin, das ist ein Vorschlag von mir, dass er für die weitere Überarbeitung der Wissenschaft der Logik den Plan gehabt haben könnte, auf das wesenslogische Kapitel über das Absolute einschließlich der Anmerkung zu Spinoza, genau wie in der Enzyklopädie, zu verzichten. Das würde erstens den Vorteil gehabt haben, nicht in ein und derselben Sequenz der Wesenslogik mit zwei verschiedenen Versionen der Substanz Spinozas, mit ungeahnten Irritationen über den Vorgang der Widerlegung und der Identifizierung des richtigen Standpunkts Spinozas zu operieren. Der zweite Vorteil der Operation ist jetzt schon sichtbar, insofern Hegel offenkundig auf den kategorialen Unterschied zwischen der einfachen Bestimmung des Seins und der reflexionslogischen Bestimmung der Substanz hinaus will. In diesem Sinne sieht alles danach aus, dass er sich die sprachliche Form von Jacobis Formel Sein und Dasein anstatt Substanz und Modus systematisch zunutze gemacht hat, nicht nur um aus diesen Bestimmungen den Auftakt der Seinslogik zu generieren, Sein, Nichts, Werden, Dasein, sondern in eins damit gegenüber Spinoza die angebliche Abstraktheit seiner Metaphysik zu exponieren. Vor diesem Hintergrund lässt sich die Liste der wohlgemerkt konstruierten Kritik Hegels an Spinoza leicht erstellen. Der Generalvorwurf lautet auf abstrakte Identität. Damit werden gleich eingangs Parmenides und Spinoza als Varianten desselben leeren, unbestimmten Seinsdenkens zusammengeführt, das ebenso pauschal als Pantheismus und als Identitätssystem bezeichnet wird, was vermutlich an Schelling erinnern soll, kritisch an Schelling. Weiter soll gelten, dass im abstrakten Sein der Anfang zu einem Fortgang fehlt. Zitat auf dem Handout, bei Parmenides wie bei Spinoza soll von dem Sein oder der absoluten Substanz nicht fortgegangen werden zu dem negativen Endlichen. Wird nun dennoch fortgegangen, was, wie bemerkt, von dem Beziehungs- hier mit fortgangslosen Sein aus nur auf äußerliche Weise geschehen kann, so ist dieser Fortgang ein zweiter, neuer Anfang. Der Pointe Jacobis dass es keinen Übergang gibt, genau entgegengesetzt, trennt Hegel das Sein vom Dasein, um dann den fehlenden Übergang vom Sein zum Dasein zu kritisieren. Das widerspricht Spinozas Immanenzmetaphysik im Kern und hat in der Tat viel mehr mit Fichtes Problemen zu tun, die Hegel hier auch prompt erwähnt. Ich muss an die lustige Diskussion von gestern denken, dass es eine Obsession der deutschen Philosophie sei, auf den Anfang zu fokussieren, was wir hier auch bei Hegel sehen. Die Vorlage von Jacobi lautet, bei Spinoza kann es keinen Anfang geben, weil Ausschluss der Causa Finalis, wenn ein Anfang sein soll, dann bitteschön als Anfang der Handlung. Das ist die Opposition. Gut, aber hier geht es auf einmal um ein Problem des Anfangs was vielmehr eins mit Fichte ist und so weiter. Spezifischer auf Spinoza bezogen, aber der Sache nach, über das Gesagte nicht hinausführend, setzt Hegel dann noch den ebenfalls aus Jacobis Spinoza-Briefen entnommenen 
aber signifikanterweise seit der Jacobi-Rezension um das Adjektiv omnis erweiterten Operator omnis determinatio est negatio ein, um zweierlei zu behaupten. Erstens ist Negation bei Spinoza nur formlose Abstraktion. Es fehlt das Selbstverhältnis der Negation der Negation. Daher gelangt zweitens die Substanz weder im Fall der Attribute noch im Fall der Modi zu internen Unterscheidungen, sondern eben nur zu solchen, die ein äußerer Verstand macht, während die Substanz das ganz Bestimmungslose ist. Auch diese Kritik geht an Spinoza und der Darstellung Spinozas durch Jacobi vorbei, weil sie, und ich referiere nochmal auf Gilles Deleuze, dessen Studie ich großartig finde, weil sie eine Philosophie des Ausdrucks einer negativistischen Erwartung auf schrittweise Ableitung unterwirft. Substanz zu denken ohne Bestimmungen ist auch bei Spinoza in der Tat ein Ungedanke, den deshalb Spinoza auch nicht denkt. Inwieweit Hegel seinerseits wirklich ernst meint, was er hier ausbreitet, darf man nach allem bezweifeln. Einschließlich der abwegigen These, ausgerechnet Jacobi habe den rationalen Vollzug der Ethik in den geometrischen Beweisgang gesetzt, ist inzwischen längst in all den geradezu, erlauben Sie mir, dass ich so formuliere, kolportagehaften Konstrukten zu erkennen, dass Hegel sich im Rücken seiner Fehldarstellung Spinozas darauf vorbereitet, sich das spekulative Potenzial der Ethik an anderer Stelle anzueignen. Spinoza in Hegels Wesenslogik, das Substantialitätsverhältnis. Zu Beginn der Begriffslogik hält Hegel im Rückblick auf seine Auseinandersetzung mit Spinoza fest, Zitat, auf dem Handout, dass die wahrhafte Widerlegung in die Kraft des Gegners eingehen und sich in den Umkreis seiner Stärke stellen muss ihn außerhalb seiner selbst angreifen und da Recht zu behalten, wo er nicht ist, fördert die Sache nicht. Genauso ist es, möchte man sagen. So überzeugend Hegels hermeneutische Maxime ist, so wenig hat er selbst sich, sofern es die Verortung Spinozas in der Seinslogik betrifft, daran gehalten. Anstatt in die Kraft Spinozas einzugehen, und sich wirklich mit seiner Position auseinanderzusetzen, hat er aus Spinozas Substanz das Konstrukt einer abstrakten Identität erstellt. Aber zu welchem Zweck? Die einzige Antwort auf diese Frage habe ich vorhin schon angedeutet, dass Hegel auf diese Weise den Anfang der Logik gewinnt. Je leerer und abstrakter sich das Sein präsentiert, desto dramatischer setzt der Vollzug der dialektischen Bewegung ein, indem Spinozas Metaphysik im wahrsten Sinne logisch aufgehoben ist. Diese Figur, die Hegel ebenso vermittelt über den Vorbegriff in der Enzyklopädie inszeniert, ist im Kern paradox. Je weniger die akosmistische Konstruktion der Substanz Spinozas Philosophie trifft, ein desto intimeres Moment der logischen Entwicklung kann Spinoza werden. Man darf nur nicht erwarten, dass es auf in dieser Weise um eine authentische Darstellung von Spinoza geht. Hegel selbst hat allerdings mit der Maxime der wahrhaften Widerlegung nicht auf die Seinslogik, sondern auf eine ganz bestimmte Stelle der Wesenslogik verwiesen. In welche Turbulenzen er geraten wäre, wenn er die Überarbeitung der ganzen Logik noch hätte zu Ende bringen können und dabei seine vielfach differenten Versionen Spinozas explizit hätte integrieren müssen, kann man sich ausmalen. Denn was die Sache betrifft, so stößt man in der Wesenslogik tatsächlich auf einen ganz anderen Befund und dieser Befund ist für Hegels Projekt mindestens so wichtig wie die Konstruktion seines Anfangs und eigentlich noch viel wichtiger. Zitat, die absolute Notwendigkeit ist absolutes Verhältnis, weil sie nicht das Sein als solches ist, sondern das Sein, das ist, weil es ist, das Sein als die absolute Vermittlung seiner mit sich selbst. Dieses Sein ist die Substanz. Als die letzte Einheit des Wesens und Seins ist sie das Sein in allem Sein, weder das unreflektiere Unmittelbare noch auch ein abstraktes, hinter der Existenz und Erscheinung stehendes, sondern die unmittelbare Wirklichkeit selbst 
und diese als absolutes reflektiert sein in sich, als an und für sich seiendes Bestehen. Mit diesen Worten kennzeichnet Hegel das absolute Verhältnis der Substantialität. Und im Rückblick der Begriffslogik legt er dann offen, dass es sich damit um genau den Standpunkt handelt, der mit Spinoza als wesentlich und notwendig zuerst bezogen werden muss. Es ist evident, dass dieses Konzept der Substanz sich substanziell von derjenigen Bestimmung unterscheidet, die sich am Anfang der Seinslogik und in der früher genannten Anmerkung zum Absoluten in der Wesenslogik findet. Dort war das komplexe Binnenverhältnis der Substanz buchstäblich abstrahiert und zugunsten leerer Identität ausgelöscht. Hier hingegen wird ausdrücklich betont, dass die Substanz ein Verhältnis unterhält. Als absolutes Verhältnis bezieht sie keine externen Relata aufeinander, sondern ist mit sich vermittelt und darin die Wirklichkeit selber. Als Sein in allem Sein und bereichert um die Wirklichkeit in allem Wirklichen, wir erinnern uns an Jakobis Passus, den Hegel hier auffallenderweise nicht mehr mit der seinslogischen Zutat der abstrakten Realität verknüpft, kehrt Jakobis Formel wieder. Jetzt soll und darf sie das Immanenzverhältnis Spinozas zum Ausdruck bringen, das von Hegel als Binnenverhältnis der Substanz zu ihren Akzidenzen dann weiter ausgelegt wird. Auch diese Version, I have some more. Auch diese, äh, sorry, der Substanz ist zumal äh, sogar buchstäblich im Gang der Logik selbst konstruiert. Reflexionslogisch äußerst komplizierte modaltheoretische Überlegungen liegen ihr im Rücken und das folgende Kausalverhältnis kann man nur um den Preis einer Verkürzung von Spinozas Position als einen Schritt über sie hinaus behaupten. Gleichwohl ist nicht zu bestreiten, dass das Substantialitätsverhältnis sich strukturell deutlich an Spinoza orientiert und in dieser Funktion nichts Geringeres darstellt als die Basis für die Entwicklung des Begriffs. Festzuhalten ist damit, dass der Übergang der Wesens in die Begriffslogik, und er zeigt es Schritt für Schritt, die ungeheure Bedeutung Spinozas für Hegel hier, in der singulären Präsentation in sich differenzierter holistischer Einheit liegt. Anders als die akosmistische Verfremdung Spinozas hat Hegel diese singuläre Errungenschaft Spinozas nicht mit ähnlichem Impetus öffentlich markiert. Von der philosophiegeschichtlichen Kanonisierung des Akosmismus ganz abgesehen ist es sogar in der Hegelforschung in der Hegelforschung bis heute keineswegs an der Tagesordnung im Zentrum der Logik die Präsenz Spinozas zu identifizieren, ohne die es Hegels spekulative Begriffsform gar nicht gäbe, im Substantialitätsverhältnis. Aber was genau leistet der Begriff, wofür das Substantialitätsverhältnis, wie Hegel sagt, die bedeutende, die notwendige, aber doch nur die Basis bildet? Was kommt hinzu, was den Begriff dazu qualifiziert, das Reich der Freiheit zu eröffnen, während das Substantialitätsverhältnis die absolute Notwendigkeit verkörpert? Mit dieser Frage komme ich zum Schluss. Auf Anhieb könnte man vermuten, dass der Überschuss des Begriffs über die Substanz oder das Begreifen dessen, Hegel sagt, das Enthüllen dessen, was die Substanz unbegriffen in sich enthält, den Status des Einzelnen betrifft. Damit wäre der Einwand Jakobis adressiert, den Hegel ja auch tatsächlich beinahe wörtlich aufnimmt in der Jakobi-Rezension. Zitat, die absolute Substanz ist nicht als Ausgangspunkt für Unterschiede, Vereinzelung, Individuation gefasst. Anschließend radikalisiert Hegel diese Diagnose zwar zur inzwischen bekannten Version abstrakter Identität, wonach bei Spinoza der Ausgangspunkt überhaupt für alle Unterschiede, wie sie erscheinen mögen, Attribute, Modi und so weiter fehlt. Es geht daher alles nur unter. Sie ist unbewegt, aus ihr kehrt nichts zurück. Das ist die Version abstrakter Identität. Das geht über Jakobis Einwand weit hinaus. Aber der Punkt der fehlenden Individuation ist festzuhalten. Und wenn dies tatsächlich Hegels eigener Intention entspräche, könnte man wenigstens von Weitem auch eine gewisse Gemeinsamkeit in den beiden Substanzversionen erkennen. 
obwohl sie einander de facto komplett widersprechen und unmöglich ein und derselben Position zugeschrieben werden können, ist es nicht ganz verkehrt, im Substantialitätsverhältnis zwar nicht das gänzliche Fehlen des Unterschieds wie in der Version der abstrakten Substanz, aber doch eine gewisse Unterbestimmung des Einzelnen zu erkennen. Das Einzelne ist Akzidenz der Substanz und unterliegt ihrer Macht, wie Hegel zeigt. Und wenn diese Überlegungen richtig wären, dann stünde der Begriff folglich für die Befreiung der Individuation, für die Beachtung substanzieller Unterscheidung. Nun spreche ich allerdings nicht von ungefähr die ganze Zeit im Konjunktiv, denn tatsächlich liegen die Dinge genau umgekehrt. Das Verhältnis der Substantialität in den Begriff zu überführen oder genauer als ein begriffliches Verhältnis zu enthüllen, heißt Differenz nicht auszubauen, sondern im Gegenteil abzubauen. Zitat auf dem Handout, im Begriff hat sich daher das Reich der Freiheit eröffnet, er ist das Freie, weil die an und für sich seiende Identität, welche die Notwendigkeit der Substanz ausmacht, als aufgehobene oder als Gesetztsein ist und dieses Gesetztsein als sich auf sich beziehend eben jene Identität ist. Zitat Ende. Im Begriff transformiert sich die Struktur der Substanz als Verhältnis der Substantialität in die Struktur total transparenter Selbstbeziehung. Das ist ein anderer Ausdruck für das Subjekt als Zielbestimmung der hegelischen Philosophie. Es mag nach allem höchst merkwürdig oder sogar widersinnig erscheinen, dass Hegels eigentlicher Einwand gegen Spinoza lautet, dass in der Ethik nicht zu wenig, sondern noch zu viel Differenz herrscht. Aber bei nochmaligem Hinsehen wird deutlich, dass angefangen mit dem Vorwurf, dass Spinozas Ethik ihre wichtigsten Bestimmungen als Voraussetzungen und nicht als Setzungen behandelt, alles darauf ankommt, diejenigen ontologischen Unterschiede aufzuheben, die das Substantialitätsverhältnis intern noch enthält und in die verhältnislose Selbstbeziehung des Subjekts zu überführen. Two more sentences, please, and then I will finish. Die große Anschauung der spinozistischen Substanz ist nur an sich die Befreiung von Endlichem für sich sein. Aber der Begriff selbst ist für sich die Macht der Notwendigkeit und die wirkliche Freiheit. Es spricht nichts dagegen, zumal Hegel hier wörtlich von Liebe und Seligkeit spricht, hier an Spinozas intuitive Erkenntnis im Vollzug des Amor Dei Intellectualis zu denken. Schon Jacobi hatte ja im Gespräch mit Lessing darauf verwiesen, Zitat, was Spinoza tiefsinnig und erhaben die Erkenntnis der obersten Gattung nennt. Damit aber kommen zum Schluss tatsächlich noch einmal alle Motive der Debatte in ihrer letztlich gegenstrebigen Motivation auf den Tisch. Während es Jacobi zufolge in der intuitiven Erkenntnis bei Spinoza um die zentrale Bedeutung des essentiell Einzelnen geht, an der er aber zugleich die existenziell personale Differenz vermisst, schätzt Hegel die Lage genau umgekehrt ein. Hegel meint, dass die Scientia intuitiver auf die Befreiung des Einzelnen von seinem für sich sein zielt, die in der Selbstbeziehung des Begriffs vollends zu sich gebracht werden kann. Im Fazit gebe ich gerne zu, dass mir Jacobis Stellungnahme zu Spinoza sachlich richtiger und im Sinne eines starken Denkens der Differenz oder der Andersheit philosophisch sogar moderner erscheint. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, Frau Sankaulen. Wir haben jetzt fast zehn Minuten für Diskussion. Okay, Christian Krenen. Ja, Frau Sandkauen, vielen Dank für diesen sehr anregenden Vortrag. Ich würde gerne eine Sache feststellen, die gestern auch schon eine große Rolle spielte in Bezug auf den Vortrag von Stephen Hulgate und jetzt bei Ihnen auch, in Ihren Worten, das Problem der authentischen Darstellung Spinozas. Und ähm, bei Fulgate gestern äh, dem hegischen Spinoza und dem echten Spinoza, was auch immer dann damit genauer gemeint ist. Aber diese Differenz. Ähm, ich frage mich nämlich, 
was ist der Wissenschaftstheorie, wenn ich das ungenau vielleicht sage, der wissenschaftstheoretische Status dieser Unterscheidung näher hin äh, der Bestimmung des echten oder authentischen Spinozas. Hegel selbst macht eine äh, Unterscheidung von verschiedenen Arten, die Geschichte zu betrachten. Eine davon ist die philosophische. Die drei anderen, ich fasse sie jetzt mal zusammen als äh, die pragmatische, ist nicht die philosophische, sondern, wie wir vielleicht sagen würden, die geisteswissenschaftliche. Und ich vermute, dass eine authentische Darstellung eines Philosophen äh, eine pragmatische Geschichte ist und keine philosophische. Die philosophische, äh, da hat Hegel ja seine eigene Doktrin sozusagen, der ähm, der philosophischen Geschichtsbetrachtung entwickelt, setzt ein System voraus des Betrachtenden. In diesem System wird bestimmt, was Philosophie ist, was die einzelnen Bestimmungen der Philosophie sind und äh, dann wird in Bezug auf das, was Geschichte ist, diese Bestimmungen äh, sozusagen verzeitlicht oder in der Zeit dargestellt. Deshalb weiß ich einfach nicht, was der philosophische Gehalt einer Aussage ist, dass Hegel Spinoza nicht gerecht wird oder irgendetwas bei Spinoza missdeutet. Äh, die Frage ist doch, ähm, was an seiner Stelle im System hat eine, oder was ist die Funktion einer bestimmten Systemstelle und in welcher Weise äh, bringt Hegel da einen Gedanken von einem anderen ein? Das, das, das ist doch eine andere Frage als... Äh, das war exactly what I wanted to say. Wir sind äh, total konform. Mein Punkt war doch zu sagen, wir sehen komplett differente Versionen der Substanz. Das heißt, komplett äh, differente Versionen dessen, was Hegel über Spinoza sagt. Ich wollte zeigen, dass das, was er für die wirklich authentische im Sinne einer systemtheoretischen Bedeutung Auffassung Spinozas hält, dass Substantialitätsverhältnis in der Wesenslogik ist. Das sagt er ganz ausdrücklich. Das ist die, die Stärke Spinozas, die er für die Enthüllung des Begriffs mobilisieren möchte. Relativ dazu, und nur das wollte ich mit authentisch an dieser Stelle sagen, behaupte ich, dass Hegel selber weiß, dass das, was er in der Seinslogik über Spinoza sagt, mit dem Spinoza, mit dem er wirklich arbeiten möchte, auf dem Weg zum Begriff, damit nichts zu tun hat. Das wollte ich sagen. Ich bin ganz immanent in Hegel. Ich bin gar nicht draußen. Aber ich finde, wir müssen noch komplizierter überlegen als gestern. Der, die Ausflucht, uns auf die Vorlesungen zu beziehen, die hilft nicht. Die Vorlesungen sind total exoterisch. Wir müssen uns die Mühe machen, in den Hegel reinzugehen. Und dann sehen wir allerdings, es gibt ganz verschiedene ähm, Versionen, so nenne ich das. Und ich gehe ja sogar noch weiter, und das würde ich gerne diskutieren, Hegel überarbeitet die Seinslogik. Ähm, er hätte, wenn er länger gelebt hätte und die Cholera ihn nicht hinweggerafft hätte, die ganze Logik überarbeitet. Wie traurig, dass er das nicht machen konnte. Also von allem anderen abgesehen, immer traurig. Sie verstehen, die Vorstellung mit diesem neuen, ausgebauten, seinslogischen Stück geht er in die Wesenslogik. Das hätte alles verändert, ist meine Meinung. Nicht das Substantialitätsverhältnis, aber alles, was er versucht, noch in der Wesenslogik zu arrangieren im Sinne von abstrakter Identität. Wir sehen in der äh, Enzyklopädie, das Kapitel über das Absolute und die Anmerkung fehlt. Das ist sehr interessant. Aber ich bin innen drin, bitte. Okay? okay? Uh, We have three minutes and three questions. Um, so, Stephen Olgate, Zlavko Kobe, Matteo Garau. Microphone. Also, zuerst mal herzlichen Dank für den Vortrag. Okay, das funktioniert nicht? Okay. Also, ich fange an zum dritten Mal. Yeah. Also, 
Erst, äh, zuerst herzlichen Dank für den Vortrag und ich glaube, in, in vielen Beziehungen gebe ich Ihnen recht und äh, ich, vor allen Dingen, dass ähm, Jakobi ähm, mit, mit mehr Sympathie und Verständnis Spinoza gelesen hat als, als Hegel, das finde ich auch richtig. Ja. Aber äh, ich habe eine Frage zum äh, Begriff äh, vom Konstru Konstrukt. Das finde ich eigentlich, das geht an dem hegelischen Verfahren vorbei, denn so wie ich Hegel verstehe, versucht er eben Spinoza im Lichte bestimmte Kategorien zu verstehen. Mhm. Und die bestimmten Kategorien tauchen an verschiedenen Stellen der Logik auf und anhand dieser Kategorien wird Spinoza eben verstanden. Es, es hat also nicht mit Konstruktion zu tun. Das war der eine. Der zweite, ganz wenn Sie noch Zeit haben, etwas zur, zur, zur Frage der, der Differenz. Man könnte meinen, man könnte eigentlich behaupten, dass in der Begriffslogik gewisse Arten der Differenz vorkommen, die vorher nicht möglich sind. Also die Besonderheit, die Einzelheit. Ja. Also in dem Sinne geht die Differenz nicht verloren in diesem Übergang, wie Sie so angedeutet haben. Also das sind die beiden Punkte. Also zum, zum Begriff des Konstrukts und ja. dann auch gleich etwas zur, zur, zur Verschiedenheit. Ja, zum zweiten Punkt vielleicht zuerst. Das ist ja dann auch meine Diskussion, die ab jetzt dann weitergeht mit Jacobi und Hegel. Das endet ja nicht. Wir gehen dann mit Hegel bis in die Rechtsphilosophie und überall hin, wo ich un unentwegt die starke Betonung von Differenz, von Personalität, die Jacobi eingeklagt hat, auch bei Hegel nach wie vor vermisse. Ich sehe das alles. Interessanterweise, finde ich, geht Hegel am weitesten in der Anthropologie in diese Richtung. Das ist interessant. Aber in diesem Sinne, wir haben auch in Padua darüber diskutiert. Aber es ist ein total wichtiger Punkt. Der erste Punkt ist auch ganz spannend. Ich Konstruktion ist eine Zuspitzung. Ich möchte auch ein bisschen provozieren, natürlich. Ähm, aber ich denke, es hat einen Sitz in der Sache, weil es ja nicht nur tatsächlich um ein Verständnis der Kategorien an verschiedener Stelle geht. Mein eigener Punkt war, es ist ein Unterschied, ob ich seinslogisch oder reflexionslogisch spreche, von Sein oder Substanz, ganz klar. Aber die Konstruktion besteht darin, dass Hegel immer unter dem Dach Spinozas spricht. Hätte er das nicht getan, hätte er einfach gesagt, ich zeige in der Wissenschaft die, der Logik den semantischen Gehalt von Kategorien, ohne das auf eine Position zu bringen. Kein Problem hat er aber. Und diese Zuschreibung an einen Spinoza, die geht nicht. Das zerreißt, das zerreißt es. Es gibt nicht einen Spinoza, dem man die abstrakte Identität und das holistische Substantialitätskonzept zuschreiben kann. Ganz kurz, äh, Kobe und äh, Grau. Ist, äh, hört man das? Okay, äh, ganz schnell. Du hast 30 Sekunden. Nein, okay, dann äh, ich werde, die, ich erste, ich werde die erste Frage überspringen, weil äh, Hegel sagte, die ganze, äh, man kann die Logik auch mit dem Absoluten anfangen. Äh, und in, in der Tat, wir tun es. Nur, dass das Absolute am Anfang nur als Sein definiert wird. Alle die Kategorien sind folgen, äh, folgende Definitionen, mehr und näher, mehr nähere Definitionen von, äh, von dem Absoluten. Und wenn äh, äh, Spinoza der Philosoph des Absoluten ist, dann äh, ist die ganze Logik nur, äh, spricht, äh, dann spricht sie nur über Spinoza. Aber das war keine Frage. Also, äh, die Frage war... Äh, Sie sprachen äh, sehr schön, äh, danke, äh, über die, Au die Auseinandersetzung zwischen Hegel und Spinoza und vielleicht auch dort Jakobis Spinoza und Jak Nicht wie Hegel Jakobi. Ganz nein, 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 nein. <lacht> äh, aber, aber eine Name, Sie sagten, das könnte äh, für Fichte gelten, nicht aber für Spinoza. Aber bei dieser Diskussion äh, ver vermisse ich immer einen, äh, einen Namen und das ist Schelling. Es war Schelling eigentlich, der die Spinoza für Hegel hineingebracht hat. Natürlich. Und Schelling sagte immer, sein er dachte, er konzipierte sein. Er, es, er wollte mit sein anfangen und er hatte... Denn das Problem, aus diesem Sein 
ähm, die Erscheinung, die Welt heraus, äh, zu äh, herauszuziehen. Was alles, ja, okay. Aber ich, so, ich, ich stimme komplett zu, das ist ein reines, wie es Steven gesagt hat, ein Zeitproblem. Ich habe einen langen Aufsatz über das Problem Schellings hier drin geschrieben. Ich denke, diese abstrakte Version der Substanz adressiert Hegel in Wahrheit an Schelling. Das ist Schellings Identitätsphilosophie, das ist seine Begegnung in Jena und davon befreit sich Hegel. Das ist der Punkt. Ja. Also zuerst danke für den Vortrag. Also ich hatte nur eine Frage, weil wenn ich gut verstanden habe, Sie denkt, dass Hegel zwei verschiedene Auslegungen quasi und auf Widerlegungen Hegels äh, Spinozas Philosophie darstellt, auch in der Wissenschaft der Logik. Gerade in der Wissenschaft. Ja, gerade. Der Logik. Aber also ich möchte, dass vielleicht etwas drüber Sie sagen könnte. Also ich sehe in diese zwei Auslegungen in der Wissenschaft der Logik eine Kohärenz. Also das bedeutet aber nicht, dass natürlich die Philosophie, die ausgelegen dort ist, wahr ist oder die wahre Philosophie Spinozas ist. Aber ich denke, dass für Hegel diese zwei verschiedene Auslegungen, also Nummer eins, eine Seite ist Spinozas Philosophie, eine Philosophie der, der abstrakten Identität, ohne Entwicklung, ohne einzelnen Bestimmungen und so weiter und so fort. Und andere Seite, in Spinozas Philosophie gibt es nur die Händlichkeit, die quasi deduziert, nur deduziert werden kann von einer äußerlichen Reflexion kann. Also diese zwei Sachen, also können auch gleichgestellt werden äh, und im Begriff ja, okay, passiert verstehe. exakt ich, so. Also ja, vielleicht diese zwei Sachen sind eine einzige ja, Sache. Für Hegel. Für Hegel, in, natürlich, aber es gibt eine, eine interne Logik Kohärenz, ist das oder? Eingang äh, des zu sich Kommens der Vernunft des Subjekts. Das ist völlig klar. Aber adressiert an Jacobi ist das inkohärent. Sie können diese beiden Optionen nicht einer Position Spinozas zuschreiben. Okay. Da muss man sagen, entweder oder. So können wir auch sagen, dass Egel äh, erkennt an, dass äh, in der Spinozas Philosophie gibt es auch Endlichkeit und so weiter und so fort, aber keine Identität. Matteo, Entschuldigung. Okay. Wir müssen. Dank. Ja, es tut mir leid. Vielen Dank. Ja. talk is of uh, Zanan Akin. Um, Zanan is uh, uh, right uh, now his PhD um, thesis uh, and the PhD thesis uh, uh, of Zanan is about the principle of equality, of modern equality uh, in Hegel, Marx, Heidegger and Badiou. Uh, the title of the talk of Zanan is Hegel, Jacobus, Spinoza and Equality, Jacobus Silent Trace in Hegel's Conception of Concrete Universality and the Modern Equality between Equivalence and Indifference. The title is already a talk. And so um, thanks for this great organization. First of all, I wanted to say um, after such an instructive and insightful and great lecture of uh, Professor Zan Kaulen, it will be a modest trial to bring the same, the same uh, discussion to our present times, because I think that, that metaphysics is not a frozen thing, and because I believe that the task of philosophy is also to think it's time, and I believe that this whole discussion has a relevance for our present times. The rise of far right is the biggest concern in Europe today. This collective mood of concern, however, is marked by something paradox. On the one hand, a discourse of fighting against the danger of far right seems to be going on with all mediatic and governmental means. Yet on the other hand, 
In face of its seemingly unstoppable rise, a constant being shocked is staged, as if the far right appeared out of the blue. This paradox should reveal the simple fact that there has perhaps never been a serious attempt to grasp the dynamics of this rise. Instead, in an ongoing journalistic atmosphere, self-evident opinions are asserted and stiffening the illusion as if the reasons underlying this rise were not intrinsic to modern, thus capitalist and democratic principle itself, as if everything was fine in democratic capitalism besides a bunch of mad people disturbing the Occidental East. Perhaps it is a time to dare beholding that the dynamic which feeds the far right is not a local deviation from the arche of modern liberal democratic capitalism, yet its very unfoldment, if not its consummation. In order to make sense of that claim, let's take a somewhat consensual opinion on identitarianism. The journalistic narratives attribute the identitarian tendency of our times to a caricaturized image of a far-right personality embodying all the characteristics of the radical evil, evil perfectly, like racism, sexism, conspiracism, anti-Semitism, so on and so forth. Such an image makes it quite easy for everyone to distance themselves and enjoy the relief of being part of the civic majority. Yet, to distort the simplistic narrative and break with its ideological frame, I would like to introduce a dialectical statement, which is a speculative purpose that I will unfold in the next 25 minutes. My statement is the following. The so-called late modern age, that is our present times, is characterized by a longing for difference rather than for identity. Or to put it more accurately, today, longing for identity expresses itself as a longing for difference. Take the following quote from a speech that Giorgia Meloni addressed to the so-called World Congress of Families in in 2019 as a significant symptom. Quote, I must not be able to call myself Italian, Christian, woman, mother, no. I must be citizen X, gender X, parent one, parent two. I must be a number, because when I'm just a number, when I have no identity, when I have no roots, then I will be the perfect slave at the mercy of big financial speculators, the perfect consumer, unquote. I can imagine that it might be a little surprising, if not irritating, to begin a talk on Hegel, Spinoza, and modern equality with Meloni, and you may ask yourself, what's at stake here? Well, please note that Meloni's speech has been circulating in different countries all over the world, and not exclusively among far-right groups, but also among so-called civic middle-class people. So I claim that there is a potential which this reaction can entail in symptomatic character for thinking our time, that is thinking what is today, in order to unfold this potential, let's take the symptom serious and ask, what could be the enticing moment in Meloni's speech? I don't think that the answer lies in the longing for identity in its abundance, yet rather in a fear of a decay into indifference, as the contrasting examples show that is becoming a citizen X, a number, or a mere consumer. In other words, the determining moment seems to be not the aspiration for a superior dominating identity in its abundance, like being Italian, Christian, Aryan, etc., as we know it from the classical fascistic aspiration, yet any difference, qua difference, which can save one from indifference. This is a concern today shared in some way or another by every late modern individual, no matter from which front of worldview. Insofar as one can see a longing for identity as the flip side of a longing for difference, the dialectic between identity and difference is surely not a peculiarity of our present. Yet, changing the perspective from identity to difference is not an empty sophistry. For in all its dialectically belonging together, the moment that has a primacy is the difference today. In so far as the longing for difference can be seen as the general symptom of a discontent with modern equality from all sides. Why discontent? For modern equality is not a flat sameness. It is based on a promise, a promise of the unity of two extreme opposites, a right to difference, which is bound at the same time by a ban of transcendence, which is to say that no subjective difference must truly dominate any other. Well, this opposition entails huge potential for tension. For on the one hand, we live in a society in which an advertisement slogan like make a difference has long become an imperative. This is to say that the criterion of success today lies nowhere else than in the question whether one's own difference can be distinguished in any realm as unique or not. Yet on the other hand, 
one must constantly face the fact that this imperative is impossible to fulfill, as every subjective difference claiming to be unique circulates as an equivalent offer among equal, equally valid legal persons. So, put dialectically, longing for difference is paradoxically the moment which throws every individual back to being common, just like anyone else. In light of all these symptoms, I argue that for the first time today, it is possible to conceptualize the principle of modern equality in its full tension of opposing moments. And I claim to achieve this within one single word, and that word is Gleichgültigkeit. Well, as you know, all know, the German language is at gold mine in its ability to carry opposites into unity. This is indeed what Hegel remarks in logic when he says, quote, the German language has many advantages over other mo modern languages. For many of its words have the further peculiarity of carrying not just different meanings, but opposite ones. And in this, one cannot fail to recognize the language's speculative spirit. It can delight thought to come across such words and to discover in naive form already in the lexicon as one word of opposite meanings, that union of opposites, which is the result of speculation." Unquote. So in guise of that remark and the symptoms of our confused world, I would like to state the following thesis. Modern equality is a specific logic of difference and Gleichgültigkeit is its principle. Consisting of the adjective Gleich meaning equal and the noun Gültigkeit meaning validity, Gleichgültigkeit means in German in its daily use merely indifference. Yet taken in the original sense of the words that it consists of, the same word can also mean equivalence. So there lies a potential of a movement within the meaning spectrum of this word which we can formulate in the following way. Equivalence may shift to indifference. The speculative potential lies here in the following question. If modern equality oscillates differences between equivalence and indifference, and thus the principle of modern liberal democratic capitalist equality can be determined as Gleichgültigkeit in its double sense, can we think political equality without Gleichgültigkeit? Before going further, let us clarify. How do I come up with such a claim that modern equality is a specific logic of difference? To give a concise answer to this, let me shortly turn to Aristotle. We can derive three categories of equality from three different words to which Aristotle refers in Nicomachean ethics. Sameness from homoiosis in the sense of similarity, arithmetical equality from isotes, like when I say two plus two equals four, and commensurability from symmetria. This last one is decisive for the development of the modern equality as a logic of difference and thus for understanding its principle as Gleichgültigkeit in its double sense. Why is it decisive for modernity? Commensurability is simply the idea of equality of unequals in regard to something external to them. In other words, it is the equalization of unequals, that is, differences, through mediation of a third term. To comprehend it, let us take a basic example from Nicomachean ethics. There, Aristotle states that not two doctors, but a doctor and a peasant can build a community. Why? For building a community necessitates unequals, that is, difference. It is the community which first established their equality. This Aristotelian determination is, for example, what Hannah Arendt sticks to when she emphasizes the political character of equality, which in her account cannot be based on sameness, but on plurality, thus on difference. However, a problem which Aristotle has never dealt with, and which Arendt also has dismissed, consists in the following question. How to think or apply such a form of equality which should be based on the equality of differences universally, that is, without binding it to and limiting it with any subset, be it certain state, class, race, or gender? As striking as it may sound, it was Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi who played a key role, malgré soi, in solving this problem. Without ever realizing it, Jacobi has not only contributed to the development of the concept of modern equality in the form that we know it today, but he also anticipated its pitfalls. In Letters to Mendelssohn, he already gives the core idea of what Hegel later called concrete universality in its most abstract form. Let me open it up. Jacobi claims a logic of commensurability in Spinoza's thought from the very outset, rendering everything different, or every different thing, if you like, to equalize concepts through the mediation of reason, which he described later as a creation of, quote, out of nothing to nothing in nothing for nothing, unquote. For Jacobi, an abstract human as mediated by reason cannot differentiate herself from any other human. For according to Jacobi, if I count as human and she counts as human, then we count as one and the same void being of reason. 
What he has seen in Spinoza was nothing but the void reason. He had, in fact, no political stake whatsoever. His point of objection was quite religious. And as for religion, I think that we can regard Jacobi himself as one of the most curious symptoms of the death of God. Curious, for Jacobi has been suffering this death way before it had been declared by Nietzsche. Perhaps it was a projection that Jacobi saw in most of his contemporaries nothing but an oblivion of God, for he himself sensed the death of God already and reacted to this death with all his force. In that regard, perhaps it is again symptomatic that it was not the speculative thinkers like Fichte, whom Jacobi accused of being nihilist, yet Jacobi himself who had to fight his own void. Please note this quite interesting passage from Jacobi's letters. Quote, I need a truth which is not my product, but a truth whose product I am, a truth which could fill my void, unquote. Well, perhaps it's a sublime moment of anti-philosophy which we can behold here. For seen from the perspective of the anti-philosopher, the philosopher never confronts her own void. The anti-philosopher is in contrast to one who personalizes the question of truth and can confront her own void. It is perhaps this anti-philosophical urge, a strange gift of insight, which led Jacobi to anticipate a possible shift from equivalence to indifference in the primacy of abstract reason. He anticipated that way before such a shift became palpable in the further unfoldment of modernity. Yet why did Jacobi project all this on Spinoza's thought? One can certainly say that in Jacobi's account, it was the idea of the system that is an aspiration to a unity in which the universal should be accessible within each particularity. Jacobi was convinced that such a system must put God into oblivion and ended up in nihilism. Why? For to bring forth such a unity, one needs first to deprive God of its ontological privilege. Once deprived of the concrete theological one, an abstract epistemological unity becomes possible. So, according to Jacobi, only in this way could one dissolve incommensurable objects of recognition into pure constructs of reason. So, in a way, dissolve the heterogeneity of differences. Only in this way could they become equivalent. Yet, such an equivalence meant for Jacobi merely indifference. So, he held Spinoza's system for the dissolution of any true individuality responsible insofar as there is nothing which could differentiate two products of the reason from each other. Thus, let me uh, sum up Jacobi's position in the following concise way in German. Wenn alles gleiche Gültigkeit hat, dann wird alles gleichgültig. I think that the presence of both Jacobi and Spinoza is most decisive in Hegel, not where he refers directly to Jacobi or Spinoza, as for example in Jena writings, but rather where neither of them is mentioned, like in his philosophy of right. Let me unfold. There is a striking irony in Hegel's relation to Jacobi on Spinoza. Hegel affirms the frame of Jacobi's Spinoza reading silently in defending reason. This means literally, Hegel affirms Jacobi's own frame by defending Spinoza against Jacobi. How does it occur? Well, unlike Jacobi's reconstruction of Spinozism, Hegel maintains that universality does not have to dissolve individuality into indifference, but can be conceived concretely on the very same basis of the mediation of reason. For in Hegel's account, humans with reason can distinguish themselves from everything else and also from other humans, as the universal exists for them. So, our particularity of being human is a mediation of the universal with itself, such that in that mediation, the particular and the universal can be thought of as identical. If it take an animal, even if it's in itself universal, Hegel says, the universal does not exist for it. So, an animal is only the individual thing that it does. Yet, concrete universality means for Hegel that we always know that we are humans, no matter who else we are or what we do. It means that the process of particularizing for humans is the universal factor itself, such that humans can particularize themselves and in that particularization, the universal remains in unclouded clarity with itself. This is what Hegel calls the true meaning of the universal, quote, which caused millennia before entering into human consciousness, unquote. So in contrast to antiquity, where only certain particular humans counted as human, in modernity, a human counts as such, quote, because she's a human being, not because she's Greek, Jew, Catholic, Protestant, German, Italian, etc. unquote. What we must see in the idea of concrete universality is itself ambivalent, for it is both the basis of the later modern liberal capitalist reconciliation between difference and equality, and also the source of any modern idea of emancipation, which claimed to go beyond capitalism. 
For after this idea, it becomes possible to think differences between humans without political hierarchies that go with them, such that differences can now be conceived as equally valid, that is, gleich gültig. This comes to an ultimately clear expression in philosophy of right, where Hegel affirms that, quote, the right of the subject's particularity to find satisfaction at its personal extremes without necessarily having to be in conflict with the substantial unity of the universal is the pivotal and focal point in the difference between antiquity and the modern age. What we need to focus on in this determination is that Hegel's thought of concrete universality responds to Jacobi and shows a certain immunity against his accusation of lack of individuality in the so-called Spinoza's void reason in the speculative thinkers of the time. So what we see here is a perfect application of what Hegel thinks is lacking in Spinoza when he says that his substance is not yet a subject. In other words, his concrete universality applied in philosophy of right is precisely Hegel's substance as subject in actu. Yet, what Hegel silently affirms here is a fundamental assumption, which is that there is a primacy of substance in Spinoza over attributes, as if there will be already be a substance as totality over there, which just could not find itself and consumes itself in its attributes. This is clearly Jacobi's assumption, which Hegel just takes over. Yet such a totality cannot be thought without a mediating instance, that is an instance which carries the unity of the individual and the universal. Jacobi Spinoza helps Hegel here on the one hand to give a modern basis to the old Aristotelian principle of symmetria, on which he could universalize the thought of equality of the unequal. Yet, paradoxically, through this move, he distances himself from Spinoza and we miss the speculative chance to think equality without mediation and thus, without the filtering of capital for almost 200 years. I mean, until centuries later, thinkers like Pierre Macheret and Alain Badiou offered some insights on a possible thought of equality quite in the spirit of Spinoza. But this is a just a detail en passant that I cannot open up here further. We find expression of Hegel's solution in his determination of the civil society as a system of needs, in which every person is a legal person having equal validity, and everyone serves to everyone else and receives service from others at the same time. The instance which carries the unity and the equivalence of differences on the basis of being equally valid legal persons is called Sittlichkeit. In other words, in a system of needs, ethical life mediates every subjective difference and keeps them equivalent without any oppression. Well, as we all know here, the reality of the unfoldment of modernity has been just a little bit different. This is also historically Marx's point of intervention. Marx shows us the idea of concrete universality in Hegel, which is ideally renders every subjective difference equivalent on the basis of a supposed Sittlichkeit, is grounded in reality in a shift in the conception of the labor form which could mediate subjective differences. What kind of shift? Well, in Capital, it strikes Marx that classical political economy elevates living labor, I mean, flüssige Arbeit, to a measure of exchange value and regards it merely as labor time, that is, as quantity. Yet, when it comes to what living labor objectifies, political economists of the time treat the objectified labor again qualitatively, namely as its use value. Marx here deciphers a blind metaphysical assumption which points towards a latent shift in the conception of abstract human labor form from quality to quantity. For a quantitative conception of labor as labor time presupposes a qualitative unity of human labor form. This exploration is in fact based on nothing else than Hegel's definition of the shift from quality to quantity in logic. We should note how Hegel determines quantity, namely as quality which became gleichgültig. So again, we find the relevance of the double meaning of Gleichgültigkeit here in case of the shift of abstract labor from quality to quantity, which we can grasp as both becoming equivalent and indifferent at the same time, which finds a political expression in modernity. It is this political expression which in fact allows Marx to read out the secret source of commensurability in the commodity form itself, that is in abstract human labor. Consider the following passage in Capital, quote, the secret of the expression of value, the equal equality and equal validity, and he uses here the word gleiche Gültigkeit, of all labor, because and insofar as it is human labor in general, can be deciphered only once the concept of human equality already has the firmness of a popular judgment. But this is possible in a society in which the commodity form is the general form of the labor product, thus also the relationship of people to each other as commodity owners is a dominant social relationship. 
We should not forget that capital is nothing else than a specific mediation of human labor with itself. So in Hegel's sense, a concrete universality, yet in the most abstract form. In that regard, we can reveal the labor form again as gleichgültig in the double sense, as the condition of possibility for Hegel's system of needs to exist. This is for Marx the main source of tension in the principle of modern equality, which by equivalizing human labor does not emancipate humans, but instead indifferentiates inequalities among them, which comes nowhere more clearly to expression than in the Communist Manifesto. So let me refer here to a famous passage. Quote, the bourgeoisie, wherever it has got to upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man and then naked self-interest, then callous cash payment. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid, paid wage laborers. So when Marx attributes a certain civilizing effect to capital, it is not on the basis of a truly emancipatory potential. Equivalence of human labor dissolves the previous transcending hierarchies, it is true. Yet, this equivalizing dissolution alone cannot be considered emancipatory, for it does not realize equality, but just dissolves every hit hurtle transcending difference into indifference by shifting previous political ine inequalities of pre-modern times into the private and the social spheres and shifting what Marx called the real duality of the medieval age to the abstract duality in modernity. Heading to the conclusion, let me ask, can we say that Jacobi was right? Was modern equality predestined to shift equivalence of subjective differences to indifference? If we follow Marx, perhaps. However, we must note here that Marx followed the same logic of mediation. So in a way, he also affirmed Jacobi's frame. Can we say then that Jacobi had a self-fulfilling prophecy? Perhaps, for he was right, quite right in his anticipation, only that he was wrong in attributing it to Spinoza. I mean wrong in attributing a logic of mediation to him, which presupposed a substance from which attributes should have been derived. What Hegel affirmed was exactly this reading, which he perfected and which opened the way for a notion like the right to difference that could be taken for granted in the later democratic discourse, yet a right with which nobody today seems to be content. Let me conclude by referring shortly to Pierre Macharet. For I think that what Macharet shows us implicitly is a possibility of reading Spinoza which goes beyond any logic of mediation and reconciliation. For Macharet remarks that in Spinoza there is no hierarchy between attributes and substance whatsoever. This can help us rethink concrete universality instead of dismissing it. For concrete universality is a novel idea, yet resorted to capital, it is obvious that it fails. In face of various reactions, which point out an exhaustion of the conception of inequality based on mediation through capital, the time has come in which we can dare to raise the thought of equality to another stage without losing Hegel's vigor by freeing ourselves from Jacobi's frame. For if there is no primacy of substance, then it means that there is the speculative possibility to think equality absolute without equivalence and indifference. Thus, to think Gleichheit without Gleichgültigkeit. Thinking is possibility opens up a new trajectory for speculative thought in our present times to follow, and I would say a quite novel one for inventing a new egalitarian maxim. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have 10 minutes for discussion, uh, a little bit more, perhaps. Zdravko. Professor Colbert, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I won't go into, into the details of the various persons uh, named. Uh, I was just uh, sum it up. You uh, make a difference between uh, abstract universal and concrete universal applied to the field of the politics and the emancipi emancipation. And then you uh, refer to Hegel uh, in his theory of civil, soci uh, civil society, as I don't know uh, now, good or bad, bad example, of course, um, and you, you uh, connect it with the ethical life, however, you should know 
that in Hegel, this is unsittliche Sittlichkeit, das ist Zerfall des Sittlichen. So if you, if you talk about uh, civil society within Hegel, then this is always a middle stage, middle form, uh, that presupposes for its existence and functioning something else. And in, in this very point, Hegel would speak about abstract, univer uh, abstract universal. So where is the place for the concrete universal in Hegel's system? But it's obvious in the state. So if you talk about it, you should consider this relation between the conception of individual in the civil society but framed within the state. And there in the state there are a lot of different institutions already mediated at the level of civil society, but uh, uh, especially a political mediation that then you should, I think, uh, brought in, in, in into, into your consideration. I would just uh, say that uh, Hegel had a very different idea of representation than now, uh, nowadays, where uh, the rep uh, rep representant uh, do not stand for, mm -hmm. but are the society in, 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 the, in the small, and, and, and so on. I would uh, uh, speak more about that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Drauko, for, for, for this notice, and uh, I will think about the Unsittlichkeit der Sittlichkeit selbst. This is an interesting note, and also that the role of the state is lacking. But I will still hold on the idea that what we should think uh, what is lacking today is that there is a kind of taken for granted conception of modern equality and I think that the, the moment that I would like to underlie or what I try to underlie was that the possibility to think differences without political uh, hierarchies is something which, which we owe in a way also to Hegel and, um, and I would say r rather than state it's another discussion but, but he traces it back to Christianity and, um, and, but I would still say that if we just take it politically, we cannot just uh, do without, without the media mediator role of the state. I agree with you. Thanks for your honesty. Thank you so much, Stephen Olgate. Um, thank you very much. I've got a question uh, about the remark you made at the end, equality without equivalence. And I wanted to know if you mean equality without any equivalence at all, or equality without reduction to equivalence. Because it seems to me there is a difference there, and we can see that between Marx and, and Hegel. Uh, I think you're right that, that Marx is, in a sense, getting rid of equivalence, and the whole point of getting rid of exchange value, um, and getting rid of value at all, is to get rid of the quantitative um, equivalence between individuals and, to, if you like, to liberate particularity. Um, Hegel, it seems to me, doesn't want to get rid of equivalence. <laughs> he wants to retain equivalence, but no longer have it as something to which we are reduced. And now, there's one thing you didn't really speak about, as, oh, unless I missed it, and that is the connection between Gleichgültigkeit and quantity. Um, and it seems to me that quantity is crucial in, in all of this. Um, and one could argue that Hegel retains the idea that in some sense, we remain, and we must remain, in uh, a relation of quantitative equivalence to one another, but not be reduced to that. Mm -hmm. Whereas Marx seems to want to eliminate that, that strand. And it's a simple question, where do you stand on this? Do you want to get rid of equivalence, which is what you sounded like you wanted to do, or do you want to retain it without reducing us to it? And could you say a bit about that and what the implications are? Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks for the question. I actually referred here without giving any names to the contemporary possibilities of think, speculative thinking of equality. I mean, I refer um, neither to Marx nor, nor Hegel, but more a kind of Spinoza's motive, which I uh, would argue that, it, that there is in Badiou's Imminence of Truth, is his last book, is to th a, a, a possibility of thinking equality as affirming infinity. He says that, like, it, it is a, okay, in his language, I, I would uh, probably imagine that Zdravko would not like it, but it's a kind of eventual possibility to affirm infinity, and infinity is always um, the, an infinite equality, and 
a form of equality which is incommensurable. But it, it, this is not something which, which we can just take as a part of the given everyday relations, I, I would say. That's a speculative uh, possibility to think equality otherwise in a Spinozist spirit, I would say. You didn't really, you haven't really addressed the question of quantity. Oh, because I'm sorry. We, well, I, I because I mean, if you take the logic, then, and we think of the categories as being necessary determinations of mm -hmm. being, then quality is necessary, quantity is necessary, yeah. and of course, as Marx well knew, quantity generates quality in measure. Mm -hmm. and, and ontologically, quantity is irreducible. Now, that surely would have a relevance in the philosophy of right, that quantitative equivalences cannot be eliminated from the economy. And so the idea of an equality without equivalence would seem to be ontologically impossible. And the Hegelian suggestion, I think, is to retain that quantitative equivalence between people, to retain exchange value, even, even giving an exchange value to labor power, but not reducing people to that, because you have to allow particularity to develop. And I'm still not quite sure where you stand on this. If you actually want to get rid of that quantitative equivalence, in which case, what do you <coughs> do with the section on, quanti on quantity and the logic? Does, does that have to go at the ontological level? Or do you want to keep it, but <coughs> just not have us reduced to it? Sorry, I'm around. Well, if, if, uh, I, I, I will argue that the way how we, how we talk about uh, equality is just presupposing the logic of uh, equivalence in such a way that, that it becomes impossible to think the speculative potential. Like, you just, you just uh, presume, okay, uh, equal equivalence is here. We cannot do without it. So how can we think? Uh, how can we think that which goes beyond that? But what I try to argue is uh, a speculative po possibility just does not assume. It just it just um, it is something which uh, which can be thought in infinity and not in the in the in the quantitative way. Of course. Uh, Marx knew that 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 that, that we uh, that we need a, a form of uh, quantitative equivalence, and it was the way he could think. Like th that's that's a really important moment, that he could think that only on the basis that human labor could could be uh, thought as a form of quantity, that was the basis of modern equality. But what we what I tried to show that our time just shows us that we need, I don't know, I, I, I also don't have the answer like, a, I don't know, if, uh, an open book, but I think that we can we, we try to go over a logic of equality which is based on equivalence. And um, what I only just said was there is, in my opinion, um, Quentin Meyasu, Alain Badiou, Pierre Macheret, they offer some insights on how to think such a possibility today? I know that maybe it was not an answer to your question. Thank you so much. The last one, very quickly, Royana. Um, so thank you so much for your talk. Um, now, uh, one link I've missed, um, maybe it was implicit there, but I think it's definitely important is the connection between Gleichgültigkeit and mechanism. Um, so um, we know that at least in the context of Hegel and Hegel's philosophy of right, especially his system of needs, he sees a positive correlation between the two. Um, so mechanism is not that something artificial that differentiates and limits um, one individual from the, from the other, but on the contrary, something by virtue of which, at least again, in the section of civil society, system of needs, um, uh, facilitates um, the individual to realize mm -hmm. his or her own needs. So um, if you maybe just um, tell me, how do you understand this relation between Gleichgültigkeit and mechanism in this context? Thank you. <coughs> well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I could follow uh, the link, uh, and um, that's why I, I, I uh, probably maybe we should talk in <coughs> in the break so that I could understand a little bit more, and we can talk about after so that we I don't steal the time of <coughs> people, but I don't have any uh, quick answer to give uh, to this in a second. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, we start again with our work. Um, the first talk uh, of this second morning session is of uh, K1 Hong. K1 Hong uh, is a postdoc uh, at the University of Beijing, and uh, he worked uh, at the University of Bochum, and his most recent work uh, is uh, uh, Das Buch Die Morgenröte des Geistes, eine Studie zu Hegels Konzeption des Orients und Philosophie des Geistes in der Berliner Zeit, that will be published in 24 as by heft of Hegel's Studie. Uh, the title of the talk, of Kai Wang Wong, uh, is Das Doppelte Bild Spinozas in Hegel's Berliner Religionsphilosophy. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kobe, um, International Network, uh, Network Hegel's Relevance, um, and the whole organizing team for arranging such a wonderful conference and especially helping me with uh, visa application. Um, okay, zu meinem Vortrag. Um, hier werde ich uh, mich auf die Hauptstruktur uh, meiner Arbeit uh, konzentrieren, welche vier Teile umfasst. Ich beginne mit dem ersten Teil, und zwar der Anleitung. Okay, um, in Hegels einflussreiche Berliner uh, Religionsphilosophie gehört Spinoza zu demjenigen, mit welchen sich Hegel am meisten namentlich auseinandersetzt, und zwar weil Spinoza angeblich den Kosmismus vertritt, auf welchem der Begriff der Religion nicht basieren kann. Diese kosmistische Fassung hat sich auch in fast allen Werken Hegels wiederholt und die äh, Spinoza-Interpretation nachhaltig geprägt. So übernimmt zum Beispiel Feuerbach schon in den 40er Jahren diese Kritik und äh, wende sie sogar auf Hegels Philosophie selbst an. In dessen, wie zahlreiche Studien bereits äh, gezeigt haben, steht diese kosmistische Fassung eigentlich in schlichten Widerspruch zur Causa Immanenz von Spinozas Substanz Metaphysik, ähm, welche Jacobi den Geist des Spinozismus nennt. Gewichtiger ist, dass jemand wie Hegel, der unter erheblichem Einfluss von Jacobi steht, sich über diesem Geist auch vor uns in Klagen ist. De facto ist es eben aufgrund der Causa Immanenz, dass er das spinozistische Modell der Substanz zwar stillschweigend seine Religionsphilosophie zugrunde legt. Diese Grundlegungsfunktion des Modells der Substanz, welche wegen Hegels offiziellen Kosmismusvorwurfs leicht übersehen wird, möchte ich in der vorliegenden Arbeit in den Vordergrund rücken. Denn entsprechend werde ich im Teil 2 und 3 zwei Argumente für die Grundlegungsfunktion des Modells der Substanz für Hegels Religionsphilosophie hervorbringen, also zuerst ein entwicklungsgeschichtliches und dann ein systematisches Argument. Ähm, basierend darauf äh, wird Teil 4 auf dieses komplexe Bild Spinozas in Hegels Religionsphilosophie angehen. Teil 2. Ich beginne mit ähm, einem kurzen Entwicklung, entwicklungsgeschichtlichen Zurückführung, welche zwei Linien, also die religionsphilosophische und die systematische Linie verfolgt. 2.1. Schon seit seiner äh, Jugendzeit ist Religion ein Thema, welches Hegel am Herzen liegt. In der Berner Zeit versucht Hegel im Ausgang von Kants Ethical Theologie den Ursprung der christlichen Religion zu interpretieren. Gegen das Ende dieser Zeit zeigte er aber Anzeichen, sich von diesem Ansatz abzuwenden. Dieser Wandel rührt daher, dass die Positivität der wirklichen Religion welche in seinen Augen für die Religion konstruktiv und unerlässlich ist, nicht durch das ähm, rein moralische Verständnis der Religion erklären lässt. Daraus lässt es sich, lässt sich nicht nur Hegels eigentümliche ähm, Einstellung zur Positivität, welche sich ähm, auf seine, äh, später auf seine Philosophie des Objektiven und des absoluten Geistes erstreckt, sondern auch einen Perspektivwechsel ablesen, welche auch bei vielen seiner Zeitgenossen zu spüren ist. <lacht> Sorry. Und zwar der Wechsel von der Perspektive der Theologie oder des Gottesgedankens 
zur Perspektive der Religionsphilosophie, welche sowohl die Religion im Ganzen als auch die mehreren außerchristlichen Religionen als Phänomene thematisiert. In der Frankfurter Zeit gelangt Hegel zum Brief der Liebe und später zum Brief des Lebens, welche eine andere Möglichkeit für ihn liefert, im nachkantischen Text, äh, Kontext doch eine nicht moralische Erklärung der Religion zu liefern. Denn da das Leben durch ihn, nach ihm die Vereinigung der Liebe und Reflexion sein soll, setzte sich die Erhebung zum unendlichen Leben von der reflexionsphilosophischen Erhebung zum unendlichen ab. Zwar ist der Einfluss von Spinozas Substanzmetaphysik in der Frankfurter Zeit ähm, nicht so sichtbar wie später, bietet sich die Causa Immanenz dieser Metaphysik von der Sache her als ein Modell für Hegels neues Verständnis das Verhältnis des Unendlichen zum Endlichen an, welche trotz des Unterschieds zwischen beiden ihre Eigentümlichkeit unterstreicht. Hinzu kommen auch ähm, Hegels Formulierungen, welche einen solchen Einfluss Spinozas nahelegen können. Also er sagt ähm, zum Beispiel in Fragment zum jüdischen Religion, ähm, zwei abhängig, unabhängige Willen, zwei Substanzen gibt es nicht, ein wirkliches Einwohnen des Vaters im Sonne, wie ein äh, Weinstock und seinen Reben. 2.2. Zu dieser religionsphilosophischen Linie gesellt sich die von Sandkorn äh, aufgewiesene systematische Linie. So hat Jakobis Diagnose in den Spinoza Briefen, dass ein konsequentes System, welches sich notwendigerweise auf dem Paradigma der Causa Immanenz bei Spinoza gründet, nicht mit der Freiheit kompatibel ist, einen erheblichen Einfluss auf Hegel. Überzeugend von dieser Diagnose bemühte sich Hegel, die Philosophie Spinozas in ein System der Freiheit zu äh, transformieren, um Jakobis entweder oder zu vermeiden, wie er später in der Logik die einzige und wahrhafte Widerlegung des Spinozismus nennt. Darauf komme ich im Teil 4 zurück. So unternimmt Hegel in der jener Zeit den, äh, den Versuch, in Anlehnung an das Modell der Substanz sein System zu etablieren, äh, zu etablieren dessen Ausgangspunkt er das Absolute nennt. Relevant für unser Thema ist, dass er seit der Vorlesung in Aktien 01 und 02 die Religion in den letzten Teilen seines Systems verortet, insofern als die Religion mit der Kunst zu, Zitat, zu reinen Idee zurückkehrt und die Anschauung Gottes organisiert. Zitat Dazu auch die Vorlesung in ähm, Aktien 05 und 06. Selbst wenn wir vorher in Anlehnung an die vorhandenen Materialien nicht äh, komplett feststellen können, ob Hegel in der Frankfurter Zeit letztlich für die Alternative des Modells der Substanz entscheidet, lässt es sich nun aus der, dieser Verordnung ersehen, dass die Religion, die in, der, äh, in ihrer Systementwürfen als die Selbstexplikation des Absoluten gilt, auf dem Modell der Substanz konzipiert werden soll. Teil 3 das systematische Argument. An die oben umrissene jener Konzeption der Religion setzte Hegel an, wenn er in der Berliner Zeit endlich über die Religion vorliest. Nur ist sein System zu dieser Zeit nach mehreren Umarbeitungen zum, äh, zum endgültigen Gestalt, nämlich der Enzyklopädie, gekommen. In diesem Teil werde ich argumentieren, dass wir allein aus, diese, ähm, aus, der, äh, aus der Systematik der Enzyklopädie, die Grundlegungsfunktion des Modells der Substanz für Hegels Religionsphilosophie feststellen können. Dies wird in drei Schritten erfolgen. 3.1. Der erste Schritt bezieht sich auf die Logik aus dem ersten Teil des Systems, um zu zeigen, inwiefern das in der Briefslogik erreichte Modell der Subjektivität, welches als das Prinzip des Systems gilt, auf dem Modell der Substanz beruht. Dies findet sich im Übergang von der Wissenslogik zur Begriffslogik, und zwar im Kapitel das absolute Verhältnis, welches Hegel die genetische Exposition des Begriffs nennt. Wenn, wie die Rede das Sein in allem Dasein belegt, behandelt Hegel hier ein Verhältnis des Unendlichen zum Endlichen, welches dem Modell der Substanz entspricht. Äh, entspricht. So setzt er zuerst an ein immanentes Verhältnis an, dass die Substanz die absolute Macht in den endlichen Dingen ist, dann hebt er die kausale Wirkung der Substanz in den ähnlichen Dingen hervor und zeigt schließlich, wie sich diese Kausali dieses Kausalitätsverhältnis de facto als die Identität der aktiven und der passiven Substanz erweist. Damit transformiert Hegel das Verhältnis des Unendlichen zum Ähnlichen zur Selbstbeziehung des Unendlichen 
oder den sogenannten Modell der Subjektivität, dass das vom Ähnliche den Unterschied in sich setzt und durch die Aufhebung dessen zu sich zurückkommt. 3.2. Mit diesem Modell der Subjektivität gehen wir zum Begrif zum, äh, zur Begriffslogik über, welche letztlich in den Brief der Idee als die Einheit der Idealität und Realität mündet, gleichwohl sie nur die Einheit der beiden in der Idealität, deren Realisierung sich erst in den Sphären der Natur und des Geistes findet. Im Geist ist die Idee dadurch realisiert, dass sie nicht nur vom Menschen gewusst wird, sondern dieses Wissen gleichzeitig die Selbsterkenntnis des Menschen ist. Diese Struktur des Geistes, nämlich das Verhältnis der Idee zur Selbsterkenntnis des Menschen, konzipiert Hegel nach dem Modell der Subjektivität. Danach setzt der Geist den Unterschied in sich selbst, indem er sich als eine ursprüngliche Einheit in zwei Korrelate, nämlich die Idee und das Wissen von der Idee, unterteilt und kehrt durch die Aufhebung der Unterschiede in sich zurück. 3.3. Freilich ist das Wesen von der Idee am Anfang der Philosophie des Geistes noch unvollkommen. Erst durch eine Reihe von Gestattungen hindurch gelangt Geist zum Wissen von der Idee als solche, und zwar in der Sphäre des absoluten Geistes. Angesichts dieser vorkommenden Entsprechung mit der Idee verwundert es nicht, dass die Philosophie des absoluten Geistes der einzige Teil in der Enzyklopädie ist, ähm, in, sorry, ähm, dessen Verhältnis zum Idee Hegel durch die Struktur des Sich-Urteilens im Modell der Subjektivität erläutert, ähm, und zwar äh, Paragraph 554. Dies gilt freilich auch für die Religion als die zweite Gestalt des absoluten Geistes. Mit anderen Worten ist Hegels Begriff der Religion de facto sein Begriff des Geistes. Im Hinblick auf 3.2 bedeutet sie dies ferner, dass sein Begriff der Religion sich ebenfalls auf dem Modell der Subjektivität gründet. Dazu liefert Hegels ausgereifte Darstellung des Begriffs der Religion in den religionsphilosophischen Kollegs 27, äh, 1827 und 31 auch einen entscheidenden Beleg. Dort unterteilt er den, Be den Begriff der Religion eben in drei Momente. Und zwar der Begriff Gottes, das Wissen von Gott und der Kultus. Nach diesem Modell, welches er hier als Faktum voraussetzt, unterteilt sich der Begriff Gottes als eine ursprüngliche Einheit in Gott und das Wissen von Gott als zwei Kolorate, welche dann durch den Kultus wieder vereinigt werden. Hier gilt, hier gilt es zuerst, den Schluss dieses Teil zu ziehen. Da Hegels Begriff der Religion wie sein Begriff des Geistes nach dem Modell der Subjektivität strukturiert ist, welches Hegel, wie in 3.1 dargelegt, aus dem Modell der Substanz entwickelt, so lässt sich folgen, dass das Modell der Substanz eigentlich Hegels Begriff der Religion zugrunde liegt. Teil 4. Eine, Strat eine strategische Verstellung des Bildes Spinozas. In dem zweiten und dritten Teil habe ich aus der entwicklungsgeschichtlichen und der systematischen Perspektive für die Grundlegungsfunktion des Modells der Substanz für Hegels Religionsphilosophie argumentiert. Indessen, so sehr Spinoza-Philosophie durch dieses Modell die Grundlage von Hegels Religionsphilosophie legt, so sehr wird ihm dies in der Religionsphilosophie nicht anerkannt. Der letzte Teil, dieser letzte Teil wird zuerst dieses komplexe Bild Spinozas in Hegels Religionsphilosophie vor Augen führen, dann auf den möglichen Grund dieser Behandlungsweise und schließlich auf ihre Wirkung auf die Strukturierung der Religionsgeschichte eingehen. Für Punkt 1. Wie eingangs erwähnt, ist Spinoza gleichsam der Hauptgegner Hegels in der Religionsphilosophie, und zwar in den ersten zwei ihrer drei Teilen. Zuerst wird die Philosophie Spinozas im Teil über den Begriff der Religion zum nachdrücklichen Diskussion herangezogen. Dann im Teil über die Religionsgeschichte, und zwar in den Teilen über den Buddhismus und die indische Religion. Insofern als Hegel die Welt anschauen oder das Verhältnis des zum Endlichen zum Endlichen bei den Buddhisten und den Inden durch die Formel des, Sp des Spinozismus interpretiert. Indessen, ungeachtet der in Teil 2 und 3 dargelegten Grundlegungsfunktion des Modells der Substanz für seine Religionsphilosophie, assoziiert Hegel Spinoza in allen diesen Stellen nicht mit dem äh, Modell der Substanz, sondern betrachtet ihn vielmehr als den Vertreter des Okosmismus. 
Das ist genau das, was Hegel in der Logik ähm, Spinoza offiziell unterstellt. Wie Sankorn zuerst identifiziert, handelt, handelt es sich dabei nicht um das Kapitel, das absolute Verhältnis oder das Modell der Substanz zu verorten ist, sondern um das vorhergehende Kapitel, das Absolute. Dort übte Hegel eine epistemologische Kritik an die erste Definition der Ethik aus, wonach die Kausasui wegen des epistemologischen Mangels zum einen Verhältnis des Unendlichen zum Endlichen führt, welches Hegel mit dem von Maimon entlehnen Wort Akosmismus bezeichnet. Ein Verhältnis, wonach die Wirklichkeit allein der Substanz ähm, als der unmittelbaren Identität mit sich zukommt, während die der Substanz äußlichen, endlichen Dingen bloß nichtig, nichtig sind. Diese kosmistische Version des Spinozismus macht Hegel nach Wissenschaft der Logik fast zur Standardversion seiner Auffassung von ähm, Spinozas Philosophie. So, also wie ähm, dargelegt in der Religionsphilosophie. Gewichtig ist, dass diese Version der Philosophie Spinozas nicht nur nicht gerecht wird, sondern ganz im Widerspruch dazu steht, da der Geist des Spinozismus eben in der Immanen Causa Immanenz liegt. Über diesen Geist ist Hegel auch völlig im Klagen, wofür selbst in der Religionsphilosophie schon zahlreiche Belege sprechen. Denn dort ist das Modell der Substanz eigentlich nicht verschwunden, sondern spielt eine substan substanzielle Rolle. Schon seit dem religionsphilosophischen Kolleg 21 interpretiert Hegel die orientalische Religion, welche die erste Phase der Religionsgeschichte bilden, bildet, nämlich die Religionen der Chinesen, Buddhisten, Inder, Perser und Ägypter mit der Vermehrung des Spinotismus. Jedoch meint er damit zu dieser Zeit nicht den Kosmismus, sondern ein Modell, welches von der Immanenz des Unendlichen im Endlichen ausgeht, wie das Modell der Substanz. Erst seit dem dritten Kolleg 27 unternimmt Hegel stillschweigend eine Bedeutungsverschiebung des Spinotismus, indem er ihn direkt mit dem Kosmismus gleichsetzt. Gleichwohl behält er das Modell der Substanz bei, und zwar als die Vermehrung des Verhältnisses des Unendlichen zum Endlichen bei den Persen, nur dass dieses Modell nicht mehr in Verbindung mit dem Spinozismus steht. Für Punkt 2. Zusammenfassend ist Spinozas Philosophie auf mehrfache Weise in Hegels Religionsphilosophie ähm, gegenwärtig. Offiziell verstört er sie zu, zum Kosmismus, welcher sowohl zum Vergleich mit seinem eigenen Begriff der Religion herangezogen wird, auch als die Vermehr der Welt anschauen, der Buddhisten und Inder gilt. Dies nenne ich unter Spinozismus A. Unter der Hand deckt die Philosophie Spinozas aber als das äh, Modell der Substanz, das ich unter, unter Spinozismus benenne, nicht nur die Grundlage seines Begriffs der Religion, sondern ist auch die Vermehrung der Weltanschauung der Perser. Im, Strick, Im strickenden Sinne ist Hegels Gebrauch von Pantheismus, Spinozismus und Substanz in der Religionsphilosophie ganz chaotisch und es gibt es hier de facto auch andere Versionen des Spinozismus, wobei ich mich hier auf, nur auf diese zwei konzentriere, welche für mich von systematischer Relevanz sind. Damit drängt sich äh, freilich die Frage nach dem Grund dieser komplexen Behandlungsweise auf. Die Antwort dazu soll zuerst der Rücksicht auf Hegels System nehmen. Denn in der Religionsphilosophie verfolgt meines Erachtens Hegels de facto auch sein Programm der Widerlegung des Spinotismus in der Logik, ähm, wie in Teil 2 besprochen. In der Logik rekurriert Hegel auf die erste Definition in Ethik, also Causa Sui, als den eigentlichen Kern des, Sp des Spinozismus, woraus er dann durch seine epistemologische Kritik schüt, äh, schüt, äh, erst den Spinozismus A und dann Spinozismus B schrittweise hervorbringt und letztlich das Modell der Subjektivität als die Wahrheit des Spinozismus enthüllt. Mit diesem Modell glaubt Hegel gleichzeitig die Freiheit im Sinne des Beisichtseins im Anderen erreicht und Jakobis entweder oder zwischen System und Freiheit vermieden zu haben. Eine Analogie dazu können wir auch in der Religionsphilosophie identifizieren. Der Spinozismus A wird im Teil über den Brief der Religion hier angezogen und zur Interpretation auf die Substanz, äh, sorry, zur Interpretation der Religionen am Anfang der Religionsgeschichte verwendet. Vor allem, ähm, weil seine Zurückführung auf die Substanz den eigentlichen Ausgang, Aus, Anfangspunkt der Religion bildet. 
seinen epistemologischen Mangel aber, dass man dabei allein, Zitat, die abstrakte, nicht die geistige Einheit heraushebt, wie Hegel ähm, in diesem ähm, Kolleg sagt, führte zum Okosmismus. Im Vergleich dazu legt der Spinozismus B wegen der Causa Immanenz eine Grundlage für das Modell der, Sub der Subjektivität, womit die Freiheit zu erreichen ist, aber nur die Grundlage, die noch zum Modell der Subjektivität zu transformieren ist. Dasselbe gilt auch für die Religionsgeschichte, insofern als die dem Spinozismus B entsprechende persische Religion aufgrund der Causa Immanenz bereits an der Schwelle zu den europäischen Religionen als der nächste Fa nächsten Phase steht, welche wegen jedes Modells der Subjektivität erst die Freiheit ermöglicht. Ein, an an ein anderer Grund hat wahrscheinlich mit dem Pantheismusvorwurf gegen Hegel am Ende der 1820er Jahre wie bei Tolluck und Hösemann zu tun. So ergreift der Hegel in religionsphilosophischen äh, Kollegen 27 wie in der Vorrede zur zweiten Fassung der Enzyklopädie die Gelegenheit, sich gegen diese Angriffe zu wehren. Meines Erachtens liegt sein strategischer Zug in der Differenzierung von zwei ähm, Arte, Arten des Spinozismus, äh, des Pantheismus. Was Tolluck der Philosophie Hegels vorwirft, bezeichnet Hegel hier als einen von jenen frommen Leuten, äh, missverstandenen und von niemandem wirklich behaupteten Pantheismus, dass jedes endliche Ding in seiner Unmittelbarkeit schon Gott ist. Ein, Pant ein Pantheismus, welchen Hegel alles Götterei nennt. Davon setzt sich der Kosmismus als Allgötterei ab. Der erste, der Pantheismus, Zitat, in seinem richtigen Sinn, äh, Zitat, endet ist. In dem Hegel zum nächsten Schritt Allgötterei dann weiter von seinem eigenen Begriff der Religion distanziert, hat er sich de facto gegen ähm, diesen Vorwurf des Pantheismus, ähm, welchen er als alles Götterei ähm, bezeichnet, immunisiert. 4.3. Gleichwohl hat dieses doppelte Bild Spinozas eine Konsequenz mit sich gebracht. Wie oben gesagt, entspricht die buddhistische, indische Religion und die persische Religion jeweils dem Spinozismus A und dem Spinozismus B. Dennoch, nach der von Hegel konzipierten Religionsgeschichte gehören alle diese Religionen gleichzeitig zur äh, orientalischen Religion, welche die erste Phase der, der Religionsgeschichte bildet. Mit der Einheitlichkeit dieser Phase geht offenbar nicht an hier, dass die Formel der buddhistischen indischen Religion und die von mehr der persischen Religion nicht im Anklang miteinander zu bringen sind. Hinsichtlich der Immanenz des Unendlichen im Endlichen steht die von mehr der persischen Religion de facto der von mehr der europäischen Religionen wie der griechischen, äh, der römischen und letztlich der christlichen ähm, und zwar dem Modell der Subjektivität näher als der von mehr der buddhistischen und indischen Religion. Aufgrund dieser Unstimmigkeit innerhalb der Einheit der orientalischen Religion geht Hegel im letzten Le religionsphilosophischen Kolleg 31 so weit, auf die Einheit der orientalischen Religion und die klassische Unterteilung der Geschichte, ähm, der jeweilige Unterteilung in den Orient und Europa zu verzichten, sodass der Orient auf Hinterasien ähm, wie die buddhistische Welt und Indien schimpft, ähm, während die vor der asiatische, vornehmlich die äh, persische Religion, nunmehr mit der europäischen Religion eine neue Einheit ausmacht. Und zwar unter keinen anderen Namen als der Religion der Freiheit. Ja. Vielen Dank. Ähm, wir haben einige Minuten, um zu diskutieren, für Fragen oder Bemerkung. Ja. ja, Professor Kobe. Also, danke für den äh, Vortrag. Ähm, ich möchte zwei sagen wir, äh, Klarifizierungen äh, 
Ich möchte zwei Klarifizierungen haben, nämlich erstens, ich glaube, dass Sie ähm, in Ihrem äh, Argumentationsgang äh, so etwa äh, argumentiert haben, dass die, der Begriff der Religion sich nach dem Begriff des Geistes und der Subjektivität richtet, aber äh, diese aus dem Begriff der, 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 der Substanz herkommt. Und das ist dann äh, die Verbindung zwisch, äh, zum Spinozismus. Aber ist es nicht eben so, dass äh, die Subjektivität sich gegen Substanz und Spinozismus als, äh, als, äh, als das von Hegel äh, verstanden wurde, wurde richtet. Also würde, würde äh, in dieser Beziehung äh, den, äh, der Schluss äh, sich nicht gerade umgekehrt äh, lauten sollen, dass also äh, Hegels Begriff der Religion sich gegen das, äh, den Begriff der Sub Substanz einsetzt, durchsetzte. Das ist die erste Frage. Und die äh, zweite Frage äh, Sehen Sie eine, eine geschichtliche Entwicklung vom Substanz zum Subjekt, äh, also vorgetragen oder äh, äh, gesehen von Hegel, äh, in der äh, Entwicklung von den äh, asiatischen zu europäischen äh, Religionen? Also die Frage ist, was äh, kriegt man damit? Was, äh, äh, wie erleichter, äh, erleichtert uns äh, eure Fassung von äh, Hegels Begriff der Religion für der, das Verständnis derselben. Okay. Vielen Dank ähm, für Ihre Fragen. Ähm, zum Ersten, ja, das, auf, auf jeden Fall, es handelt sich ähm, um eine Kritik ähm, äh, an, an, das äh, an das Substantialitätsverhältnis, ähm, genauso wie in der Logik. Ähm, was ich hier ähm, hervorheben möchte, ist, dass das ist eine Grundlage, äh, womit man weiterarbeiten kann. Und äh, interessant ist, Herr Hegel, dass in seiner Darstellung des, des Begriffs der Religion auch die erste Moment, ähm, äh, dass das erste Moment, also diese ursprüngliche Einheit als Substanz genannt hat, aber Substanz, eine Substanz, die ähm, weiter zu subjektivieren ist, dass ich, was ich hier betonen möchte, ist das Verhältnis der, des Modells der Subjektivität zu diesem ähm, Substanz, Substantialitätsverhältnis ist an, ganz anders, qualitativ anders als der, das Verhältnis äh, zu dieser Kosmismus-Version, ähm, äh, kosmistische Version, ähm, die, die Hegel ähm, Spinoza offiziell vorwirft. Und ich denke, das, gibt, das handelt sich nicht um einen quantitativen Unterschied, sondern um einen Qualitative. Ähm, und das möchte ich hervorheben. Und auch im Angesicht des ähm, Rezeptionsspinosas, zum Beispiel, äh, wenn wir Feuerbachs Kritik äh, der Religion vorliest, dann, dann, ähm, dann hat, ist diese Grundlage, äh, Grundlegungsbedeutung äh, des Spinozismus äh, ganz äh, verschwunden. Also das ist, möchte ich nur ähm, Philosophie geschichtlich äh, in den Vordergrund lügen. Und zum zweiten Frage, ja, ich glaube, dass Hegel im Allgemeinen so einem Paradigma ähm, folgt, ähm, einer ganz strikten äh, Entsprechung mit der Logik möchte er am Anfang unternehmen, aber das gelingt, ist ihm am Ende nicht gelungen. Aber diese, diese, äh, diese, diese, diese Paradigma im, im Allgemeinen ähm, hat er beibehalten. Und im Großen und Ganzen würde ich sagen, dass, dass die, die Religionsgeschichte kann man als ähm, eine Entwicklung von der Substanz zur Subjektivität ähm, lesen. Vielen Dank. Ich habe nur eine kurze Frage. Zunächst ist es ja ganz interessant zu sehen, dass die Wirksamkeit von Spinoza sich über die Logik hinaus in die Religionsphilosophie erstreckt, wie Sie gezeigt haben. Und die äh, Religionsphilosophie ihrerseits ist Teil der Philosophie des absoluten Geistes, was sehr wichtig ist, selbstverständlich. Also in Wahrheit sprechen wir vom absoluten Geist. Ähm, und meine Frage ist, anknüpfend an die Änderung, die Sie notiert haben in 27 oder wann, 
ähm, ob es ja, ähm, die mir wichtig erscheint, äh, ob sie eine analoge Beobachtung in den Parallelvorlesungen über den absoluten Geist beobachten, also über die Philosophie der Kunst, über die Philosophie der Weltgeschichte. Also Hegel hat ja keine übergreifende Philosophie des absoluten Geistes geschrieben. Wir sind angewiesen darauf, diese einzelnen Disziplinen zu verfolgen und die noch in Jahrgängen sich ständig ändernder Konzepte. Also meine Frage, gibt es auch in den anderen Disziplinen, etwa in der Philosophie der Kunst, so ein Switch? Das wäre interessant. Vielen Dank. Okay. Ja, vielen Dank für Ihre Frage. Ähm, ich denke, weil ähm, der, diese, diese, ähm, Hervorhebung, diese Hervorhebung ähm, des äh, kosmischen ähm, Fassung des Spinozismus ähm, ich finde, dass das äh, kommt am ähm, schaffsten ähm, in Religionsphilosophie zum Ausdruck in Kunstreligion, äh, Kunstphilosophischen äh, Kollegs und Geschichtsphilosophischen Kollegs sehe ich, äh, finde das nicht so erheblich wie wir hier. Und deswegen, ähm, das, ist, das gilt als ein Beleg äh, für meine äh, Vermutung des zweiten Grundes, dass hier ähm, dass das Hegel sich in dieser Gelegenheit äh, greifen möchte, um gegen äh, diesen Vorwurf äh, sich dagegen zu wehren. Und ja, so, so einen äh, substanziellen äh, Wechsel äh, habe ich bisher nicht äh, gemerkt. Vielen Dank. Herr Rogit. Ja, herzlichen Dank. Ähm, ich habe gestern versucht darzulegen, dass... Ähm, innerhalb der Logik Hegel aus der Perspektive zwei verschiedene Begriffe Spinoza interpretiert. Und die Frage ist nämlich, inwieweit man diese zweideutige Perspektive eben auch in der Religionsphilosophie finden kann. Und die Frage ist nämlich, kann man Spinoza A mit, mit, mit dem Absoluten, irgendwie in Verbindung bringen und dann Spinoza B mit der, dem Substantialitätsverhältnis in Verbindung bringen und, oder wenigstens mit dem Spinoza, äh, der im Lichte des Absoluten interpretiert wird und dann mit dem Spinoza, der im Lichte des Substantialitätsverhältnis äh, ähm, interpretiert wird. Und äh, ja, wenn nein, gut, dann haben wir eine, in der Religionsphilosophie eine ganz andere äh, Aufteilung. Der, der Perspektiven von Hegel. Wenn die Antwort doch ja ist, dann sind, gibt es Anzeichen innerhalb der Religionsphilosophie von diesen Begriffen im weiteren Sinne. Zum Beispiel beim Absoluten äh, kommen Attribute vor, kommen Moden vor. Oder beim, beim Substantialitätsverhältnis kommen auch andere Aspekte dieser äh, Kategorie vor oder nicht. Oder bleibt eigentlich diese Parallele ganz, ganz allgemein, wenn sie überhaupt besteht? Ich, äh, ich würde sagen, es bleibt ganz, ganz ähm, allgemein. Also am Anfang, da sieht man auch in anderen ähm, Vorlesungen, dass Hegel so wirklich ein, ein, so ein äh, Programm unternehmen möchte, so eins zu eins Entsprechung ähm, herauszufinden, zu identifizieren. Aber ähm, je mehr er sich mit den Materialien äh, beschäftigt, äh, desto weniger er sich darauf besteht. Und ich würde sagen, dass ich tendiere zu dem zweiten Alternative, dass das hier nur eine ganz allgemeine Analogie, äh, diese Ableitung der Attribute zum Beispiel aus den Abs Absoluten und dann, was am Ende die Wissenslogik ähm, stattfindet, dass, dass ähm, so eine Analogie äh, findet man eigentlich in der Religionsphilosophie nicht. Ja, ja bitte schön. Also ganz kurz äh, dazu. Ähm, du auch. Wenn, wenn Sie recht haben, und, und, und ich, ich, ich glaube Ihnen völlig, ich wollte nur fragen dann, ob äh, der Name Spinoza in der Religionsphilosophie eigentlich an Bedeutung verlieren, äh, verliert. Und das ist eben die Gefahr. Je allgemeiner Hegel über Spinoza spricht, auch wenn, Hegel, äh, wenn Spinoza in, äh, aus einer Perspektive im Mittelpunkt äh, der hegelischen Auffassung der Religion steht, besteht auch die Gefahr, dass der Name Spinoza bei Hegel irgendwie so an, an Bedeutung verliert, weil wir die Einzelheiten irgendwie verlieren. Finden Sie das auch oder meinen Sie nein, was Hegel, man kann äh, das, was Hegel über Spinoza in der Religionsphilosophie implizit oder explizit sagt, irgendwie immer noch auf 
Spinoza beziehen? Oder geht diese Beziehung irgendwie verloren? Ja, vielen Dank Ned, für die weitere Frage. Ähm, ja, ich, 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 ich habe auch an, ähm, an, an, die Heut, äh, gest, äh, an die Diskussion gestern äh, gedacht, wenn ich äh, gestern Abend äh, an meinem Text arbeite. Ähm, ich denke, ich würde sagen, das handelt sich um, ja, würde ich sagen, dass in, in, äh, in der Logik ist, kann man noch diese, diese wirklich äh, Auseinandersetzung mit Spinoza, Spinoza so äh, identifizieren, aber hier ist mehr und mehr, dass das Hegel würde ich nicht so in die andere Richtung gehen, dass Hegel Spinozismus immer mehr andere Bedeutung zugeschrieben hat, so dass die originale Bedeutung quasi ähm, äh, nicht, nicht mehr so, so in dem Zentrum äh, steht, dass er quasi Spinozismus durch die orientalischen ähm, Dinge zu interpretieren versucht. Das, darin liegt auch äh, sein also die, die implizite Kritik an, an, an Schelling und, und anderen Leute und ähm, ja, insbesondere wenn wir in Betracht ziehen, wie viele andere Bedeutungen äh, er in, den, in, den, in seinen Auseinandersetzungen mit all diesen Materialien Spinotismus zugeschrieben hat. Und ich, in dem Sinne, das äh, stimme ich Ihnen gewissermaßen zu. Ja, bitte, Frau Binnenstock. Vielleicht. Wenn ich noch Zeit habe, nur eine kleine, kleine Frage. Ich sehe, dass Sie eine ganze Arbeit über Hegels Konzeption des Orients in der Berliner Zeit geschrieben haben. Also das ist hier über Spinoza, aber hat er, sicherlich hat er gehabt, neuere Quellen über das Orient gelesen und was würden Sie bevorzugen als, als andere Quellen? Na, da gibt es andere Quellen, neuere, die Hegel hatte in okay. Berlin. Ähm, ich würde sagen, es ist nicht ein, eine Frage entweder oder. Dass, dass er, also mein Projekt ist so, dass, dass er durch die ähm, Heidelberger Enzyklopädie schon einen, einen systematischen Rahmen etabliert hat. Und ähm, da, das, das bedeutet auch diese Paradigma von der Substanz und Subjektivität. Aber im Laufe der in der, insbesondere am, äh, zu Beginn der Berliner Zeit hat er sich äh, mit des, diesen intensiven Studien alle diese neuen Materialien äh, angefangen. Und, aber diese zwei Seiten äh, stehen nicht im Bild zueinander, sondern er hat diese systematischen Rahmen und, und auf der anderen Seite die Materialien versucht er, äh, zu, es ist auch kein einseitiger Aufdrängen des Systems auf diese Materialien, sondern er im Großen und Ganzen sagt, ähm, hat er den Eindruck, sagt man, ist mal so, dass die Orient zum der Phase der Substanz gehört, aber wie diese Völker im Laufe der, äh, der, der Geschichte äh, sich äh, gestalten, äh, das ist eine andere Frage. Und diese feinere äh, Struktur des, der Philosophie des Geistes äh, erarbeitet durch die, seine, in seine Auseinandersetzung mit den Materialien. Und in diesem Sinne würde ich sagen, dass, dass er, also er versucht, ähm, da, da ein, ein Beispiel dafür ist, dass dieser, wenn er Spinozismus äh, im Sinne des Kosmismus befestigt hat, und dann ist er zum Gedanken gekommen, dass dieser Modell nicht der, zum Beispiel seine Auffassung der persischen Welt ähm, zu dieser seiner Auffassung äh, passt, und dann hat er diese, diese Verbindung zwischen der persischen Welt und äh, des Spinotismus im Sinne des Okosimismus, äh, also das darauf verzichtet. Und dann sehen wir, dass das ist ein, eher ein ganz dynamisches äh, Verhältnis zwischen beiden. Okay, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Okay, the next speaker is Giulia Bernardo. Giulia Bernardo is a postdoc research fellow at the University of Padova uh, in the field of theoretical philosophy. Uh, she works uh, about the notion of philosophy and so on, on metaphilosophical uh, perspectives uh, in classical German philosophy, Kant, 
Hegel, Schelling, Jacobi. And she has her PhD uh, in uh, Padova and Bochum. It was a co tutel between Padova and Bochum. The title of the talk today is Adequate Cognition Between Hegel and Spinoza, a threat to activity. Oh, a threat to activity? <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, so thanks for the organization of this wonderful and stimulating um, conference. And as you will see in a moment, uh, I will try to take part, to take a stance in an ongoing discussion uh, began uh, yesterday uh, with Professor Ferrer, um, Dr. Yevicevic, and Professor Holgate. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So in this paper, I would like to put forward the basis for investigating the question of method in Spinoza's and Hegel's philosophies with emphasis on the effects it generates. By the term effect, I mean provisionally, uh, the kind of transformation produced by philosophical exposition or recipients who engage with it and by performing it come to adequate cognition. Exploring the transformative potential of the works of Spinoza and Hegel presents a challenge at the outset. This is due to the fact that the crucial processes of their philosophies are not primarily concerned with finite modi or subjects, but with truth. The question then arises whether any activity that can be explained by reference to either the expression of substance or the exposition of the idea can truly be defined as activity in the proper sense. Are the effects on the readers an integral part thereof or not? And to what extent is it possible to consider the effects as something philosophy must essentially account for, rather than just a side effect of the substance and the idea being expressed? The vagueness of the notions of activity, effect, as well as adequate cognition and truth already points out the problematic ambition of a comparison, its potentialities and the limits of a task of addressing a possibly shared uh, methodological issue. The differences between Hegel's and Spinoza's philosophy are indeed striking and sharp, not only in Hegel's interpretation thereof, but also in the conceptual language that they develop between substance and subject. However, when trying to focus solely on Hegel's philosophical method in some of its most pivotal moments, family resemblances emerge that cannot simply be dismissed. They do not regard vague analogies, but rather quasi-literal references, though displaced in a different framework. The eternal idea one reads at the end of the encyclopedia, quote, eternally remains active and genders and enjoy itself, end of quote. In these lines, it's difficult not to hear echoing the reference to Spinoza's blessedness, which consists in, I quote, love of God, a love which arises from the third kind of knowledge and must be related to the mind insofar as it acts, end of quote. Nevertheless, once one tries to focus on the family resemblances, the difference resurfaces, as Professor Zankalen has already shown. Among them, a differentiated emphasis on activity is to be noted. Against what one may expect from the image of rigidity in substance and differentiation in subjectivity, it is actually Spinoza who explicitly expounds a, differ a direct proportionality between adequate cognition and activity. The more one knows God, the more active one is. At stake is the wise man whom Spinoza defines as the, uh, the one who is more powerful and capable of doing more, whereas her power comes precisely from cognition. I quote, self-esteem, uh, acquiescence in se ipso, is a joy born of the fact that man considers himself and his power of acting. But man's true power of, of acting or virtue is reason itself, which man considers clearly and distinctly. Therefore, self-esteem arises from reason, end of quote. Bracketing for now a challenge in Spinoza's text that I will address later, namely the relation between the third kind of knowledge and reason, it can be noted that no similar emphasis on acting is to be immediately traced in Hegel's philosophy. While it is beyond doubt Hegel's redetermination of rationality is essentially coupled with freedom, Nevertheless, it seems at first not to be explicitly coupled with activity and action as it is explicit in Spinoza's philosophy. On the contrary, according to Hegel's philosophy, it seems to imply an attitude that is rather coupled with a kind of passivity. The philosophical enterprise, Hegel claims, consists in, uh, I quote, conducting a genuine examination such that in the scientific development 
the only thing that remains to us is poorly to look, look on. One should be simply a non-looker, das reine Zusehen. The phenomenological restraint to the tendency of subjectivity to make our own contribution is upheld in the science of logic, where true rationality seems to act in a quasi-objectivistic dimension against which this objective thinking should be subjugated in a way. It is the thought determinations that have us in their possession, end of quote. It could be rightly argued that considering the finite subject as passive is a preliminary condition, so to say, a kind of attitude whose absence hinders proper philosophical discourse. However, it is still important to know that Hegel presents logic as such, as the, uh, quote, absolute building and dis discipline, sucht of consciousness, end of quote. Whereas an important aspect thereof is precisely to hold back additions to the process of thinking and to learn avoiding dependence on habitual patterns of thought, relying only, uh, on the contrary, on the path of thought determinations. In my paper, I claim that relying on the different emphasis on activity is a move that, though already helpful in mobilizing the relation between substance and subject, is not straightforward, straightforward to explore the two philosophies. To enhance our understanding of the specificities of Spinoza's and Hegel's philosophical work, I propose to investigate the extent to which the methodological exposition may be seen as inseparable from the active engagement it generates. More precisely, I aim to show how Spinoza's exposition of substance and Hegel's justifications of philosophy's concept are significantly inseparable, though not primarily dependent, from experiencing, gaining, and recognizing a certain activity. To this aim, I discuss the ethics own advancement with regard to the second and the third kind of knowledge and the philosophical account of the issue of discipline displayed in the encyclopedia. And I start with the latter. Uh, I think that, uh, unlike Kant, Hegel regards the justification of the question of participation as well as the question of cognition and activity as essential for philosophy. According to him, I quote, philosophy must be taught and learned as well as any other science, end of quote. One reads in the um, 80, 12 Gutachten to Nitama. The issue is not negligible. For it seems precisely a question of, of sight, of which philosophy, being its own time apprehended in thought, should account for. In the rationalization processes of modernity, as well as in the growing need for the publicity of law and of what interests our social life, according to Hegel, I quote, die Bildung der Welt hat eine Unterwendung genommen, der Gedanke hat sich an die Spitze alles dessen gestellt, was gelten soll. End of quote. In this epoch, Philosophy emerges uh, as the form that better sits to teach us to understand the contradictions of our living conditions and to recognize the universal and the contingent. Such a diagnosis uh, that certain life world uh, contradictions and philosophy is on time with the search for their understanding in thought does not mean, however, that everyone consciously participates in this contemporary need from birth. Still less does it mean that philosophy is already secured as justified knowledge for this task. The diagnosis cannot serve as a fixed point, it is rather part of the process in which philosophy shows itself as justified cognition, a cognition which, according to Hegel, in order to be a truly scientific, cannot presuppose anything. And here, I think, an explosive complication comes to the fore. For philosophy to be itself, so to be on time and be the proper understanding of this need, must proceed philosophically. That is, it must justify its concept without relying on anything else. But precisely this need for scientific, scientificity seems not to lead to directly account for the interest of our freedom, since philosophy's own interest should be to account for itself. So how can philosophy be properly philosophy? My interest in the encyclopedia relies on the fact that uh, its ambivalent nature in a way embodies the, the, this paradox and mirrors the appearance of a separation between philosophical and the didactical issue. The text should serve as a manual, a textbook. Uh, it contains dry, par dry paragraphs, seems to belong to the former metaphysics, produces a kind of estrangement, estrangement effect, partially analogous maybe to the geometrical order. On the other hand, it is meant as a quote, a new elaboration of philosophy according to a method that will be recognized eventually as the only genuine, true one, the only method that is identical with the content, end of quote. 
If philosophy, through its discursive presentation, is to prove itself capable of accounting for itself, then it cannot take the advantage that other sciences have of presupposing its method and subject matter. It must derive them in its own discursive unfolding. In this process, even the Einteilung of matter, its own presentation as science, is for Hegel crucial. Unlike the other sciences, and maybe also the ethics uh, in the eyes of Hegel, where the Einteilung of the material is stated from, stated from the outset by means of titles that set, set forth a sequence that it is not in the matter because it does not find a demonstration within the science, because content and form are not connected each other, with each other, philosophy should be self-aware of the development of its own concept. Though, precisely in this process of immanent unfolding, we face something maybe unexpected. For we encounter the definitions of absolute, uh, of absolute, the metaphysical definitions of God. At each thinking uh, determination, immanently exposed corresponds one of them. So absolute is being, it is nothing, it is infinite, it is substance, and so on. And so on. Under such definition, Hegel collects uh, structures from the history of philosophy and from religions. At first, the definitions seem something superfluous or that at best belong to a pedagogical facilitation as definitions, something that in any case does not and should not contribute to the process of philosophical determination of truth. And this says Hegel explicitly. Uh, despite the initial warning, the entire process of the encyclopedia, as well as in science of logic, but this in brackets, uh, which advances uh, in an immanent and necessary manner, is punctuated by such definitions to the point that even its final determination, namely the absolute idea, is referred to in terms of the point where all definitions become absolute, that is, they are fully understood and criticized. Why such a systematic critique there too? Why did the science produce them instead of abandoning them at the opening door of the science? Uh, the, first the first answer is because definition as such has to be proven to be insufficient. Beginning with the structure of judgment in the um, paragraph 30 of the Vorbegriff and ending with the critique of the formal structure of the definition and theorem in the idea, paragraph uh, 166, the science actually comes on the side of the content, namely of the thought, uh, thought determinations, to exhibit the form of definition and to criticize its limits. This shows a transformative potential because the exhibition and critique of the definitions proves us that, that our ordinary grammar, with which we mostly oriented ourselves in the world, implicitly contains several metaphysical claims that, being mostly unconscious, subjugate our capacity to deal with actual transformation. But I think that the question regards about all the organization of the science as such. Just because the form of definition has been endorsed, its critique is not something presupposed, but rather scientifically performed on both sides to the point where content and form overlap and the method can be said to be true. By assuming the form of definition and coming to criticize it on the side of the content, science reveals to be critical not only to the form of knowledge of ordinary consciousness or of other sciences, but also to the form itself assumes and comes to a systematic development not by just considering an alternative to the definition by, by immanently overcoming its limits in it. At the end of science, in the method section in the absolute idea and the three syllogism at the end of encyclopedia, the scientificity of philosophy is further revealed as inseparable from the process that leads to it um, and, the, and that produces transformative effects. In this sense, Philosophy arrives at this concept by making the subjects a recipient of a science that is learned in the process of its consummation and in the same process establishes its own truth and purpose without presupposition, neither the cosmic dimension in which it should function as cognition, nor the audience's conscious uh, belonging to their own world and time. In this radical questioning, uh, the proof of timeliness of philosophy is then inseparable from the process by which subjects learn to dwell on the universal, to deal with the contradiction in which one is caught, liberated from the illusion of thinking reduced to one of our instruments. Now I um, go to Spinoza. The story of Spinoza is significantly different. It is another epoch, a different consideration of freedom and also of teaching. I think, for instance, at Spinoza's refusal to teach philosophy in Heidelberg. 
Their difference concerns also the method, which according to Hegel would prevent the kind of self-reflexivity displayed by the idea. If one thus suspends Hegel's critique to Spinoza's geometrical method and considers it, one is confronted with a much more complex, complex landscape. For our argument, the question is, how does the ethic advance? Um, advancing in geometrical order, the ethic starts from causa sui and articulates the actual expression of substance. To express substance, the ethics advances with the presentation of the attributes and finite modi. Where does the ethics end? It ends in the fifth part entitled on the power of the intellect or on human freedom, a result which is gained through the power of demonstration. What kind of transformative effects does this advancement produce? And I think this would be my, uh, my proposal. Precisely here, a crucial role is, to by, is played by this column to Proposition 30, to the second part of ethics, where Spinoza distinguishes the um, three kinds of knowledge. And as we know, Spinoza provides the example of three ways of arriving at the fourth propositional number of a series. What strikes me in the example is that for Spinoza, for Spinoza each of the kinds of knowledge eventually arrives at the correct fourth number, though designating a different means of reaching the same conclusion. At least, Spinoza, as I understand it, seems to hold a continuous position about the second and the third kind of knowledge. Both reason and intuition concern adequate ideas. An adequate idea, uh, a quote considered in itself without relation to an object, has all the properties or intrinsic de uh, denomination of a true idea, end of quote. Furthermore, by including its proximate cause, it can only beget adequate ideas, and thus the procession from an adequate idea of common properties, reason, or the essences of attributes, intuition, is necessarily true. With regard to the third kind of knowledge, Spinoza claims that, and I quote, this kind of knowing proceeds from an adequate idea of the formal essence of certain attributes of God to the adequate knowledge of the formal essence of a thing. End of quote. If we, once we have crossed the whole path of the ethics with the most genuine effort to follow the geometric order, step back in a way, we see a proceeding at stake. For we have followed the rich part of expression of substance that proceeds from the adequate cognition of the attributes to the essence of a singular thing whose power at the end of the ethics is fully explored, namely the mind. But here it is our mind also at stake. If this argument may appear uh, possible or sound, it may be not excessive or not too excessive to understand the ethics as enabling the experience of a proper activity, relying on reason but different from it. This is, that this is maybe, after all, not too provocative, is suggestive, I think, where it is argued that, quote, the mind's intellectual love of God is the very love of God by which God loves himself, end of quote. It is precisely in this column to one of the most fundamental proposition of the whole ethics, namely this column to proposition 36, as already uh, said yesterday by Professor Holgate, uh, that Spinoza states that, and it's a longer quote, I'm sorry, but I will read it aloud. Because the essence of our mind consists only in knowledge of which God is the beginning and foundation, it is clear how our mind, with respect both to essence and existence, follows from the divine nature and continually depends on God. I thought this worth the trouble of noting here in order to show by this example how much the knowledge of singular things I have called intuitive or knowledge of the third kind can accomplish and how much more powerful it is than the universal knowledge I've called knowledge of the second kind. For although I have shown generally in, part, in the first part that all things, and consequently the human mind also, depend on God both for their uh, essence and their existence, nevertheless that demonstration, though legitimate and put beyond all chance of doubt, still does not affect our mind as much as when it is inferred from the very essence of any singular thing 
which we say depends on God, end of quote. There are, I think, lots of elements noteworthy. What is at stake is the essence of our mind or the explanation regarding knowledge based on God. This is what has been demonstrated, as Spinoza said, uh, says, shown, since the beginning of the ethics by means of Ordo Geometricus. But now something further seems to be possible, and this is a knowledge that accomplishes more, says Spinoza, and is more powerful, for it regards the essence of a singular thing whose essence, which is knowledge, proceeds from God, from the adequate knowledge of the former essence of certain attributes, namely thought, and is sustained by it. This is not meant to weaken the power of geometry. As mathematics in the example of the th three kinds of knowledge stands for spontaneity of the mind, hmm, as a power, as, uh, as Anna Sharp suggests, granted not in one's ap appetites with respect to empirical objects, but rather in the joy the mind ex experiences in generating adequate ideas, Geometry offers the force of demonstration by which one can understand the causes of ideas and thus be inspired, so to say, with the eyes of the mind to see their truths for themselves. What is treated in the fifth part is indeed, I quote, the power of reason showing what it can do against the affects and what freedom of mind or blessedness is. From this we shall see how much more the wise man can do rather than the ignorant, end of quote. Uh, what is shown is that there is the possibility, I think once and since one has crossed the ethics, to catch in an example the power of the mind, something that it can see in a glimpse, so to say, or at least it can experience and learn to recognize by understanding its own power and spontaneity, which radically differs from the illusionary images of spontaneity and think at the um, appendix to the first part of the ethics. To conclude, uh, I come back uh, to the beginning. What is at stake for both Spinoza and Hegel is uh, the proper determination of rationality, one that, though highly differentiated, is affected by analogous problems, one of these being, uh, for instance, the charge of elitism hmm, in all this um, discourse, hunting this discourse. Even if philosophy is art, it is not the unique way to gain self-comprehension, and it is an activity which requ uh, requires rigor and efforts and pertains to the rarest things, I think both Spinoza and Hegel aimed at showing how its performance may allow us to experience the kind of activity that we seek to recognize in our understanding of our world. Such a liberation, I claim, is powerful to the extent to which it is gained for the first time precisely in the same process of expression of substance and of exposition of the idea, and not elsewhere. For blessedness is not the reward of virtue, but with virtue itself, says Spinoza. What I've tried to show uh, is not meant to let the two models overlap, on the contrary. Uh, I just hope that the experimental, in a way, picture could help set the basis for further understanding what is at stake in Spinoza's and Hegel's philosophy, or even in the space between substance and subject. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, we have a little bit of time for discussion, questions, or clarification. Please, Boyana. So, thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, just, uh, do yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of questions in my mind. Uh, it's a great topic. So, um, maybe two. Um, so, a, as you put it well, um, I think that the third kind of knowledge is adequate cognition and dependent on the second one, and it concerns rational cognition and reasoning. That's true, and it's a power of cognition and bound to with activity. Mm -hmm. But now the question is, um, so we have a distinction, you seem, you seem to, uh, to have made a distinction between, okay, a, a adequate cognition and activity in the sense of power of cognition and exercise uh, of this uh, power. So my question would be, um, how do we exercise this third kind of knowledge? And 
it seems to me that you suggested, I, I, I went with the line of practical activity, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that you've suggested the opposite, uh, kind of giving through the experience of, of the whole ethics. Mm -hmm. This was your suggestion. So right. uh, this is the first question. And the second one, um, at the beginning, you've, um, uh, you've uh, connected thought determinations with passivity in Hegel. Now, um, it's true, we do operate with thought thinking itself, um, uh, but, um, but I don't think that this is separate from me or you or us who are thinking this thought that thinks itself. And this does not mean that it is me or you and us who are the origins, who carry the origin of this thought as, and thus uh, resulting in a purely subjective um, uh, view, this would be Fichte, uh, but there is a positive correlation nevertheless, because we are not just externally observing the development of thought, uh, thinking itself, but we take an active part. Um, now, so uh, I would go back to this question on passivity and activity and thought determination, so thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are l uh, lots of insights there, so I will try just to uh, to catch some of the uh, suggestions you um, you gave. Um, also, with regard to the uh, talk you uh, held yesterday, um, I think that, um, as you say, I, I, fin I find your uh, interpretation very um, inspiring. So the uh, action and the role of the practical, so to say, uh, in a way, um, in in your reading, they overlap. Uh, I will be. I would be resistant to such a uh, overlapping, um, at least in in the ethics uh, for the uh, part that I um, so um, I've understood the the uh, Spinoza argument. For um, it seems to me that um, Spinoza is defining um, and repeats also repeats this um, this issue. Uh, the the mind, insofar as it. Um, as knowledge, it acts. So action and cognition are the same. And we have a, a kind of, I, I would say, definition, uh, a broad definition of action, which is not the practical as we would expect in the ethics, I, I mean. Um, action is coupled with um, adequate cognition. Hmm? The more we have adequate cognition, we are already acting. So we have not to uh, translate, so to say, uh, some cognitive, uh, cognitive effort than in, in reality. Uh, I think that Spinoza is trying uh, to, to uh, revise precisely this model. Hegel also is trying to, to revise this model. Um, and I think that we, the, the practical uh, dimension uh, would, in, would uh, ask us to also confront with the, the political struggles, not, not, just the, um, not, not just the ethic, as I, I would say. So I would say that there is uh, emphasis put on activity, and such an activity is coupled with um, cognition. Um, but your question was um, uh, was pointing out the question of um, exercise and gaining this activity, and, and I think this is a wonderful question, because uh, I think that, uh, as many of us, I think, um, I find the examples Spinoza gives uh, with regard to the three kinds of knowledge not very much helpful in really understanding what is at stake. Huh? The, the mathematical example um, at stake in understanding what would be the exercise of this third kind of knowledge. The mathematical issue, I think, and maybe Professor Kobe also would go in this direction, I think, but we will see. Um, the mathematical uh, example uh, gives us a, an example of a kind of spontaneity, of a kind of productivity of the mind. So it suggests that uh, the third kind of knowledge is coupled with activity, and activity has to do with a kind of spontaneity, which is not uh, the spontaneity uh, we usually um, experience in, hmm? maybe. It's a, another kind of spontaneity that has to do with uh, productivity. And uh, my suggestion was to say, and I see a risk in, in my suggestion, was to say that the ethics maybe um, incorporates an example of gaining, of experiencing this kind of power, but I was not suggesting that this is, um, that this is blessedness once and for all. I think that the, um, 
the part of the exercise of a power is essential for Spinoza, not just that we uh, read the ethics once and we are blessed and then we have virtue and, and that's it. I, I don't think this is the case. But I think that this column, Shade, I, I think that this column is pointing, is, is emphasizing the possibility to see, this would, would be my, my proposal, um, to see um, the possibility of gaining and experiencing this power of, of the mind. Um, with the, uh, just briefly to, uh, to the, the um, uh, other question, is, is it, very briefly, it, it's really important. Uh, I was uh, trying just to sketch um, the, the, uh, the alternative um, between passivity and activity, uh, and I was saying this is not helpful hmm? because passivity uh, in a way also enables, a, we have to make a decision to think freely, of course. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, Julia, but my role is not so uh, kind. Um, <clears throat> we have three questions. Uh, Stephen, then Professor Kobe, and then uh, Frau Zankalen. <laughs> uh, only Kobe is professor here. Only Kobe. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, it's it triggered a lot of thoughts. And I guess I wanted to just um, uh, give you a few thoughts and basically get your response to them. Um, uh, one of, there seem to be a, a, three possible dis differences that, that either I'm getting out of your paper or your paper is triggering, triggering in my mind uh, between Spinoza and, and Hegel. Um, one of them is uh, that... Uh, and this does rely, I'm afraid, on the way I understand the second and the third forms of knowledge as, we under, as I articulated yesterday. But the Spinoza seems to be arguing that we can have an intuitive grasp of what we understand philosophically. Mm -hmm. Now, this, doesn't, this is not equivalent to Hegel saying, you know, yes, we can understand through art the idea. Right. This is different. This is that the very form of philosophical understanding, in a sense, can be grasped at one glance. Mm -hmm. That seems different from Hegel. Mm -hmm. The emphasis on joy, when, 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 when Spinoza says we are affected more deeply, what mm. I think he means by that, not like, it's not like Brecht, you know, we sort of move to rush out and act when we go to the theatre. Right. It's that we are affected with a deep sense of joy and blessedness. I don't know that Hegel goes on quite as much by saying, you know, how much joy we get out of reading the logic. I mean, you know, it's hard work. But I think that's really important. I think Spinoza means that. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing, I think this is a real difference, is that for Spinoza, because of the parallelism, thinking just is bodily activity expressed in another way, or bodily activity just is thinking. Mm -hmm. So there's no need for, to put things into praxis. Whereas I think with Hegel, it's not quite that easy. Um, uh, obviously, there is a difference between contemplative activity and practical activity. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I'm sorry if those, I, I, I kind of, was either I either heard those things in your talk or I, I they were triggered in my mind. But mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could respond and see yeah. if you agree or disagree. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Very briefly, I, I try to be uh, brief. Um, the the emphasis you put on the question of joy, I think it's it's crucial for the argument uh, because joy is a um, something that affects us with the idea of us being a cause mm? or God being a cause, right? No, but but in this column to Proposition Thirty One. Um, Spinoza says, we can check, uh, Spinoza says, um, please, um, <laughs> Spinoza says, um, the joy we uh, experience hmm, in the third kind of knowledge is the joy considers us as the cause and consequently God as cause. And I think that precisely this inverted um, proce um, processuality, so to say, is what is at stake in the ethics as such. In the geometrical way, it is articulated with the power of demonstration. And uh, your question. Right, uh, of course. Uh, I think that what adds uh, the third kind of knowledge is the possibility, I would say so, uh, to consider that proceeding from, sorry, from God to mind as such, also at a glance, as. Um, implying our power, our mind essence, the essence of our mind implied in precisely this procedure. 
And this would be the intuitive, so to speak, at a glance, this would be uh, what this column, and it is a column, we can also uh, argue about that, the possibility uh, of a difference between what reason as such as di displayed before our eyes and our, the essence of our mind. Hmm? And, and this is something that we experience. The, we see the power of the mind precisely experiencing the, our capability of proceeding as the substance has done in a way, maybe it's, it's too extreme, but this would be the direction I would, um, I would go into, um, in, a, in a way. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this was really inspiring. Um, I will basically repeat what has all will already be, be uh, said about passivity activity in, in Hegel. The yeah. Reine zu sehen, um, on, on, on the one hand, there is another a set of other formulations, Anstrengung des Begriffs, the Arbeit des Begriffs, and so on, that uh, uh, directs in the opposite way. But no. I think that this is the structural problem in the Hegel himself, where on the one hand you have those jokes about what Selbstdenken means, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we are not supposed to think okay. ourselves. So. The, the, there is a tension in, in, this, uh, in, the, in, in this expression that should be conceptualized. For instance, it's the same thing with Eigensinn, who that on, on the one hand, is Eigensinn, uh, arrogance, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that on the one hand has to be, has to be uh, wegarbeitet, mm -hmm. polished in order to think, but on the other hand, it's a crucial sign of the modernity that should be cherished and nourished. And Hegel, Hegel speaks about, uh, about uh, the Eigensinn that mm -hmm. honors the humankind. Mm -hmm. So the problem would be how to think these two within the same notion, uh, according to you, but mm -hmm. briefly, please. <laughs> this is one thing. And uh, uh, the other is um, the, the transition from the second to the third. Mm -hmm. uh, I basically... Um, Agree, but I would add another perspective. If we refer uh, refer to the intellectus de tractatus de intellectus emendazione at the beginning, there is a, a description of, of his entire uh, philosophical pro uh, project would mm -hmm. be, and he says to enjoy in, in, uh, perhaps with with others if possible, okay. because this. In, in which way then this is this uh, intuitive mm -hmm. science? It's not just personal experience, working you know, on myself to become a better man, but it's something that is conditioned with a certain political, societal uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Briefly, please. Yes, thanks for the constraints, yeah. Um, with regard to the first question, I um, totally agree. Uh, one should um, conceptualize this kind of, of tension. I, I didn't, so sorry for uh, just having um, put not effort in uh, distinguishing, in, in maybe in polishing the concept of passivity. Uh, you are uh, totally right, and one should precisely um, take the chance to uh, discuss what modernity as such has brought to uh, the, uh, as a, a challenge to, to philosophy, not just to diminish that. Um, the second question, uh, very briefly, uh, already in the ethics, Spinoza is very clear that although there are uh, things we, that we read at the, at the end of the ethic, although such things, uh, things that um, produces joy are rare um, and are difficult, this does not mean that it is a solitary experience. It is um, very clear in um, expounding the proportionality between the more one adequate um, knows, the better uh, knows God, and this kind of activity is an activity that man tries to perform in a community. So you are perfectly right uh, already in the ethics. Um, Spinoza is very clear in this direction. For precisely love has to do with the uh, the need, mm, the need to share such a beauty, uh, to, um, joyful experience with, with other people. Uh, of course, in the um, Tractatus, then there are um, other instances, um, and also in the uh, theological political Tractatus, Spinoza seems to be more um, explicit on a kind of elitist project 
but I don't think this is the, the last answer to, to the question. And I think that already in the ethics, Spinoza points toward the need to uh, share such an activity. And this means that joy is not just doing the ethics alone or something. Sorry. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I wonder if we should confront at this uh, opportunity a very deep difference between Spinoza and Hegel. Um, I point to the title, Ethics. Right. And I want to say that Spinoza is not talking about philosophy, but on our ethical life. Mm -hmm. And the practical impact is the fundamental intention of the whole procedure. And therefore, community or my single life, it's the question of enhancement our life. Mm -hmm. And this idea um, um, points to uh, the three types of cognition, mm -hmm. um, naturally. Um, but it's a question of enhancement, I repeat, our ethical life. And mm -hmm. this idea I does not see in Hegel. Right. Um, the normative mm -hmm. at attraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm I not sure. I, I oh, it's pardon. a transformation. It's, a trans oh, but it's really a transformation. Yeah. We have no um, a book from Hegel <laughs> called <laughs> The Ethics. Right. Um, I, I would maybe resist, but uh, this would. Yeah, right. Um, they are different, the, the projects. You are perfectly right in, in pointing out that. Um, I, I would resist, though, uh, to um, suggest that Hegel does not have an interest in that, but this is another story. With uh, regard to uh, Spinoza, I think that um, it's true that Spinoza actually does not speak about philosophy as such. Uh, you're right in that. But in the ethics, uh, he um, often um, is, uh, takes a stance with philosophers who do not actually see in the right um, way of proceeding from God to the singular things. And, the, mm, uh, and so I think that um, philosophical issues and ethical instances overlap in Spinoza. And I think that, uh, at least in, in the ethics, I mean, the ethics is not, does not stand alone, of course. There is the political also instances that need, that is uh, treated in other, uh, in other treat, uh, treatise. Uh, but I think that already in the ethics, the uh, cognitive part is besides the action. It's not something that does not have to do with power, with, with, with virtue, with activity, it is blessedness, uh, virtue, and this is experiencing our power once we have understand us as a finite modus, so to speak. So I would maybe not uh, differentiate between that. The emphasis I put on philosophy was to uh, discuss the methodological issue, but you are perfectly right that the, um, the question is a question that motivates Spinoza to call the book ethics and not science of logic or something different, but we, we may discuss also the science of logic. Thanks, thanks uh, Paul. Um, I'm aware I am forcing the organization, but I would like to give uh, a, a little short question to Giacomo and perhaps Pina. But uh, really 10 seconds and 10 seconds uh, and two seconds for Julia. <laughs> So, uh, thank you. Ah, sorry. Thank you for your impressive um, talk. I have a really short remark question. So, uh, you say that um, Spinoza activity and cognition are the same. Mm -hmm. mm? So, that means that uh, definition at the beginning are generative. They have a generative activity. Mm? So, uh, the problem uh, is uh, that in Spinoza, there isn't a reflexive thought. Homo cogitat, point. Uh, there isn't the necessity to recognize the form of this activity. 
So the proximity uh, with Hegel is at the same time, in my opinion, a big distance. Mm -hmm. um, so this is only okay. my remark, um, if you agree or not, I mean. Yeah, sorry. So take Natu yeah. And so uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful uh, uh, <laughs> talk. You mentioned uh, um, the expression acquiescentia in se ipso, no? Right. But Spinoza uses uh, the term acquiescentia in two different uh, expressions. Acquiescentia in se ipso indicates uh, the second kind of knowledge, mm -hmm. and acquiescentia mentis right. also. Uh, is the consequence of the third kind of knowledge. Um, I think that uh, uh, this uh, is a very important mm -hmm. difference, uh, and right. I, I think uh, it right. is uh, it, go, uh, it goes it in your uh, direction. Uh, I think no? right. Okay. So um, yes, it's seven only seconds. seven seconds. Second, seven so seconds. thanks for the uh, uh, thanks for the the notation. I think that the uh, English translation of Carly translates uh, self-esteem and satisfaction of the mind. So thanks for the uh, for the uh, no notion and for the uh, distinction between th second kind of satisfaction. satisfaction. Acquiescence, right. Right. And the English translator goes back to Descartes in a way. Thanks. Giacomo. Uh, Giacomo, um, I do not think it stands on the uh, question of generation because it is too complex in two seconds. But uh, about the reflexive instance, it, it's of course something uh, totally different from Hegel. But I do not think that in, in Spinoza it's absent, totally absent. For um, the mind that um, is active, and it, it's active because it uh, acknowledges, it, it cognizes, uh, and I do not understand how would this be possible without be aware of this, and I think that the whole process of ethics is goes in another direction, but sorry. Thank you. So our next talk is by Anna Beria. Uh, she's a PhD candidate at the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy in uh, Kingston University in London. Uh, her PhD project is on modality of the absolute Spinoza, Hegel, Marx, and ecofeminism. And today she will talk about uh, the logic of expression in Deleuze and Spinoza and uh, notions of life and nature in Hegel's science of logic. Please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, and thanks to the organizers for organizing this conference. Um, yes, yeah, so in this talk, I will mainly concentrate on Stephen Holgate's uh, essay, 2005 essay, uh, Why Hegel's Concept is Not the Essence of thing, uh, Things, in the collection of essays, Hegel's Theory of the Subject, as well as his another essay, um, Hegel um, from Logic to Nature, also from 2005. Um, and with this, I will concentrate on the one hand on this particular reading of Hegel's logic of the concept in the science of logic, and especially section three there, um, uh, the logic of the idea. And on the other hand, I will try to draw parallels with this reading of Hegel and Deleuze's reading of Spinoza as a philosopher of expression, concentrating there on the logic of the third kind of knowledge, which also, like Hegel's last part of the doctrine of the concept, starts out with the idea, the idea of God. So my question, which in the long run is, uh, in, in my project is in general, the question of the absolute as well, as we heard some discussions about it yesterday. Uh, but my question uh, is, what I'm looking at is not the absolute in the essence or a substance in Hegel, but the absolute moment uh, in each of, in, in Hegel's philosophical corpus as also, and also in Spinoza's philosophical corpus in general. And for this reason, the, the question for this talk will be, can we read the logic of the concept, and especially its last part, the idea, which starts out with life as its immediate determination and ends with nature revealing itself as the absolute idea and absolute method. So can we then read this together with Spinoza's concept of the idea, 
uh, of God and the third kind of knowing or knowledge. And to address this question, I will first, as I said, uh, summarize um, Professor Holgate's reading of Hegel uh, in that essay, at least, not yesterday maybe, and then I will turn to Deleuze's interpretation of Spinoza. Um, thank you. My broader attempt here is to follow the great tradition starting from Machari to read Spinoza and Hegel as complementary and compatible systems of thought and look for singular points of intersection between these two philosophies. Uh, but uh, I am concentrating specifically on the final moments, the absolute moments. So uh, the third kind of knowledge or the idea of God nature in Spinoza with its correspondent idea of blessedness and intellectual active love of God nature, or God or nature, as na or as nature, and the absolute idea, absolute knowing in Hegel in its relation to the notions of life and nature there, also with its correspondent idea of free love and boundless blessedness. So I will start with um, Holgate's essay, and I will quote, according to uh, Professor Holgate again, um, I quote, many of Hegel's subsequent critiques, Marx, for example, asserted that for Hegel, the idea is an independent subject, the uh, demiurgus of the real world, and that the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. I continue, this essentialist and foundationalist interpretation of Hegel is deeply misleading. Hegel's concept is not the underlying or indwelling ground, cause or substance of the world, nor is it a force within the world or the condition of the world's possibility, whether than condi that condition be thought of as transcendental, existential, or logical. The concept for Hegel is not anything to which being points back. It is simply self-determining being itself, being that determines itself logically to be nothing less than nature and spirit. For Holgate then, and I, I am following this reading, the concept proves itself to be at one in its otherness in the process of the idea freely releasing itself, and release is an important word here, into the nature as nature, and so determining the concept at the same time as existing reality. This is then the process which in the end reveals itself to be the imminent process to nature or unfolds itself as nature. And unfolding will, would, will be an, uh, another important word or concept for Deleuze Spinoza. Um, this logic of, um, sorry, so being as concept, determining itself to be nature or proving to be nothing less than nature itself. And this logic of immanence is what on the one hand unites Spinoza and Hegel according to Holgate, but on the other hand it is also the key to their main difference for him. I quote, like Spinoza, Hegel is unquestionably a philosopher of immanence rather than transcendence. Unlike Spinoza, however, Hegel understands the world to be embodied reason itself rather than the effect of an immanent substantial cause. Hegel's thought could thus be said to be Spinozan metaphysics freed from the dominance of essence, end of quote. So this is then the limit to which I will be following Hol Holgate's essay because in this essay, this. Uh, Holgate, for Holgate, this logic of the concept is precisely what distinguishes Hegel from Spinoza. In other words, Holgate here more or less follows Hegel's own reading of Spinoza as a philosopher of essence, substance, as, as if Spinoza's substance, or God, or nature, uh, or read God, or nature, um, was this underlying ground or cause of the world, and not the process identical with its own expression, or with the unfolding of its own differences, which we will see is how Deleuze reads Spinoza. And I quote again from, the Hol from Holgate's essay, this in my view is the principal difference between Hegel and Spinoza. For Spinoza, being is ultimately substance that is immanent in, but also logically prior to its modes. It is the immanent cause of its modes. Essence, even as substance, is not simply the unfolding of its differences, but stands in relation to them. That relation is one of logical priority and dominance. Essence governs and is the power over what it posits. For Hegel, I continue quotation, for Hegel, by contrast, being is ultimately concept that is wholly identical with its unfolding differences. Those differences belong to and constitute the concept itself. The concept is thus not their logically prior ground or cause, it is simply the process of differentiating itself into those differences. And I find this, I mean, amazing because it's usually the opposite, for example, in the French Spinoza's reception of uh, Hegel, uh, that. Spinoza is read in the way that um, Holgate reads Hegel here, and you know Hegel is read in the way that um, Holgate reads Spinoza here, uh, and that, that that that's what like kind of uh, initiated this um, paper, I think, in me. Uh, 
So uh, Holgate describes the transition from the logic of essence to the logic of the concept in the science of logic as the transition from the relational reflexive causal ontology to the logic of self-expression and free self-determination. The transition, though, does not mean the linear temporal transition. It's not as if we are first in the logic of essence and then in the logic of the concept. Instead, the logic of essence, relational reflexive causality, proves itself or unfolds itself to always already have been the logic of the concept. Um, in other words, what is characteristic for the concept is then the logic of expression, but one in which the express, the expressor, and the expressing are one and the same. Or can we say that? That is like my question. Um, and although Holgate follows Hegel in reading Spinoza as the opposite of this logic, I will try to show that for Deleuze Spinoza, uh, Spinoza is the philosopher who maintains the same understanding of the logic of expression. And here I, I turn to Deleuze. Uh, and Spinoza. Uh, so for Deleuze, Spinoza's concept of nature as God or substance is precisely the process of its own immanent expression production, the horizontal unfolding of its own, its own singularities with no hierarchical priority or dominance between being or thought or, or logic, being or being or logic or ontology or logic. So I um, quote from, um, I think from Deleuze's uh, expressionism in Spinoza, substance is, so to speak, the absolute ontological identity of all qualities, absolutely infinite power, the power of existing in all forms and of thinking all forms. Therefore, it's not that God as subjectivity is brought down to substance as essence, as traditional historical reception of Spinoza holds, but God and substance are, are united in or as nature, which holds together both subjectivity and objectivity, as well as the physical and conceptual. Because of this horizontality, according to Deleuze, logic, or I quote, explanation does not signify an operation of the intellect external to the thing, but is always a self-explication, a development, an unfolding, a dynamism. Nature is the common order of explications and implications, end of quote. Following from this, nature's expression is not merely ontological, but also epistemological. Nature expresses itself just as much through ideas. So knowledge, another quotation from uh, uh, Deleuze, so knowledge becomes a sort of expression. The knowledge of things bears the same relation to the knowledge of God as the things themselves to God, so that ideas as a whole exactly reproduce the order of nature as a whole. Uh, end of quote. It is then the same absolute power of existence and thought, the essence of nature, and its same logic that is expressed both in the attribute of thought and in extension. And the transition from the second kind of knowledge to the third kind of knowledge is precisely, uh, according to this reading, the transition which leads to the comprehension of this expressive logic of nature rather than the causal reflexive logic of what it, uh, of, um, which is the second kind of knowledge in Spinoza, and I will um, define this, this kind of knowledge in, in a second. Uh, but first, I, I want to ask, isn't this then precisely how the absolute idea as the absolute method revealing or releasing itself as nature is defined in Hegel according to Holgate as well? Um, so before addressing this question, let's look a bit closer at the transitions between kinds of knowledges in Spinoza. So Spinoza differentiates between, and we've talked about this um, again and again here at this conference, between first kind of knowledge, so I will just be very brief, brief about it. So first kind of knowledge, which is imaginative affective knowledge, second kind of knowledge, adequate knowledge of cause and effect, so second kind of knowledge, and third kind of knowledge, intuitive knowledge or intellectual love of God as nature. What leads from the second kind of knowledge, causal relational knowledge, which could always search for another adequate cause in the manner of bad infinity uh, and go on towards quantitative infinity, um, just as the causal relational logic of essence in Hegel could go on uh, and on. So what leads from this causal knowledge to the third kind of knowledge, which is qualitatively different from it, um, or which I argue is qualitatively infinite in Spinoza, is the idea of God or nature as the common notion, or the notion of the common that expresses itself in all existing beings or thoughts. And I want to note here about my, my question um, that uh, during the other talk about the qualitative infinity, that. Uh, um, uh, the argument about existence of quantitative infinity in Spinoza, I think, depends or, uh, on how we understand attributes and what they express. And according to this reading, uh, what is the same and is expressed in all the attributes is the essence of substance, uh, which is the causal chain of the order of, of the causal chain of the order and connections. And how we understand that causal chain 
whether we understand it as infinite or finite, is precisely dependent on kind of knowledge. And um, infinity um, is precisely not quantitative, but qualitative from the third kind of knowledge then. Um, so the idea of God or nature then, according to Deleuze, expresses what is common to all existing modes as existing, including ideas that they uh, all are the expressions of one and the same God-nature substance. And with this, the idea of God or nature uh, gives internal essential determination of existence, including existence of thought or logic, as the expression of nature, rather than looking for one more external cause for singular existence ad infinitum, which would be fair infinity, and uh, which would determine it from the outside. So the external causality becomes internal self-expression here. What is more, Deleuze asserts that for Spinoza, the third kind of knowledge does not occur progressively, progressively, but is found as eternally given, found as what has always already been there as expression. And this too is similar to how Holgate describes the transition to the logic of the concept and the idea, not as linear temporal transition. Um, the transition, transition to the third kind of knowledge, similarly then, is not a transition, but the revealing or unfolding of what was always already there. Here we find ourselves aligned with the idea of God or nature, where there is no distinction between us as active and God or nature as active. And we grasp, therefore, the necessity of God, nature, uh, substance as our own necessity, external necessity as, as internal necessity, and therefore as freedom. And uh, from this follows that this is a self-knowledge united with nature where the distinction between the subject of knowledge and the object of knowledge disappears. So um, because through the third kind of knowledge we grasp the idea of nature as the infinite common cause of all which transgresses the linear cause and effect type of well, again, bad infinity logic in Hegel, and through this understanding leads to the love of what is common in all. The idea of nature is then freely expressing itself here in all singular existence. And Deleuze describes this as the process when life, I quote, life, that is expressivity, is carried into the absolute. But isn't life carried into the absolute precisely what is the task of the section three of the doctrine of the concept, the idea, which goes through the idea, idea of cognition, and then the absolute idea. Can we then again read Hegel's logic of the idea in relation to this Deleuze interpretation of Spinoza? For Hegel, the logic of the concept determining itself as idea does precisely start out as life and end up in the absolute idea to be determined as nature. And I will try to look closely at this process now. So life, according to uh, Hegel in Science of Logic, is immediacy of the idea without its concept or the concept which externalizes itself as life. But it is precisely to recognize the concept in this immediacy, to go through the idea of cognition, that leads life to the absolute idea, which turns out to always already have been nature. It is then precisely the concepts or ideas self-recognition in life that reveals life to be the absolute idea as nature and at one with its own expressivity. Life is then idea of nature, but at its externality to itself, to the idea, before cognizing itself as self-expression. Because of this, life is I quote, uh, the concepts from Hegel, right? Yes. Um, the concept state of unfreedom, it's being sunk, in, sunk into externality. While the absolute idea, I end of quote, while the absolute idea is what merges life and cognition together and with this reveals itself as nature or releases itself as nature. Uh, and I would... Um, prefer the term release here. With this, the idea passes over into nature and the identity of the concept or logic and reality nature is found as its own truth. Or the concept finds truth in nature, identity of itself and reality, in the absolute idea. So the immediate idea, life, with its self-reflection, the idea of cognition, concept's comprehension of itself, turns into the absolute idea by recognizing itself in life, recognizing the idea in life. And with this, transforming into the infinite, I quote, uh, infinite idea in which cognizing and doing are equalized and which is the absolute knowledge of itself as nature. Uh, this is when the idea discloses itself or unfolds itself as nature, according to Holgate's own essay, uh, another essay from 2005, From Logic to Nature. Uh, but isn't it this the same process as we saw in the case of the third kind of knowledge in Deleuze's understanding of Spinoza? Um, so. Uh, the last part of uh, my uh, comparison is, well, then this uh, is why, uh, as nature becomes the process of its own free self-expression in Hegel, uh, the absolute idea determines itself to be the absolute method, 
right? So the absolute method is the knowing of this infinite idea in which cognizing and doing are equalized. And that is why it is the absolute knowledge of itself as nature, or the knowing for which the concept is not only a subject matter, but it is a, as its own subjective act. So here, uh, thought becomes not a reflection of externality, but its own self-generation in the process of self-expression, with its logic being not separate, autonomous, or prior to nature, but being itself nature. And I maintain that this is precisely what thought, the attribute of thought, shows itself to be in the third kind of knowledge, or the intuitive knowledge, or the intellectual love in Spinoza. Uh, where, in Spinoza, one's power of action including thinking, is just the power of nature itself insofar as it is explicated through one's essence, as nature is explicated through one's essence, singular essence. If then, for Hegel, this is what determines the absolute method, that it is not some absolute to be known externally, but the process of absolute knowing itself, and here I follow Angelica Nuzzo in her argument that Hegel replaces the metaphysical absolute with a theory of absolute cognition. So, uh, if this is how we understand absolute method uh, as absolute knowing in Hegel, I would argue that the absolute method as the process of absolute cognition can, in this respect, be compared to the third kind of knowing as the end of the method, as understood in Spinoza's corpus as well, or at least in Deleuze's uh, interpretation of it, not the knowledge of some external thing anymore, and for that reason, which can, uh, that which cannot be learned from uh, others also, while one is remaining passive, uh, not having a separate object of knowledge, but itself being the singular knowledge of our own singular power of, uh, of, of a comprehension of our understanding. So for that reason, according to Deleuze, Spinoza's method, which is understood as the path simultaneously to freedom and truth, or for the internal as well as external freedom, is precisely this going towards the end of philosophy as the knowledge separated from its object and revealing what was all there all along in life. And I quote from Deleuze, there is then a philosophy of life in Spinoza. It consists precisely in denouncing all that separates us from life, towards where there is no longer any difference between the concept and life, or where concept has cognized itself in life as nature, in Hegel, I would argue. Do I have time, or? Five minutes? Wow. Uh, well, then I will continue, okay. so. I maintain that, um, so, so what I need to do further is, of course, to look at the concepts of life and nature, not in this last part of science of logic, but in other, for example, in the Encyc Encyclopedia and the Philosophy of Nature in Hegel. And uh, this is what, I, what I'm trying, and to kind of put it together, um, the differences between the concept of life and nature in Hegel in phenomenology, in science of logic, and in philosophy of nature. Uh, but what I maintain is that the nature in the encyclopedia of philosophy of nature, at least, I is not the same nature as this, the nature in science in the end, in the last part of the science of logic, which I uh, read together with a third kind of knowledge in Spinoza here, because nature there is an external, externalized nature already, or nature as nature which exhibits no freedom in its existence, but only necessity and contingency. Um, and that is, yeah, that is uh, the idea which is not the free idea free, freely releasing itself as nature, uh, which is the nature, I, uh, the concept of nature in the end of logic as the absolute idea. Uh, but just as in Spinoza, third kind of knowledge always coexists with the first kind of knowledge and second kind of knowledge because, uh, uh, and, and because of this uh, epistemic contingency as well, always remains for, uh, for us in life, so for, for the finite modes, a part of nature, since while the body exists, duration and eternity themselves coexist in Spinoza, similarly, I, I, I would say that for Hegel, the absolute idea of nature is coexistent with the external determinant nature, and nature is just as much the real realm of contingency as of rational self-development. And so, just as the intellectual knowledge of God considers uh, his nature as it is in itself, a nature man cannot imitate by any particular way of life and cannot take as a model, a mo model for instituting the true way of life. Mm, also in Hegel, it is not in ordinary life that we come to grasp the absolute idea as nature, but in philosophy, uh, when we think of nature as, na as nature in itself and not as determinant life. And that would be something similar to the third kind of knowledge in Spinoza. So, Yes, another, uh, and another 
point, uh, as a self-criticism of myself, uh, I think, so one point is to, to expand on the difference between the concept of life and nature in Hegel, but another one is to look at the formulations of revelation and expression, both in Hegel and Spinoza. Uh, and obviously, at first look, it seems like revelation has only negative connotations in Spinoza, while in Hegel, the idea reveals itself to be the nature. So how do we read this together? Um, but I think that the distinction that Spinoza makes in theological political treatise uh, between the, the, that's what I'm, I'm looking at for this, uh, and uh, I'm interested in what maybe if there will be in discussion, we can talk about it, that uh, in theological political treatise, for example, Spinoza differentiates between the revelation of the prophets who understand, understand God's laws as commands and God, God anthropomorphically as a lawgiver, uh, in case of Adam, for example, and the universal understanding of truth that, for example, Christ represents for Spinoza, who understands these revelations, the same revelations, not as revelations accommodated to and dependent on their subject, or who, on, on, the, on the person who is understanding them, but as the universal natural necessities and the expressions of truth. So can we say that uh, this is the same distinction as the distinction between the first kind of knowledge, revelations as understood through imagination, and the third kind of knowledge, the same, thing, this, the same laws, the same, the same uh, life, um, understood through, uh, as universal expression common to all. So this issue needs to be examined further in Spinoza, and on the other hand, the relations between revealing and release and unfolding and disclosing of the idea in Hegel needs to be also examined further uh, in order to see whether parallels can be maintained between this and the expressive logic in Spinoza. Thank you. Well, thank you for your talk. So do we have some questions for Anna? Thank you for your, is it working? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So thank you for your really interesting talk. Now, my question concerns the notion frei and lassen, free release you were talking about. So it seems that in your reading, free release is the idea that unfolds, idea unfolding itself in nature, idea in the form of otherness, in short, idea that follows the logic of Äußerlichkeit, expression and recognition. But um, as far as I understand it, Freie Entlassung seems to imply a different kind of logic that follows no such pattern of expression, uh, but rather points to Ohnmacht der Natur. Uh, so nature is intelligible in Hegel, yes, of course, but at the same time, it reveals inability to discern any conceptual structures, at least not um, visibly. So nature is a problem, concludes Hegel, mm -hmm. and it seems it poses problem for the concept too, namely in the sense he said it, nature sets limits to all philosophy, clearly in the encyclopedia, um, in the sense that um, it somehow, yes, poses a problem to the concept to cognize itself as an absolute ground that includes also difference in it. Now, how is this to be under, uh, uh, how is this to be understood is of course remains open, but I just want you to, if yeah. this, to make maybe a bit more comment on this expression and free release thing, thank you. Mm, thank you so much. Um, yes, um, I just, I, um, like at first, the first reaction is I, I, I don't know what else to say uh, than to just repeat <laughs> this last point that uh, I think that nat the concept of nature in encyclopedia and in the end of science of logic are different in the sense. And nature, um, well, what, how nature is understood by the absolute idea is not the nature that is the problem in the other parts, uh, in the other, like, in the other, writings or even in, in another sense. So nature, what, I, what you said, of course, is, is that nature um, is a problem because it almost like doesn't have the subject who discerns these, uh, the, it's, it's absolute logic almost in itself. But what I'm thinking, wh how I want to approach it is that it is precisely the absolute method or the absolute idea only, which, uh, for which then nature is not in that sense problematic anymore because 
for, because because their nature is the free free or like this absolute idea itself is the free free release as nature, and so they kind of merge in that moment, um, and that's why I would I that's why I'm trying to look at it uh, from the logic of expression, which would not make sense in for other concept for other like the, for other parts of where Hegel mentions nature. Mm. No, please, yeah, please. So then Äußerlichkeit and Feinfassung are the same thing, but why is then he repeating himself? I mean, uh, they are not... Äußerlichkeit can be understood also in the sense you've just described, basically. Mm. I think that they're not... The, 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 they depends on what, where, where, uh, where. Uh, can I say, I don't know if I'm, but yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we have three more questions at this point. Uh, I'll put out the microphone. Yeah, yeah, relax, relax. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, just before I should say, I mean, most of us have the luxury of giving papers on people who are dead. Um, <laughs> you're, you're very brave to do this, so <laughs> relax, it was fine. Um, uh, in fact, more than fine, I, I thought actually that, if I'm allowed to say so, I, I, that, that the... Um, Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. Well, do I, I don't have to repeat everything, do I? Yeah. No. no, okay, I just wanted to say, um, uh, I, I, I'm impressed by this idea of a parallel between uh, Deleuze's Spinoza and my Hegel, with particular regard to one idea, uh, uh, self-expression, uh, which I think you highlighted. Um, but I think this focusing all that on that also allows us to see where subtle differences also remain, and I just wanted to get your thoughts about those. Um, uh, Yitzhak, uh, who unfortunately had to leave, uh, criticizes Ed Curley for understanding the modes as simply the effects of, of, you know, that's all they are apparently for Curley. Well, that's clearly not true. They are also expressions of substance. Deleuze is right about that, I think. Um, but nonetheless, the modes are... Um, self-expressions that substance causes itself to have. And so there's still a sense, it seems to me, even with Deleuze's Spinoza, that those expressions, those modal expressions, point back to the imminent substance which causes them. Now, you associated self-expression in my Hegel with a different idea, with self-determination. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's right. I think Hegel understands uh, and this particularly when we carry on to nature, nature is on the one hand, the Aussersich also also sein, the idea as Aussersich sein. So it's not expression in the sense of force and expression, let's not get caught up into that. But there is a sense in which it is uh, the idea that's externalized itself. And yet, the idea determines itself through nature. So we have, if you like, to put it very crudely, a sort of forward momentum in Hegel's philosophy of nature mm. through different um, forms mm. of determination and one of the important effects of that is that for Hegel, there's no university of being. There's no university of being because what emerges in the course of nature are different forms of nature. The, the idea, if you like, determines itself, expresses itself in different ways. Mechanical matter is not physical matter, is not chemical matter, is not life. And the one is not reducible to the other. But for Hegel, uh, sorry, for Spinoza, because self-expression is at the same time the self-causing of substance, all modes point back to effectively the same kind of causation. So there is a university of being, and, and Deleuze celebrates that in Spinoza. And I just wonder if you could comment on that difference. Yeah. So even though, yes, I think you're, really, you're right to see these parallels, and, and, and it's a pity Deleuze was so blind that he couldn't read Hegel properly to see what you've seen, but there are still these little differences, and I wonder if you could comment on those if that's not too Thank much. you so much. Thank you so much, and um, it's, it's an honor really to have you here the, and base my paper on your work, of course, and in general. But yeah, it, very good, uh, of course, like a very good question, and um, I do need to write more about the differences as well, but of course, like, 
I, 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 want, uh, I don't want to say that there are no differences, definitely. But still, um, on, on your first question, I think that um, the, um, about the modes and substance and the, and the fact that in Spinoza, you know, modes point back to substance, sorry, right, yeah, in Spinoza, modes po point back to substance, um, and in Hegel, or like, it's, it's, it, that's why it's different. Uh, I, I don't think that that's not how I read Spinoza. Because why? Because if modes do actually point back to substance, that would mean that there is a substance somewhere wh to which modes could point back. <laughs> yes, yes, but exactly. So substance, is Im substance only exists through modes. So I think that that's why there is no substance that is separate from modes. Uh, that the modes point back to, but it's only the self-expression of substance is itself the, the existence of modes. So that's why I, I would, I, I, I'm reading this differently. Um, then you lose causality. Sorry, why, why, um, why do I lose causality? I think, again, causality is the second kind of knowledge, right? Or like causality is like the, cha the, the causal uh, the relational chain um, is how the relationship between of expression between substance and modes can be understood, but it's not understood through as a causal relationship from the third kind of knowledge, um, and that's what I that, that that that's why I think that the third kind of knowledge goes beyond the causality of substance, like goes goes beyond it and goes more, it, yeah, like causality is not the same as expression. Uh, causal, lo causal logic is not the same as expressive logic. And on the second, okay, so, but maybe we should talk about this more, uh, definitely. But on the second um, uh, question about the university of being, wait, I completely, like, I had, like, two points that I want to respond to. First is, you mentioned there is forward development of, uh, in, in Hegel of, like, uh, which is not so much there in, in Spinoza, and I agree, and I think that that, that, that would be, like, a one, main and very important difference, uh, which a lot of people have written about as well, that there is this teleo still like this teleological um, or like progressive development in Hegel, which is not there in, in Spinoza, and that is a dip a, a, an, 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 an important difference that I would definitely uh, look into. But on the other hand, about the university of being um, in Spinoza, in Spinoza, um, yes, I think that in Hegel as well, in this like absolute idea, where the idea releases itself as nature freely and determines itself as self, and self, self expresses itself in nature. Of course, like in the logic, in, in the science of logic, we have the differences between like physics, the, you know, the, all this like, for example, uh, chemism uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that they would be understood as, or like, I, I think that the absolute idea's free release kind of unites, not, not doesn't, uniting is not the right word, but like, grasps them all in itself. Um, and I think that's exactly like, of course, they, they, that's, that's where being is univocal, but not as just being. Again, just as in Spinoza, it's not just being, right? It's, or, or being, but understood also as thought and extension at the same time. So not just being a, as different from logic. Um, and so, yeah, that, that would, that's what I would try to maintain, but maybe I won't be able to. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Beria, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. I would uh, also like to do uh, some suggestions. Um, first, I think uh, at the end in your reaction to Stephen, you said, uh, yeah, in a way, the absolute idea grasps all these other determinations of mechanics and so on. But in your talk, you continuously focused on the idea that the absolute idea is only method. Now, I think uh, this, is, this should be maybe formulated <coughs> a bit more complex because now you seem to suggest that there is a method in contrast or in relationship to content. Whereas here the whole idea is, of course, that we have a unity of method and content. And, mm. uh, and then at the end, Hegel, so to say, focuses again on the form and tries to distinguish these moments of beginning and so on. Well, you know that. Yeah. So, uh, but this points out to, I think, uh, my, my main suggestion is that you uh, maybe more strongly try to focus on the method of development. Because if you do that, I think you could also get a bit clearer the relationship between the idea, uh, the absolute idea, and then in particular the transition uh, to, uh, to nature mm -hmm. 
and why at the end of the development of nature, again we are at life, mm -hmm. but now at life that cognizes itself, like life in the logic at the end transcends in the idea of cognition, mm -hmm. and so to say you get this whole unity. And then uh, it's also much easier to, uh, to introduce. So maybe I don't agree with this idea that you have that uh, the concept of nature at the end of the big and small logic that differ. Mm -hmm. I think the argument for the transition into nature is much more clear in the encyclopedia. Yeah. But, but, but that doesn't mean that the concept uh, is a different one. But, yeah, but okay, okay, so, but, but then you could uh, also um, stronger emphasize what it means uh, that nature is, as, as Stephen just also pointed out, the absolute idea in the element of its otherness. Yes. So we, that is nature. Uh, yes. So, 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 in, yep. so, so you, can, uh, you can have that and then, um, uh, with regard also to Spinoza, I think it's important, then, if you focus in this way on the matter, then it would be very important how Hegel so to say, now starts interpreting the empirical nature in terms of this general concept of nature that he has. So therefore, you should, so to say, mm. develop an idea what the relationship is between empirical cognition and philosophical one. And then, and then I think you can do that all in terms of the method, and then you get the big picture, and I think a much more a solid picture for a comparison with Spinoza, because then I think the differences will become much mm -hmm, bigger. Mm -hmm. Thank you, oh, so much. Long, long, no, 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 thank you so much. It's a, thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I think that I agree, of course, that on the one hand, I, I also agree that nature is not a different concept, obviously, but I think that um, the, the concept of nature is, well, differently used, can I say, in the beginning of Encyclopedia, for example, and different has a different uh, meaning of uh, of using also for absolute method. I, I will turn to that in the end uh, in the absolute idea uh, because absolute idea in its otherness is nature, of course, but not the nature. Not the it is not the nature which is the free release of the absolute idea in the moment. So it's it, th th there is this difference that I think that there is like if 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 the absolute idea is if we follow Hegel to the end, towards the absolute idea, I think that there is the, the concept of nature can be grasped, which is not the same as, as, as something that which is external and in its otherness. And as for the, abs uh, the, the, the method, I think that what is so interesting for me, in, both in Hegel and in Spinoza, is that this, this understanding of method, which is not a method uh, external, not, not as an external method anymore. It's like, again, like I, I mentioned this Angelica Nuzzo in her argument that method here in Hegel is nothing other than absolute knowing itself rather than a knowledge, which means that it is the process. So it's not, it's not anymore a method which we can use, for example, an empirical or philosophical method which we can use in order to do something, but it is the process of knowing itself which becomes the method so different kind of knowing would be a different method then. And that's, um, yes. Um, but thank you so much for, I, I don't know if I answer, of course, like it was a comment, so it was very interesting, thank you. One last question. One last question. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for the talk. I'm very interested in, uh, in the topic. Uh, and uh, yeah, my, my first question was a little bit the same. Uh, this difficulty I have to understand uh, in what sense nature at the end of logic is something other as nature in the philosophy of nature, but uh, you, you, you told something about. And uh, I wanted to, to, to um, highlight two points that has to do with the uh, structure of the idea mm -hmm. and with the free release mm -hmm. of the idea. In, in, so uh, we used in the discussion uh, two different expressions in order to uh, explain this free release. Mm -hmm. And the first one was self-expression, and the second one by Stephen was self-determination, I would say uh, self-knowing of the idea, yeah. as a, is a movement of, of self-knowing mm -hmm. of the idea. But I think that these three determination, and uh, first of all, self-expression and self-determination, self-knowing are a little bit different. Uh, they, they, 
um, they produce, uh, so to say, different consequences. And, and so uh, this was my first point. And the second point has to do with free release. Um, and there is there a, a difficulty, and Boyana uh, think about it, I think, um, because Hegel uh, speaks about a decision of the idea. Mm. And a decision, as a, the, the, the uses of, of the word, what? Yeah, and the uses of the word entschließen, entschluss, um, is a sort of, uh, um, is a moment of difference, so to say. There is a, a cut in the entschluss. It is not an unfolding that uh, um, comes uh, uh, so uh, linear from the absolute idea to the nature, but there is a sort of of cut, and in this sense, I think that what Boyana uh, uh, said, uh, there is a different logic in this movement that is no more the logic that we found uh, in the unfolding of the uh, determination of thought uh, into the, mm -hmm. the science of logic. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to write this down so that I can respond to you then. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, great points. And um, on, the first, on the first question, I think that I think I will disappoint you in my answer because I will try to put the what you really well differentiated. I will try to read them together still. Yes. <laughs> so I think that the first point about the differences between self-expression, self-determination, and self-knowing, but also at the same time that the all three of them are in the process, are, are there in the process of this free, re free release, is, I think, exactly what's so amazing about it. Because I think that the fact that this free release also includes both, all three of them, but they're not exactly the same, I agree. But I think wh how I would, I would try to read it is that they're not exactly the same because they kind of point to uh, the if I would have, w would have to say it in Spinozian language, two different attributes maybe. Because what I mean is that, for example, self-knowing, self-determination, and the self-expression, and to kind of unite all of them in this free release means, means precisely that it's not just kind of blind self-expression without self-knowing. It's not just self-knowing without active self-expression. And it's not ju just either one of them without active, again, almost like a decisive self-determination. Which means that, you know, there is all three of them, like a Self-determination has some kind of connotation with decision, I think. Self-knowing, the fact that it can be conceptually grasped, and self-expression, the fact that it is like the being. So that's, what I, that's how I would, I would relate these concepts to each other. And I think that's kind of in, in rela related to the decision point. I think, uh, well, you know, for my reading to work, how I would try to understand decision is that it's not necessarily a decision well, not a decision as, as classically understood in, in relation to like necessarily a separate will of the idea, and then which is then separate from nature, but as, as um, pointing to the fact that this free self-release and self-expression is not exactly it's not blind. It's in a way conscious. It's 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 in a way uh, including thought or including reflexivity. It's self-reflexive also, and that's why it's kind of it's not automatic. Uh, self-release, which would then not, yeah. that's why I think that this decision kind of points to that, that it's not just an automatic something without subject there, right? But the subject, um, in, in the sense, would be just the same as the fact that it is intelligible, or the fact that, you know, it would be the same for me as something in, uh, like the attribute of thought in Spinoza, which means that, you know, the fact that this, this self-expression and self-determination and self-knowing um, is the same in thought as in extension, which means that it is it is intelligible. It is not automatic. It is not just just um, yeah. So that's why I think that it is um, yeah. Also, that's why that because I understand this decision as like reflexivity or thought. That's why the nature into which it unfolds is not just nature separate from thought or separate from idea, right? It is nature which is logical, right? It's not just just ontology and then uh, the logic is separate from it, right? So that's why how I, I don't know. Uh, thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Yeah. Okay.
Thank you. Welcome back to the second part of the second day of the conference. So thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to announce our next speaker, Yitzhak Melamed from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, his work is situated at the intersection of early modern philosophy, German idealism, and medieval philosophy. He's the author of Spinoza's Metaphysics, uh, Metaphysics Substance and Thought, and Spinoza's Labyrinths. Today, he's going to talk about the actual infinity in Spinoza and Hegel. So, in the spirit of yesterday's debate about the real Spinoza and the real Hegel, here is the real Yitzhak Melamed. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers, specifically uh, Zdravko and uh, um, Zoan. And, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I see many familiar faces and many friends, well, some familiar faces and friends, from all, some new friends. Okay, so uh, Spinoza and Hegel on actual infinity. Uh, let me say a few words. Um, I, the presentation that I'll give today is still a work in progress. Uh, I haven't finished working on that. I was hoping to present something which is more developed. Uh, the past Two weeks. I mean, I was uh, we, basically I was not not so much able to work mo mostly on that. So, but still, I think we'll have plenty of time and, and at least to begin the discussion and see uh, what we can do with it. So, um, um, so let's see a little bit. Let's uh, the plan. The plan. I'm, it's just uh, three sections. One. The first section will just provide some background on the notion of uh, the Aristotelian rejection of actual infinity and um, the attack on, Arisot on the Aristotelian rejection by uh, Hizdai Kweskas. Um, then the second section, uh, we'll do a very quick tour of Spinoza's discussion of infinity. Uh, it will be extremely quick, I mean, because it's, it's not a trivial topic, extremely interesting, also extremely difficult. And then we'll have a similarly quick tour of Hegel's reading of Spinoza, also extremely interesting, also not trivial at all. So let's see what we can get from uh, this kind of uh, packed uh, program. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, as we all know, I mean, that the term aperon for the Greeks was not considered to be a positive term. I mean, it's, some, it's something which has negative connotations. I mean, for, for the Greeks, I mean, to be something which is um, Aperon would be something that is, is bad, doesn't have manners, doesn't have form, or something like that. When you look at Aristotle, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speak about the Pythagoreans, I mean, they have their own view, um, similar views about the Aperon, but when you look at Aristotle's discussion of uh, the Aperon, I mean, you see that he is systematically, he is rejecting the notion of actual infinity, and, and there is a good body of literature today uh, trying to understand why was it. Now, of course, the main reason why we have this body of literature is because since uh, Cantor, all of modern mathematics is based on the notion of actual infinity. So suddenly, you know, uh, until 1850, I would say, everyone, or almost everyone, were sure that actual infinity is just craziness, schwermerei, nonsense, whatever. By, with the work of Cantor, it turned out that you cannot do mathematics without Schwermerei. The very great Schwermerei of actual infinity that was not allowed and was banned, etc., is the very center of modern mathematics. You want to do set theory, you must acknowledge, I don't want to say mass. I mean, yes, you have intuitionist, uh, you have uh, affinitist, but basically, uh, the mainstream of modern mathematics is working with the notion of actual infinity. Now, what you have today is, of course, you have scholars that are in a very typical way for analytic historians of philosophy saying, how Aristotle could have been so stupid to not to, to allow for actual infinity? Okay, fine. I mean, uh, again, I'm not 
my way of doing history of philosophy, but if you look at uh, uh, some of the discussion, they are really apologetic. This being said, I think it's definitely clear that Aristotle rejects uh, actual infinity. There are some attempts to give a little bit more of, of a nuance of that view, so I'll, I'll just do a very quick survey of that. Um, so, um, um, so, for example, in discussion of causal explanations, you have the phrase before you from the Metaphysica uh, Alpha 2, it is impossible for one thing to come from another as a matter without limit, uh, or, ex for example, flesh from earth, earth from air, air from fire, and so on without limit, similarly for the sake of which, meaning teleological explanations, cannot go without limit, for example, walking for the sake of health, this for the sake of happiness, etc. just going on infinity. The, the claim of Aristotle is there must be an end point or be and a beginning point. You cannot have an infinite process. I mean, now, the question is what's wrong with infinite regression? Um, similarly, he makes a similar point also about x being the essence of y. You cannot, you, you cannot run that as an infinite uh, series. Um, and along the similar lines, you have a claims that uh, infinite series of movers is impossible. So here are the claims in the physics. Um, and, of and of course, you have the claim that the universe must be limited. Aristotle have a strong belief that the universe is finite. Uh, and that in, in, as a result of that, from the claim that the infinite must be limited, uh, Aristotle derives that infinite body, infinite place, and infinite quant quantity are impossible. Uh, the best account I've seen so far of uh, Aristotle's views of, on infinity is by, I don't know best, but what seemed to me more interesting is by David Bostock, currently from Oxford. Uh, and here's his summary briefly. Aristotle assumes, without evident warrant, that an infinity, infinite totality could not exist only as a result, that an infinite totality could exist only as a result of an infinite process being completed, and he understandably believes that an infinite process cannot ever be completed. Okay, so he thinks that basically the, the problem, so for both of the main problem, the unwarranted assumption of, of Aristotle is this assumption that infinite totality could exist or only as a result of an infinite process being completed. Okay. Um, sorry. Now I'm jumping immediately for uh, about, uh, what, 1,700 years. Um, what happens in the meantime is, well, Aristotelianism becomes the dogma of, um, uh, of medieval philosophy. Uh, in addition, you have, some big, you have a, big, a switch in the perception of the notion of infinity. So while infinity for the Greeks, usually aperon is considered to be a pejorative there, suddenly you have figures, uh, Philo is one of them, John Philoponus is another, where infinity is, taken, is actually taken to be positive, sometimes even ascribed to God. Um, I'm not sure that Crescas is the first to educate, to, to, I, I, I would be surprised if he is, but Crescas is at least one of the most important figures in uh, providing arguments against the Aristotelian ban on the actual infinity. Now, uh, just a brief point about Crescas, he was a bold and original anti-Aristotelian philosopher. Uh, his target, he's a kind of a more conservative, traditional, attacking Maimonides, but because of his originality, he's developing views which are extremely bold and in many ways are similar to some of the views of Spinoza. Uh, we won't have much time to speak about, uh, about that, but uh, he's, I think he's a better philosopher than Maimonides. Maimonides, at the end of the day, he has, he has courage, he has political courage, but he's a good Aristotelian. And Crescas is basically just attacking, he decided, okay, instead of attacking Maimonides, Maimonides has a rabbi. The name of my mother, the rabbi of my mom, this is Aristotle, and so he's launching a systematic attack on Aristotelian metaphysics. Um, at the center of this attack on Aristotelian metaphysics is the, is the Aristotelian rejection of actual infinity. So he's time and again coming to the notion of actual infinity and saying, I think that your argument is wrong. I mean, you reject actual infinity, show me the argument. I don't see where's the problem. So, 
here's, uh, and his major philosophical work of Christ is his light of the Lord. He, he criticizes the context of the discussion of the, uh, of the passage uh, that we are going to read is, he's criticizing uh, one of the arguments, oh, I'm sorry, one of the premises that uh, Maimonides presents for the, his proof of the existence of God. So Maimonides begins the second part of the God of the Periplex uh, with a list of 25, not less, premises that you need in order to prove God's existence, right? Uh, one of them is just the impossibility of actual infinity, and um, uh, what Crescas is doing is just saying, oh, sorry, not sure about that. Uh, there is a whole interesting story there because he's, Crescas is reading Maimonides through uh, Muhammad al-Tabrizi, a Persian philosopher writing a fantastic commentary on, on uh, these 20, 25, 26 uh, premises of uh, the beginning of part two of the Guide of the Perplex, but we will put that aside for, for now. So specifically, uh, you can see Crescas addressing an argument which he ascribes to Averroes, but originally it's, it's an, an argument by Aristotle, and our argument is very simple. He's saying, uh, for our part, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the, the, the counter-argument of, of Crescas, but you'll see immediately what's the view of uh, Averroes. For our part, we will say this with regard to Averroes' argument, while indeed the division of number into old and even is true and unavoidable, still infinite number and not being limited is not to be described by either evenness or oddness. So the claim the of Averroes and Aristotle is, oh, tell me, how is uh, infinite number odd or even, right? All numbers must be odd and even. Can you give me any reason why it should be odd rather than even or something like that? If you cannot give a reason, then it, it's not really a number. Um, and um, and the response is basically saying, yes, every, um, every num it's not that every number must be odd and even, it's only every limited number. And at that point, uh, Crescas is basically being open to the notion of infinite number, a, a notion that actually Spinoza will never agree to. It's interesting, I mean, if you look at, again, we don't have much time for that, but if you look at, um, uh, at Cantor's remarks, I mean, when Cantor is developing uh, his uh, uh, calculus of transfinite numbers, I mean, he is writing intensively on Spinoza on the letter of the infinite. Uh, and he likes many things about there, but he hates the fact that Spinoza is not willing to allow for an infinite number. Number cannot be infinite, uh, would claim uh, Cantor and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, would claim Spinoza. Uh, as it happens, I mean, it seems that Crescas is willing to entertain even the notion of an infinite number. Um, so let's see, what are the arguments of Crescas? Apart, I mean, in some places it simply uh, what is the argument of Crescas against the man on infinity and actual, on actual infinity? And I think that in some places just he, he's basically saying, you, you didn't provide an argument. You decide to ban actual infinity. Why? Tell us more. But Apart from that, there are some other arguments. So let's see a few of them. So here's one, here's one. If God knows numbers, since number can be added without end then, then his knowledge extends to an infinity of numbers. If he does not know all of them, there must be necessarily a bound which he does not know, right? But then the question remains, why it is, is it that he knows the numbers to that bound but does not know greater ones, right? So, and then he said, have you weariness and fatigue befallen his knowledge? Why, is it too complicated for him to calculate beyond uh, two million or something like that? No, that cannot be the case. So you cannot basically say that there is any limit on uh, God's ability to grasp numbers. In that case, then why cannot grasp also infinite number? Um, similarly, uh, he develops an argument um, with regard to the possibility of having infinite uh, effects. And the basic point of the argument, I'll, I'll summarize that, but I'll the basic point of the argument, he'll say, whatever arguments that you, there, he thinks that there is a problem for one cause, one of the same cause, if it is a simple cause, to have two distinct effects. Because if you accept the, something like the principle of sufficient reason, you cannot explain why the two effects are distinct from each other. But he's saying, if you are allowing for two effects to follow from one and the same cause, then you should also allow for an infinite. There is no problem. There is no genuine problem with the, with the issue of, of, uh, 
of uh, actual infinity of causes following from one and the same cause. Uh, and here he just presenting that, uh, I'll just read the summary of the argument. He's saying, would that I knew why, by the mere assumption of a common cause for the series of the whole, the number of causes and effects within the series could not be infinite. And he would later will say, no, I, sorry, I don't see the argument. Um, moreover, when it comes to the issues of, uh, of divine attributes, he is asserting explicitly that God has infinitely many attributes. So, uh, not of, I mean, no more fear of, uh, of infinity. Okay, so that was the background. I, I'll, I'll need to move faster, but let's see. Uh, so, the letter on the infinite is a text of Spinoza from 1633. Um, it begins with this kind of beautiful statement that here's what I've discovered about the infinite. Really, just saying, I, there is something that I discovered. Um, I think it's one of the most important and difficult texts of Spinoza. Uh, it's a text that Spinoza circulates even in his late period, which gives us an indication that he more or less agreed to what is stated there, even in his late period. Um, be before the very end of the text, Spinoza is saying, oh, I typically for Spinoza, I think that I've discussed everything that is related to the infinite, you know, very nice statement, just the only thing is that if you look carefully, you see that there is no distinct, the distinction between absolute infinity and infinity in its own kind, which is central to the ethics, is not present in the letter 12. So Spinoza, we know that. Spinoza is, is pretty confident, sometimes too confident. Um, at any rate, uh, the, the text is extremely important. Hegel reads the text, I mean, there is no question, because he cites it in something like six or seven works of his, time and again. So there is no question that Hegel knows this text very, very closely and intimately and reads it very carefully. We'll see that in half a minute. Uh, Leibniz made a copy of the letter, and in fact, we have two slightly different versions. One is the Optor Postuma version, the other one is the Leibniz copy of the text. Uh, I will only add that Leibniz was highly sympathetic to the defense of actual infinity by both Spinoza and Crescas. So when he has his notes on the letter, he sees that Spinoza and Crescas are actually advocating actual infinity, which is going against Aristotelianism. Now keep in mind that Leibniz in many ways was defending Aristotelianism. Unlike many of the other 17th century figures, he was tr still trying to, uh, to defend many elements of Aristotelianism, of scholasticism, not in the case of actual infinity, not in the case, I'm sorry, of the ban on actual infinity. With regard to the ban on actual infinity, he actually likes the idea. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'll begin with the almost end of the letter. So, here's the passage uh, which we have here. But in passing, so it's almost at the end of the letter, uh, of letter 12, the letter of the infinite by Spinoza, but in passing, I should like to note here that the more recent peripatetics have, as I think, misunderstood the demonstration by which the ancient tried to prove God's existence. For, as I find in a certain Jew called Rab Chasdai, I mean, uh, Chasdai, which is Chasdai Kreskas, it, turns, it runs as follows. If there is an infinite series of causes, then all the things that, uh, that, are, that are will also have been caused. But it does not pertain to anything which has been caused to exist necessarily by force of its own nature. Therefore, there is nothing in nature to whose essence it pertains to exist necessarily. But the latter is absurd, therefore the former is also. And here's the key point. Hence, the force of this argument does not lie in the impossibility of there being an infinite, actu in, in there being an actually infinite or an infinite regress of causes, but only in the supposition that things which do not exist necessarily by their own nature or did not determined to exist by thing which does not necessarily by, by its own nature. So the Aristotelian version, or, or what, uh, what uh, uh, Spinoza calls the, the new Aristotelians, uh, new peripatetic, is basically saying uh, there must be an, in, the, you cannot have an infinity of causes because uh, in that case you will have actual infinity and therefore there must be an end of the causal structure eventually ending in God in the first cause, right? That's one version with, with which we are all familiar. 
And Spinoza is saying, no, actually that's not the issue. The better argument is the argument that you have in the version of, of Crescas. And indeed, this is the version that you have in Crescas, where it's basically saying, listen, I don't care about whether there you, if you want to have an infinite regression of causes, go ahead, have an infinite regression of causes. And I'm fine with that. Still, if it is an infinite regression of causes, the question is whether any of the elements there is going to be necessary. If not, is going to, or more specifically, is going to have an essence involving existence. So that its existence uh, built in to, into its essence. If not, the entire series is just contingent. The entire series is, is, is having an essence which can or cannot be realized. And therefore, we do not really explain the fact that the entire series exists. Okay? So the claim by Crescas and by Spinoza is the, the argument is not about infinity, it's just about the fact that the, the, uh, the chain, whether finite or infinite, must include something which is having an essence involving existence. Infinity is just uh, orthogonal to the issue, just we, we, we throw it into the story and pointlessly. That's not the issue here at all, okay? Um, so let me, again, I'm, I'm trying to run through Spinoza on infinity very quickly. So the most important text of the ethics and of actually Spinoza's discussion of infinity, perhaps apart from this uh, uh, brief uh, discussion of, of in the end of the letter, uh, in, in the end of letter 12, is Spinoza's definition of God. And here you see already at the beginning uh, the, the basic notion of in, uh, infinity in its own kind and absolute infinity. So the, the famous definition of God, by God I understand them being absolutely infinite, then it is spelled out as a second stage, a substance consisting of an infinity of attributes of which each one expresses an eternal and infinite essence. And then you have the third stage of explication, which is the explicatio itself. I say absolutely infinite, not infinite in its own kind, for if something is only infinite in its own kind, we can deny infinite attributes from it. So the, the, uh, the deny here is the negare that, uh, uh, that Anton was speaking about yesterday. What precisely is this deny, uh, deny mean is, is a good question. Um, and, but if something is absolutely infinite, however expresses essence involves non-negation, pertains to its essence. Okay. So you have, again, this distinction between absolute infinity and infinity in its own kind is not present in letter 12. And I would stress also that um, it's, we, we can show very easily that the, each of the attributes is in fact infinity in its own kind. There are texts where Spinoza is saying that almost explicitly. So the absolute infinity is the infinity of God. The infinity in its own kind is just infinity of the attributes. I'm skipping so much stuff, it's the definition of finitude and stuff of that So the white Spinoza did not have a definition of infinity. I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions about it, but I, I, I simply have to run through a lot of material. Now, we go back to letter 12. Uh, if we have it, um, any doubts about whether Spinoza accepts or, or really rejects the, the notion of actual infinity, so we saw a minute ago, we saw a passage from the end of letter 12. Here's one another, another passage, and, and you can read it with me. Neither number, nor measure, nor time, since there are only aids of imaginatia, imagina auxilia imaginationis can be infinite. For otherwise, number would not be number, measure, no measure, measure, no time, time. Hence, it is clear why many who confuse these three th uh, with the things themselves, because they were ignorant of the true nature of things, denied an actual infinite an actual infinite. What you see from here is that Spinoza simply is, is very open. I don't. I accept actual infinity coming out of the closet. It's interesting that he does not discuss the notion of actual infinity after letter 12. It's only these two places. Still, for all we can say, for all I can say, I think uh, Spinoza is happy to live with the actual infinity. He's just affirming that. And I would say following Spinoza, Leibniz as well. Um, now, one other characteristic of, or feature of infinity in Spinoza is the claim, and I think it's super central for Spinoza, is that infinity is part of the finite, finite both in nature and in knowledge. Now, the, prior, the, the, the ontological 
in priority of the infinite to the finite is a very traditional view by medieval philosophy. There's no question about that. The priority in knowledge is more, is more complicated because some philosophers would say, yes, uh, the infinite is prior in knowledge, but there is also an order of discovery. And the order of discovery, you must begin with finite things, and then only you go up, 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 and then eventually you go to the infinite and then go down, or something like that. That's not what Spinoza is doing. I think Spinoza is absolutely committed to saying, if you are going to build the infinite from the finite, you will, or if you are going to, if following um, a Diotima, remember the symposium, the, the, the speech of Diotima, where she speaks about the reconstruction of the, of the pure beauty, the idea of beauty that is, so I think Spinoza would say, if you begin your notion of beauty from the beauty of Kalias, and you are trying to abstract and clean it and clean it and clean it, you will end up with the pure beauty of Kalias. It will be thoroughly anthropomorphic even at the end because you, are not a, you, you do not understand, you, you began with the point of view that is human-centered and you will end up with that. What Spinoza suggests instead is just saying, forget all of that, just throw it around. And, and Hegel is right in saying that it's a shot out of the pistol. That's right. Begin from the infinite. Just throw everything and you begin with absolute infinity. And I think that again, Hegel, to my mind, sees that. I suspect that he's somewhat tempted by that, but then just goes the other way around, or in some way goes the other way around. I think he understands the point of Spinoza here very well. Um, okay, um, so there are a couple of uh, important distinctions that you have um, in, um, um, uh, in, uh, in the letter 12. So there are, I'll, I'll read it very quickly. Uh, for everything, it is clear that some things are infinite by their nature and cannot in any way be conceived to be finite. Other are infinite by the force of the cause in which they inhere. So usually, I think we take this distinction to be the, the def definition, the distinction between the infinity of substance and the infinity of modes. Um, then there is a distinction between things that can be conceived abstractly, can be divided into parts and regarded as infinite, and others finally are called infinite or indefinite because they cannot be equated with any number. Um, one of the questions about this passage is whether this, there are three distinctions here. Uh, I, I skipped the third one because I will, we will need it in half a minute. Um, whether these distinctions are cutting along the same lines. I tend to think that they are, but it's an open debate. I think. Uh, well, actually, I'm saying open debate because uh, I'm not sure. It, very few people try to work on that. So anyway, I'll, um, and the question is, are these three distinctions equivalent or not? In addition, I, again, one more feature where you have in the short read is Spinoza is saying the infinite cannot be composed or constructed from finite parts. Um, I'll take one more. Uh, since uh, it's super interesting, especially uh, in the context of Hegel's reading of Spinoza, so if you wish, that's the, the closest that you have to, uh, to the determinatio negatio as formula in the ethics, and that's the first column to proposition eight. So here Spinoza is saying, since being infinite is really in part a negation, I'm sorry, being finite is really in part a negation, and being infinite is an absolute affirmation of the existence of some nature, it follows from Proposition 7 alone that every substance must be infinite. Okay, so that's uh, what precisely he means by that. It's a super interesting question. I mean, we can dis uh, discuss that. Let me add one more point before I, I, I jump to Hegel. So, for Spinoza, infinity is quali uh, quantitative. I mean, I'm not sure that, uh, for example, that's the case uh, when you see, uh, when you look at Descartes' discussion of infinity. Um, why I think that for Spinoza, infinity is clearly quantitative? Well, because he speaks about two attributes and more than two attributes, and he's saying that, he speaks about sometimes about the other, the other attributes apart from the two attributes, but the text which is really in some way more striking is, uh, appears in letter 56. In that text, Spinoza is saying, is answering the question, do you know all of all God's attributes? And Spinoza's answer is, no, I don't know. In fact, and here's the words, I do not know the majority of God's attributes, right? 
So I don't know the majority means it's quantitative. It's absolutely, there are at least five. I'm joking, but I'm saying there are, I mean, I know two, there must be at least five. I mean, of course, I think he means infinite, meaning infinite, okay? Uh, now we get to Hegel. So, um, I have 10 more minutes, right? I mean, I, yes, okay, good. So in Hegel, you have this claim that, uh, and um, or this crucial distinction between the, the good and bad infinity. And Hegel thinks that the distinction is roughly the same as the distinction he finds in Spinoza between uh, potential and actual infinity. Roughly the claim would be that actual infinity is good infinity, bad infinity, oh, I'm sorry, uh, let, let me uh, see that, that actual infinity is, uh, is good infinity. We'll see that in the text. So let God is. So here's the uh, the text from Hegel in the in the lectures on the history of philosophy. God is absolutely infinite being. The infinite is the affirmation of itself. The infinite of thought is distinct from the infinite of the imagination. We'll see in half a minute uh, the source. Actually, we can already see that it's the third distinction which I skipped a minute ago, where Spinoza is making the distinction. Finally, they have no dis those whom he, Spinoza criticized, I have not distinguished between the infinite which, which we can only understand but not imagine, and there is an infinite which we can also imagine, right? Uh, the infinity of the intellect, the, the inf there is an infinity which we can only understand, there is another infinity which we can both understand and imagine. Uh, what uh, Hegel is doing is saying, no, it's slightly make, I mean, so you have the infinity of the understanding, the infinity of the, uh, of the imagination, and Hegel says the latter, the infinity of the imagination is the bad infinite, namely the infinity of space and time, or the infinite series of mathematics of numbers, yet this is the infinite we usually have in which we, sp th this is the infinite we usually have in view when we speak of infinity. Philosophical infinity is the affirmation of itself, as you can understand, uh, the philosophical infinity for, for Hegel would be just causa sui. We'll see that in half a second. Now, uh, is that correct as a reading of Spinoza? No, it's not. I mean, um, the notion of the, the, the view that for Spinoza, the infinity of the imagination is what Hegel calls bad infinity, that's not the case. I mean, Hegel is trying to still to avoid the, the Hegel is basically still working within the Aristotelian rejection of, of, uh, of actual infinity. And he's trying to provide some interpretation of Spinoza that will allow him to embrace Spinoza's claim while still adhering in broad, um, in, in, in broad ways to the Aristotelian ban on actual infinity. Spinoza is not there. Spinoza is out of the closet. I mean, he thinks that actual infinity precisely what Hegel would say, the infinity of space and time, the bad infinite, Spinoza has no problem with that. I mean, he thinks that extension is infinite in, in space. Um, I think that he has no problem with infinity in time, and he also no, has no problem with actual infinity of causes. Uh, he will not have an infinite number. That's another story, but it's related to his view of numbers. Okay. Let's go back to Hegel in, in the lectures. So he say the genuine infinite consists in the cause, the genuine, the good infinity, right? The good infinity uh, consists in the cause producing itself, the cause of sui. As soon as the cause has over against, against it another, the effect, the infinitude is present. In the case of the genuine infinite, however, this other than, th than thought, thought to limit is at once sublated and the infinite is itself again. So you have here something, again, there is a kind of element of charity, if you wish, in, in, um, in Hegel's attitude towards Spinoza in saying the real infinite, the genuine infinite, the good infinite is the infinity of causa sui, but Spinoza really didn't understand why. The reason why it is so is because you have here another that is on the one hand, uh, uh, in, on the one hand distinct, but also on the other hand sublated with the original thing. So causa sui is there is a difference and identity at the same time, and that's precisely, this kind of sublation is precisely what Hegel likes so much. 
So the, you'll have here the negation of negation. It's precisely in the places where Hegel rightly sees that Spinoza does not accept the negation of negation. I mean, he thinks that Spinoza has this wonderful understanding of uh, this wonderful slogan of, uh, of uh, determinatio negatio est, just he doesn't understand what it means. He, Hegel wishes Spinoza to have this sublation, this negation of negation, but again, Spinoza is not there. I'll, I'll, I'm putting aside for the time, for a minute, just the issue of, of uh, dialectic. Um, we can uh, return to that in half a second. Um, and here's again just some explication of the why causa sui is uh, this good infinity. A cause produces an effect that is something other than the cause, right? So you have the other. A cause of itself is a cause that produces an effect, but in the case, in this case, the distinction is sublated. For a cause of itself produces only itself. Uh, this is a fundamental concept of all speculations return into itself within the other. So he finds precisely the, the, the beautiful Hegelian dialectic just unspelled out in the causa sui. Spinoza is not, it is as if, Spinoza, you know, Spinoza by mistake, if you wish, like a, a genius, uh, an aesthetic genius who does not understand what is happening in his mind, he makes a claim, he, the claim is right, it just, and, and Hegel is just trying to help him spell out what it really means or something like that. Um, okay, let's go on next. Uh, it, in, in later, uh, Hegel, again, in the lectures on the history of philosophy, quotes the full definition uh, of, uh, uh, of definition of God, absolute infinity. We have seen ju it just a few minutes ago. And then he Hegel asks, does substance why might hear us possess an infinite number of attributes? But with spin so yeah, that's the defin what the definition is saying. Still, Hegel is saying, but with Spinoza, there are only two attributes, thought and extension, with which he invests God. Infinite is not to be taken here in the sense of the indeterminate many, but positively as a circle that is perfectly infinite in itself. So um, in that sense, I mean, Hegel has the um, questionable uh, honor of being in the same company with Jonathan Bennett, because these are the two interpreters of Spinoza who argue that when Spinoza is saying infinitely many attributes, he means just something like two, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it's the um, and um, I, I think that Hegel is much more philosophical than Bennett. I mean, because in the case of Bennett, all he can say is just uh, infinite means all. And that infinite is, if infinite is all, then um, two is fine. The problem is that all can also be zero. I mean, so that's no. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll put it aside. But what you see here is, I think, is this view that saying, don't take infinity is really numerical in the strong sense. It is more kind of philosophical infinity. This kind of circle, causa sui. That's, I mean, there are just really two attributes. Uh, here, again, I beg to defer, but Hegel is simply wrong. I mean, it's not only the passages where we have Sp uh, Spinoza speaking about the majority of the attributes, even in the ethics, in part two, in Proposition 7 of Scolium, Spinoza is speaking about the attribute of extension, the attribute of thought, and all the other attributes. This phrase, all the other attributes, appears two times in the Scolium. So it, it simply doesn't work. I mean, it's a wrong reading. I mean, that's... Um, Okay, uh, almost last, but so, um, okay, you know what, I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a beautiful passage, but it's basically just making the same point. I mean, in, in the lectures on logic, it's roughly the same point. I mean, the, up, the genuine for Hegel, the, real in, the good infinity is the infinity of causa sui. Um, that's the infinity of the intellect. The infinity of the imagination is the infinity of what we would call uh, actual infinity, he thinks that, that that's what Spinoza understands by infinity of the imagination. Again, that's wrong. Uh, it's wrong. On the other hand, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful reading. It's a charitable reading. I mean, you know, I have mixed feelings about charitable readings, but at least here you have some interesting stuff. Let me go to the conclusion. So uh, Michael Inwood at some point writes about this issue. He's saying, Hegel attempts to restore on a higher plane the self-enclosed world of Aristotle. 
in contrast to the open-ended world of the Enlightenment and the Newtonian science. And that the context is the discussion of infinity, and I think that he's broadly right that Hegel is much closer in that sense to Aristotelians. Uh, it's also, it's not only Hegel, it's also Kant, by the way. Uh, so the, the attempt, the, the revolution of creating, of, I'm sorry, of vindicating actual infinity failed till the mid 19th century. So if you had um, Spinoza and Leibniz advocating actual infinity by the 17th century, uh, they, 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 they didn't succeed. It's only by the 19, mid 19th century where um, you have a figure like Kant is saying, for a while he's saying, how can, uh, am, am I going to deny actual infinity? Eventually saying, I have to go there. Um, then you have the, the vindication of actual infinity. I, I'll skip the discussion of the Enlightenment because I don't think that the Enlightenment actually embraced actual infinity. Um, okay, so Spinoza's dis distinction between actual versus potential infinity, as well as the distinction between the intellect versus the imagination concep conception of infinity, are not the same as Hegel's distinction between good versus bad infinity. For Hegel, the infinite, uh, the finite and the infinite stand in a kind of dialectical relation. This is not the case, by the way, for Spinoza. The infinite should never depend on the, on the finite. So, we, uh, see, when we have a discussion of, of this issue just yesterday night. Um, one last point um, I would make. Hegel both reads himself into Spinoza, but also corrects Spinoza. And it's interesting, how, why both? I mean, because in some way you'll say, you can do it either way, but you see that in various texts he is trying to do both of them. And I, I think that perhaps in some way, I, at least the way I understand it is psychologically, I think that he's attracted to Spinoza. There is so much that interests him, but he's trying different strategies of how to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you, Yitzhak. Let's open the discussion. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. This was an amazing talk. Um, and I just have a quick question. Um, I, I think I, well, uh, I will look into this, obviously, but I don't, agree on this kind of like this thing of whether Hegel read it uh, wrong, the um, reading of bad infinity as the infinity of imagination in Spinoza, as I stand now, so I have to look into this. But I was wondering if, um, if you could maybe talk a little more about attributes and how you understand attributes in Spinoza, because I think that, what, I think that when you um, talk about, well, your, your very, very important point is that for, for Spinoza, uh, infinity is quantitative because infinity of attributes is understood as attributes of like um, uh, quantitative attributes, right? But like, I can we maintain that infinity of attributes is the only understanding of infinity in Spinoza? Or can, what I mean is that isn't, isn't, wouldn't it be true that infinity of attributes is not necessarily the same infinity as infinity of substance? And I think that for this, for, for this, we, we need to think about how we understand, um, or like we need to, well obviously like attributes are like very problematic in Spinoza, right? And like the real nominal understanding of attributes and et cetera, or w whether attributes are objectively, or whether substance can be uh, understood as objectively, or nature or God can be understood as objectively the sum of attributes, or is it like something related to our intellect and then or imagination, right? So my, my question would be just like, can you talk about uh, attributes and the understanding of how it relates to substance um, and whether there can be two infinities in Spinoza in this, kind, in this sense related to attributes? Thank you, yeah. sorry. So uh, a few quick one points. Uh, first of all, there are many infinities in Spinoza. I'm not sure I know, understand all of them. Uh, there are definitely the absolute infinity of God, there is the infinity of the attributes of each attribute. There is, there is an infinite number of attributes then there is a whole, there is the infinity of, m some modes are infinite, but I think it's a different kind of infinity. And then there you have the taxonomy of the kind of infinity that, oh, I'm sorry. Then, the, then you have the taxonomy of the kind of infinity in letter 12. So there is a whole richness there. What are the attributes? Long story, but um, I, I can show you, uh, you know, I, 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 
uh, I am on the market, I'm selling there some, uh, some merchandise. So yes, I think that attributes are kinds of existence, briefly. It's the basic kinds of existence. Uh, I think that God, for Spinoza, God's essence is nothing but existence, and the attributes are just the basic, the adequate understandings of the basic kinds of existence, existence as thinking, existence as extended, etc. That's, I mean, I have a, I'd be happy to refer you to articles. Um, finally, I, I can, I'll, if, if it's going to relax you in terms of the worries about Hegel being wrong, Spinoza is also wrong about many things. So just, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I remember just giving, uh, my, a student of mine was defending a dissertation um, that partly t treated Hegel, and again, both I and my student are, we love Hegel. I like him very, very much. Uh, this being said, this being said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, oh, so I remember that, it, and, and one of the members of the defense committee was a professor from the Humanities Center at Johns Hopkins, which is Center for Continental Philosophy. And this student of mine, very impressive guy, at some point said, Hegel misread Spinoza. And I remember that the faculty said, Hegel does not misread Spinoza. He, and he said, but he did. He said, no, Hegel does not misread. He has his own interpretation. OK, uh, again, uh, I, Spinoza is making errors. I can give you a list. Do you want me to give a list of 25 errors within two minutes? I give, I'll give you. Uh, Hegel is also sometimes making errors. This being said, I think that there are, it's interesting to see what precisely is, doing, is, is going on there. And actually, I think in the case of, of the in this case, I think it's errors, a lot of times it's errors of ideology, and they're super interesting just because of that. Okay, we have five minutes and five questions. Uh, Gregor? Oh, Simon. Oh, Simon. Simon, Steven. Uh, thank you, a very, very quick one. Um, j just to comment on what you were just saying, I think even if you uh, say Spinoza is sometimes wrong, the, the game goes on. Who, who is right in being wrong and who is wrong in being wrong and so on. So it doesn't really, I, I don't think one can get out of it actually. Um, my question is very simple and um, just a kind of a, do you agree with this? Um, you started with Cantor very interestingly and then you ended also with, with the mention of Cantor and then uh, um, the Spinoza part, um, your main thesis was on the um, on, the, on, the, on the quantitative character of infinity in Spinoza. And it seems to me, would you, and I wonder if you agree, that in Cantor, you would have the same consequence. So there's not only one infinity, there's multiple infinities, and also there's infinities of different sizes. So there's clearly a kind of yeah. a quantitative, quantitative element to it. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll tell you, uh, just, uh, first of all, if you look at Cantor's notebooks, while he's de developing, I mean, he's writing comments on letter 12, on the letter on the infinite. By the way, that's something I, w I wanted to mention to uh, Stephen. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention to Stephen. Okay. Um, so, by the way, he's, uh, he's, he's not only le le writing comments on letter, on letter 12 of Spinoza, he's also discussing Hegel. Just to make the point. I mean, so, yes, absolutely. And... Um, uh, he's, he, he's disappointed from the fact that Spinoza, Cantor is disappointed from the fact that Spinoza rejects the notion of, of an infinite number. But other than that, I think that he, that's in some way takes him as, as his main uh, philosophical inspiration. Yeah, okay, uh, two more questions. Uh -huh, yeah. um, thank you, this was wonderful, thank uh, you. a lot to take in a finite amount on of time. So I'll just uh, shoot at, I think, the most important thing that you make, uh, the, the most important claim that you make in the conclusion that sp for Spinoza, the infinite should never depend on the finite. And I was just wondering how strongly do you uh, defend that conclusion? Because of course, obviously, this is what Spinoza explicitly <laughs> says. <laughs> I mean, on, on in some level, of course, there's. If you read ethics, for instance, there's of course like millions and millions of um, 
ways to, to confirm this. But I think we've also already in this conference established that maybe a way of reading um, Spinoza is also uh, uh, reading w without any kind of uh, Übergang, without any kind of, um, well, in a way, transition from the infinite to the finite, which ultimately would lead me to think that perhaps, in a sense, the infinite also kind of depends on the finite. Yeah, I, I, I'm a Stalinist, Spinozist. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, th I take him at his words. I mean, and now this being said, given the fact that Spinoza is uh, a necessitarian, so that you can come, you can immediately come and say that everything depends on everything because nothing can be different from how ev ev everything else, right? Uh, I still, I, I think that for, for Spinoza, even within his necessitarianism, there are reasons and causes and by virtue of which that are going, going to do the work. So the, the terms of the dependence need not be to be spelled out in terms of uh, counter possibilities. If you agree with that, then yes, I think that uh, uh, Spinoza is absolutely committed to this Stalinist view. Uh, modes, uh, God depend, uh, I'm sorry, modes depend on God. God does not depend on the modes. And I think that this slogan that you have Hen Kai Pan, I mean, that, uh, uh, that you had in the Pantheismus Streit, that's precisely a misunderstanding. The idea that, that what you, especially it's in Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn has this view that all is one and one is all, etc. that's misreading. It goes one way, only one way. I'm really sorry, but this, this will be the last question. We need to stop here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Yitzhak. Sure. Our next presenter is Armin Schneider. Uh, he's a PhD, PhD candidate at Brown University. He studied in Berlin, New York, and Leipzig. And he works at the intersection of German classical philosophy, especially Hegel, uh, psychoanalysis, philosophy of mathematics, and set theory. He's going to talk about the problem of becoming in Hegel and Spinoza. Armin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for... Um, making it possible for me to come here. Can you hear me or is the feedback too bad? I just continue assuming that it's okay. But it seems to be kind of bad. It's okay? Okay. Yeah, I, I'll just continue. I have, no. Okay better like this? I hope so. I just produce noise so that the sound, okay, seems to be good. I have a written text. I will just read it um, um, and begin now. It, yeah, it, it is a common place to address Hegel's relation to Spinoza in terms of the formula determinatio est negatio, that is, as a problem of negativity. A common response of Spinozists is then to insist that, Spinoza's work, that in Spinoza's work this formula is in fact marginal and that it does not capture the true kernel of his philosophy. Instead of defending Hegel against this justified rejoinder that, is, that his approach amounts to a distortion of Spinoza's philosophy, I want to suggest the inverse, namely that the narrow focus on the formula of negativity alone also distorts the true kernel of Hegel's own take on Spinoza. Hegel has more to say than just determinatio est negatio. And the climax of his so-called refutation of Spinozism is impossible to be grasped as a problem of negativity alone. Hence, I propose to approach this constellation not as a problem of negativity, but as one of becoming. And um, to carry out this perspective, I assume uh, a distinction between an exoteric and an esoteric dimension of Hegel's text. Seen from this angle, one can observe that there is not only an exoteric and an esoteric presentation of Hegel's take on Spinoza, but furthermore that there is also an exoteric and an esoteric presentation of the problem of becoming. 
just as the full extension of the response to Spinozism is only visible in the ex in, sorry in the esoteric dimension, so the full extension of and complexity of the problem of becoming is only visible in the esoteric dimension of Hegel's text. And seen along the lines of this perspective, the challenge of Spinozism and the problem of becoming coincide. Furthermore, seen in full extension, the problem of becoming also turns out to include the problem of negativity. The latter is a sub-problem of the former, and one cannot speak of becoming without also speaking of negativity. And as is well known, it was Jacobi who introduced uh, Spinoza to the debates of post-Kantian philosophy, and it is also Jacobi who provided Hegel with the formula, determinatio is negatio. But it is again Jacobi who also uh, allows to trace back the problem of becoming to be one of Spinozism in the first place. Since for Jacobi it is no less than the spirit of Spinozism, which is encapsulated in the formula anihilo nihil fit, which speaking of theory, becoming, denies becoming. Nothing comes from nothing, or out of nothing there is no becoming. Hence, departing from the anihilo nihil fit instead of determinatio es negatio allows to approach the problem of Spinozism as one of becoming, but which includes one of negativity, as is indicated by nihilo nihil. Anihilo nihil fit, this formula, an ancient formula, as Jacobi writes, das uralte anihilo nihil fit, is attributed to Iliatic philosophy but it also captures a general disposition of ancient Greek philosophy. In its Iliatic signification, it speaks to the non-being of non-being, to the denial of non-being as opposed to the affirmation of being. Yet, furthermore, the formula also ex expresses a disposition within, which is common to Greek uh, philosophy in general. In Greek terms, it would be rendered as something like ek meon uden gignestai, and in the uh, spirit of Aristotle's physics, this meon amounts to unformed matter, which is by itself incapable of formation, or which requires a form to become something. Anihilo nihil fit. Against this <coughs> ancient formula, Christianity poses the becoming or creation from nothing. And from nothing, not as unformed matter, but as truly nothing. Anihilo, ni sorry, anihilo fit ens creatum. The personal God of Christianity introduces the figure of a power, a will, an act of creation, which sets an absolute beginning of the world, separating its being from the pure nothing out of which it is created. Anihilo nihil fit, anihilo ent fit ens creatum. These are the two extremes between Jacobi's yes and no to Spinoza is to be situate. Nevertheless, it is neither a return to the Greeks nor a restoration of Orthodox Christianity, which Jacobi is advocating for. Because with the ancient formula, Jacobi in fact captures modernity, the closed totality of thoroughgoing rationalism. Under its modern disposition, nihilo nihil fit is equivalent, with a grain of salt, to the principle of reason, nihil est sine ratione. Nothing is with, with, without reason. And conflating the order of reasons with the order of causes, the formula, formula anihilo nihil fit amounts to absolute determinism. There is nothing which cannot be uh, captured by the rational explanation of causal determination. On the other hand, Jacobi's objection to this absolute determinism is not grounded in relapse to traditional Christian faith. Much rather, in reverse, the objection seeks to ground faith in an immediate subjective evidence of acts of freedom, irreducible to rational explanation. In other words, Jacobi's yes and no to Spinozism concern different domains. While there is no possible objection to the closure of rational ex explanation, there is, for Jacobi, a necessary objection on the abyssal grounds of practice, or while Spinoza's determinism must be affirmed as philosophically unavoidable, it must be negated practically, which means, in Jacobi's terms, that there can be no refutation of, but only a contradiction to Spinozism. Yes, to its irrefutability, no to its practicability. Accordingly, there can be no rational path, no demonstration or refutation from the one to the other, from yes to no, from determinism to freedom, but only a jump, <coughs> a sprung salto mortale. <coughs> Sorry. 
Nevertheless, and in spite of its irrefutability, Jacobi points to the apparatic nature internal to Spinoza's philosophy, even though this does not suffice for a refutation proper. And this apparatic nature for Jacobi um, culminates in the figure of an eternal time, a totalization of time which as totality congeals into a temporal eternity. <coughs> Sorry. The aporia of eternal time does not, however, appear only as a remote indirect consequence, but in fact it is latent already in what Jacobi had determined to be the spirit of Spinozism in the first place. Anihilo nihil fit, for Jacobi this formula does not deny becoming as such, but only a becoming out of nothing. In other words, Jacobi does allow, sorry, in other words, Spinoza does allow to think becoming, but only a becoming which itself has not become. And these are precisely the terms which, from which Jacobi's own non-demonstrative presentation of Spinoza departs. Uh, it begins, one, or first, all becoming must be grounded in a being which has not become. And then two, just as being, so neither can becoming have come to be or begun. So this unbecome becoming is the prefigura prefiguration of the aporia of eternal time, which uh, Jacobi did, uh, diagnoses in a different and like kind of in the se seventh uh, edition to the letters, I think. It is therefore <coughs> no exaggeration to say that Jacobi's introduction of Spinozism to post Kantian philosophy is inseparable from posing it as a problem of becoming, since According to Jacobi, the spirit of Spinozism resides in the ancient anihilonil fit, but which amounts to an, the aporia of an unbecome becoming, of a becoming which is not becoming. Um, contrary to Jacobi's letters, Hegel's signs of logic in its progression from objective to subjective logic, um, claims to have accomplished the refutation, the so-called refutation of Spinozism. But this does not, as we know, have a merely negative meaning, just as Jacobi's contradiction was a yes and no. So Hegel's refutation, even though yielding more than only a contradiction, uh, is a yes and no. Yes, the standpoint of Spinozism is necessary, but no, it is not the highest standpoint. Thus, the path of Hegel's refutation is at once the path further towards the concept. And more uh, specifically, this refutation of Spinozism coincides with uh, the genesis or the becoming of the concept. In its full extension, uh, the genesis of the concept is constituted by no less than the objective logic altogether, uh, being and essence, doctrines of being and essence. However, that this is referred to as the genesis of the concept does not only retrospectively give a new name to the progression having led to the concept, but this name at once evokes the conceptual core of what it is the name of. The driving force or of the progression from being through essence to concept is not just becoming, but a becoming of becoming, a becoming which itself is becoming. More precisely, in its core, the becoming of the concept is driven by the transformation of becoming into positing, setzen, and the reproduction or restoration of being out of this redoubled becoming. This perspective is revealed when Hegel lets us look back once again before <coughs> turning ahead to the concept uh, itself. And this is the quote on the handout. Um, I don't know which number, but from the uh, logic. Hegel, um, it is here, I think it's the second Hegel quote. <coughs> uh, quote. It, is, it is here as the content of our treatise begins uh, to be the concept itself that we must look back once more at its genesis. Essence came to be out of being and the concept out of essence, therefore also from being. But this becoming has the meaning of a self-repulsion so that what has become is rather the unconditional and the originative. Now it's a crucial sentence for me, uh, for this context. In passing over into essence, being became a reflexive shine or a positiveness, and becoming or the passing over into another 
became a positing. Conversely, the positing or the reflection of essence sublated itself and restored itself to a non-posited and original being. End of quote. <coughs> Hegel calls the end point, the result of the genesis of the concept, an original being. And this formulation condenses a number of references and significations. Firstly, firstly, it refers the result of the progression back to its beginning, apparently, to being. But whereas it is only in being a result that being gains its originality, so that its being a beginning is rather a mere beginning and a non-originality. As immediate being is not the original being uh, which it is as the result. Secondly, as original, uh, as original in German, ursprünglich, the resulting being is German, ursprüngliche Sache, and Hegel uses this uh, uh, dimension of language in many occasions, or some occasions. The, uh, the as, as original, ursprünglich, the resulting being is ursprüngliche Sache, and that is Ursache, cause, and it is precisely the relation of causality which in reciprocal causation is revealed as, as Hegel says, causality itself as self-causation in the final result of essence. <coughs> and thirdly, as original ursprünglich, uh, this result echoes a jump, a sprung, but while for, uh, in ursprünglich, but while for Jacobi this was a jump away from yes to no, from irrefutability to contradiction. For Hegel, it is inversely the imminent progression of refutation, which uncovers an internal jump, so to speak, an internal jump of or the originality, ursprünglichkeit of self-causation through the movement of what Hegel calls uh, refutation. And <coughs> yeah, it resulting in original being, the genesis of the concept is in its core driven by nothing other than becoming, but by a becoming which is itself becoming, as we read in the quote. Uh, not only is there become, uh, a becoming of uh, the concept out of essence and of essence out of being, but also becoming itself becomes other. It becomes positing and as such is no, in fact is no longer becoming other, but returning or re reflection. In the quotation, this conversion is not only spoken about, but it is being spoken in the two verbs, becoming and restoring because restoring is uh, herstellen in German, which as stellen refers back to setzen or positing in the Latin uh, ponere. So being became uh, essence as becoming became positing, but positing has restored or reposited, hergestellt, wiederhergestellt uh, itself as original being. So as, um, as Genesis refers, the word Genesis refers to both becoming and Gegenstein and origin, the title Genesis of the concept captures the whole trajectory of becoming becoming throughout being an essence as it results in the repositing, wiederherstellen of original being. And I want to propose that this, uh, this, uh, this utmost condensation of the genesis of the concept which provides the key to approach Hegel's refutation of Spinozism as, it, as what it is, a response to the problem of becoming. And in the main text of the logic, it is the short section on reciprocity, Wechselwirkung, where the, progressive, uh, the progression um, of the objective logic culminates to hand itself over to the concept and here, the turning of reciprocal causation into self-causation is presented uh, precisely as the coincidence of becoming and positing. Reflexion um, setzen. What is thus revealed qua self-causation is uh, it, sorry. What is thus revealed qua self-causation in its self-positing becoming is nothing other than Spinoza's causa sui. But what? Uh, in the demonstrative order of the ethics is only presupposed as a definiendum of its first definition uh, is generated in the logic as the last result of the genesis of the concept. So he will, in some sense, just arrives where Spinoza starts uh, uh, his first definition in the objective logic. Thus, and thus positing its uh, initial presupposition um, and thus 
positing its initial presupposition is what allows Hegel to go beyond Spinozism and reveal substance as subjectivity. Um, and that this revelation <coughs> originates in the movement of redoubled becoming, as I tried to point out, um, is, however, um, immediately disguised uh, again in the first summary of the genesis of the concept, which Hegel provides in the opening paragraphs of the subjective logic. Because here the movement from substantiality through causality to reciprocity is presented without any recourse to becoming. Well, becoming is only the title for this, but on the level of the content, um, he doesn't spell it out, um, this transition, as a rejoining of positing and becoming. Um, and already with, uh, within the logic, we therefore observe two dimensions of Hegel's text, uh, serving either an esoteric or an exoteric uh, function. The esoteric dimension does not, however, point to an unwritten doctrine. On the contrary, it's fully, it is fully spelled out on the surface of the written text. Nevertheless, as soon as the text serves its summarizing, moderating, or, um, uh, or exoteric function, the depth of its esoteric dimension is reduced necessarily and simplified so that naturally one dimension cannot substitute uh, the other. Um, um, just a clarification with regard to the constellation I was talking about. The, so I, I, I take it that there are, so to speak, two um, uh, s summaries or recapitulation, recapitul recapitulations of the, of the um, genesis of the concept or the last bit of it. What the first one in the begin beginning or the first paragraph of the introduction uh, to the concept. And then once again, uh, in a very condensed uh, version, at the beginning of the uh, concept proper. Th this is the code I read. And the two uh, are dif do different things and point out different things. And in fact, for what I tried to do, for the perspective I tried to suggest, um, in some sense, the first recapitulation can, kind of uh, disguises or covers up that it's, I would say, all about becoming and becoming, becoming positing and the two rejoining. The, the, the first recapitulation kind of uh, covers this up and, and, and uh, confuses this uh, depth, um, and but paradoxically, uh, the second um, recapitulation kind of points to it directly by spe spelling out the whole trajectory of being in essence as as a becoming of becoming, so to speak. But in the second recapitulation, of course, we don't read anything about Spinoza, so uh, we have, in some sense, two different recapitulations which shed a different light on the previous passage from the logic of essence and. Um, um, produce a kind of a parallax, if, if you will, on perspective on this previous section. I think the microphone's going lower and lower, but it seems to be <laughs> stable. <laughs> Just do this. Yeah, it feels better. And of course, as you may have noticed, I used exoteric and esoteric in exact reverse uh, meaning than in Plato. For example, in Plato, the dialogues are the uh, exoteric text and the teaching, so to speak, um, the supposed uh, unwritten teaching is the esoteric dimension, and I want to propose that, in fact, it's the science of logic, which is the exoteric, uh, sorry, the science of logic, which is, um, broadly speaking, the esoteric text, the, the, the pure doctrine, so to speak, and the uh, lectures, encyclopedia, Jacobi review, are, in some sense, exoteric communications to an audience, uh, um, Yes, and so it's a re reversal in some sense of the terms, which is, I think, not just an arbitrary uh, choice of mine, but also says something is of the, their respective Plato's and Hegel's philosoph uh, philosophies, maybe. Uh, um, but that's uh, for discussion. Okay, the exoteric reduction, which is already latent within the logic, leads to more and more obfuscating rearrangements in other texts, which, relative to the logic, need to be considered as exoteric altogether, if, if we make this distinction in the way I proposed. The logic of the encyclopedia completely lacks <coughs> the presentation of reflection, <coughs> which in the greater logic introduces positing as the new mode of becoming within essence. Instead of, um, sorry, instead of accounting for the internal becoming of becoming itself into positing, being nothing and becoming are merely externally mapped onto identity difference and ground. 
And just as the opening of the doctrine of essence suppresses the movement of positing, so the opening of the concept, uh, so sorry, so the opening of the concept, doctrine of concept, lacks any presentation of its genesis. Instead, the 1827 edition covers up this lack by introducing an external topology of movement as transitioning, shining, and developing, übergehen, shining, and entwickeln, a topology which can barely compensate for the imminent genesis of the concept, and which furthermore imposes with developing <coughs> a figure of becoming onto the concept, in a narrow sense, uh, which has no entering, in fact, in the text of the 1816 edition of the Greater Logic. So in the Greater Logic, uh, there is no announcement as it is in there is, there is in the logic of essence now becoming is uh, developing. Uh, this is imposition of the encyclopedia logic, I would say, on the uh, great small logic. Given uh, so, and this typology mode of distinguishing becomings, so to speak, is is uh, a, a pedagogical device and nothing more. Given that. Uh, it is lacking the presentation of both the genesis of the concept and its essential content, the becoming of becoming. It is no surprise then that the presto staccato of the small logic does not have any aspirations of refuting Spinozism. But also, <coughs> sorry, also Hegel's review of Jacobi's writings from 1817, which contains an abbreviated version of Hegel's take on Spinoza in kind of a stile recitativo, um, free recombination of the elements and narrative, in a way, uh, cannot keep up with the esoteric depth of the greater logic. What is here patiently worked through as a problem of becoming is reduced in the Jacobi review to a problem of negation. Determinatio is negatio. Spinoza rightly supposed the finite determinations or modes to be negation, and he rightly supposed their being in substance as their being negated, but he was lacking insight in the true nature of this negation of negation and hence could not go beyond the affirmation of substance as called undifferentiated and undifferentiable unity or beyond substance in its fundamental determination of immediacy or being. Um, yes, um, I have another page which I might not be able to read. Um, so to conclude, I. Uh, just summarize and uh, what I've said so far by saying that, in a way, the um, the exoteric presentations uh, of Hegel produce uh, or give us a, a kind of photographic negative or an, an indirect trace, um, uh, and point uh, and through the, the absence of what constitutes uh, uh, or through the absence, I, I try to point out they they sh make it more. Uh, clearly visible, maybe, and sharpen the perspective on on what constitutes the actual backbone of the esoteric text, so the logic, so, which I tried to uh, spell out as a um, or point at as a question of becoming in its redoubled, uh, redoubling in the logic of essence as um, positing. The following um, uh, section, short section, try to sketch out um, uh, basically how how one could. Uh, how one has to, um, or how one could reconstruct uh, the um, trajectory towards the reciprocity from this angle, from the angle of um, uh, question of becoming, uh, through the uh, uh, becoming and positing. And um, um, in fact, one also, need one if one, sorry, if one uh, takes this perspective, it becomes also clear in what sense the question of negativity is uh, a subproblem of the problem of becoming, insofar as in my last sentence, insofar as, of course, as we know, the the um, um, mode of becoming in the logic of essence is nothing other than the uh, movement from nothing to nothing, self-relating negation, but which is not uh, presupposing any uh, affirmation of uh, pure being anymore, as in the uh, logic of being. Uh, so, as a result, the um, climax of uh, the refutation of Spinozism, so, so called, in reciprocity is both at once um, a coincidence of um, becoming and positing, which itself is driven or activated or working as a movement of negativity. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Yes, yes please.
Thank you. Am I on? Yes, okay. Um, I guess my f uh, two brief points. The first point is if you want to um, argue that, that Hegel does think that something comes from nothing, um, surely the place to look at will be the very beginning of the logic where you actually have nichts. <laughs> I mean, we've gone from sein to nichts, but then let's forget we've got reines nichts. And pure nothing, through its own purity, through its own purity and immediacy as nothing, goes back into being. And of course, that vanishing is already becoming. So I was slightly surprised why you didn't look at that. Maybe you could comment a little bit on that. And then, just very briefly, if I may, on the esoteric and esoteric, um, and particularly on that passage that, 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 that you quote here from Hegel, um, I just don't know why you concentrate on becoming when you look at that passage, when you could just as easily have concentrated on, on positing. And it seems that you're trying to slip in an esoteric reading that privileges becoming. This is gonna sound unfair, and I apologize for saying this, I don't mean it to, but it looks a little bit arbitrary in that you could equally select the process of positing, and of course there's a whole lot of other concepts that are operating. So I wonder why you think, uh, because, Although Hegel says here that becoming, um, you know, the passing over into another becoming became a positing. It didn't just become a posit It didn't just become a positing. Positing arises with positing reflection out of the movement that you've just described, and that's not just a becoming. There's something more going on there. So I guess why didn't you start at the beginning with nichts, and then? are you perhaps really overgeneralizing the significance of becoming at the expense of other possible concepts like reflexio and like positing later on? Yeah. I think uh, just, yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, maybe I wasn't clear enough. Um, I think it's a misunderstanding maybe. The, so first of all, the, uh, yes, I mean the, the first remark on not, um, uh, becoming, uh, this is the place where the formula ex nihilo nihil fit uh, is quoted uh, by, by Hegel. And uh, um, of, of course, I mean, it's obvious that there we have the, the most uh, simple form of the question, or he Hegel's kind of uh, rejoinder against, or against, or like, yeah, he stands on, uh, take on this formula a nihilo nihil fit. Why didn't I go there? Because I think, um, on the one hand, everyone knows that, <laughs> uh, in a way that, uh, becoming, uh, everyone I think here has read the beginning of the logic and we know that there's becoming uh, is a movement from being to nothing, nothing to being, so I kind of presupposed that. And I tried to point uh, more to the uh, section on reciprocity because I don't think that it's equally uh, commonplace or equally clear to people that, that actually uh, one could say that the problem of becoming culminates there in reciprocity, this is the, the, the final um, point. And so, and this, is pre that this that brings me to my second uh, response to your second question. The, the concept of becoming for me is similar as Verstand and Vernunft in uh, Kant. Uh, so, Vernunft, there's a narrow sense of Vernunft, and Vernunft is also the broader term including Verstand. So, we have two meanings of Vernunft. And in the same sense, I, uh, becoming for me is. Uh, in a narrow sense, the becoming of being, but as its full structure, it's becoming and positing. So I understand the full concept of becoming, so to speak, uh, to be uh, both. And this is, uh, I think there's textual evidence, or at least support in Hegel's logic that we can understand the concept of becoming in this way. One uh, evidence is the, the quote I, I just um, named. Uh, uh, discussed, and also I understand the beginning uh, sections of, of uh, the um, logic of essence uh, on reflection, I understand this to be saying, well, becoming uh, the concept, yeah, if you say the movement from nothing to nothing is the, is the becoming uh, in essence, then we have something like a different modality of becoming, but it's still, in some sense, a becoming which is not becoming anymore, but positive. So I, you see my point? Uh, I see the concept of becoming as having uh, being an internal um, split or division uh, of becoming and positive. Similar yeah, to thank Pashtun. you, I understand. I, I guess I take it so with you, but thank you. That sense, I... Okay, one more short, short question. Curious to hear more. Uh, I 
I, I think I, oh. I was the one. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Thanks, uh, Armin. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to meet you also in person, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and I, 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 I found this, this whole frame uh, from, uh, that, that you had f uh, by in, Spino um, in Jacobi uh, in terms of uh, positing Zetzen and, and also, and also um, your ling linguistic uh, remarks. And it just reminded me that there is a, an interesting passage in Jacobi to Fichte, which could challenge this idea probably a little bit, and it has also a linguistic dimension, because um, Jacobi just um, accuses the speculators, and especially, I mean, uh, Fichte, the, the, wa the one who just starts with all this Zetzen, this Ich, and he says that the speculators, they are vernunft, vernimmt nur sich selbst. Und uh, die, diese Vernunft vernimmt nichts, sondern produziert. And I think that um, if, we, if, we, if we just regard this, this, uh, um, this, this accusation of, of Jacobi, I'm not sure that, that Jacobi uh, would be agreed with, with, with the logic of positing because it is producing, it does, es vernimmt nicht, it's, it es sets its uh, selbst. And I think that Jacobi uh, was like just trying to, to, to refer and think Vernunft as neun. Like Vernunft should just uh, be able to vernehmen von etwas, aber nicht selbst setzen und produzieren. I will be curious what would you say to that. Um, yes. So I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how to, I thank you for the question. I, I tried to um, uh, find an answer. Um, so the question is, um, well, uh, again, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Jacob, Jacobi just says, they cannot be like, I just uh, uh, tried to be sharp. They cannot be becoming for, 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 any, uh, for, 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 uh, for any logic of positing because in that logic, reason posits itself and it just cannot, it, it, it doesn't, es vernimmt nicht das, was ist, sondern es uh, setzt selbst als Vernunft. And this is something which, we, which Jacobi uh, very sharply uh, um, just, just rejects. And this is just, 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 just to help uh, for, uh, mm -hmm. to, to comprehend it, it's something which old uh, Schelling just takes up when, when he just reproaches Hegel that he, Hegel has a concept of werden before there is something geworden is. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a kind of challenge of this logic of positing which, mm -hmm. which, which, could, which could receive, which could, which, which could think becoming. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand, but uh, um, so I, I, and maybe I, don't, I just don't have, uh, uh, th therefore I don't have an answer because I, don't understand the question fully, but um, so yes, I mean, from yeah, f from the point of view of Jacobi, um, maybe the uh, he Hegel would still, of course, just remain in the pro self-productive uh, movement of uh, uh, positing uh, self-production, so to speak, uh, which does not, in any way, um, um, allow to to arrive somewhere uh, where Jacobi arrives in uh, jump or in a practical mm -hmm. inside matter. And so in that sense, the maybe for Jacobi, the uh, self-productivity or self-positing as a becoming is, is st would be still uh, completely enclosed and limited in, a, in, a, in Vernunft, if, if I understand the right. Um, I, we, yeah. I, okay, I'm we not have sure time for two more questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Schneider. I like your uh, uh, presentation very much, uh, very dense and, uh, and precise and important. Um, um, my question is, I would, I would like to force you maybe to go a step further. Um, um, this whole idea of becoming is part of, so to say, the constitution of the beginning of the Ursprung, the Ursprung des Ursprungs. Uh, we constitute Bestimmtheit. So this is, so to say, what is happening in the beginning, and uh, that uh, evolves via the sequence, uh, nothing, uh, uh, excuse me, being, uh, nothing becoming. 
Um, therefore, my question to you is, if, if it's really a problem, so to say, to, yeah, the Ursprung entspringen zu lassen, why can't you say, or could you say, or reinterpret your uh, thought in terms of problem of beginning? Because so a problem of beginning. Because uh, this uh, moment of uh, becoming is an intrinsic moment of beginning, and it is exactly here about the beginning in the sense of uh, Ursprung des Ursprungs, uh, or the Ursprungs, the Denken des Ursprungs. Uh, so could you even go further then? And then the advantage of uh, replacing now becoming by beginning is that you would have a nice bridge to Hegel's criticism of the whole idea of beginning with um, definitions and things like that. Say so again, the last uh, uh, Beginning with definitions, right? You can, right. and this idea of immobility. So uh, this whole idea of beginning as the problem, whereas this coming moment is in particular important, of course, would, so to say, broaden, I think, and strengthen your uh, position. Mm. Do you agree uh, with this or not? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. The um, Well, just begin with the, with the end. Um, and I tried to point at this. Um, yeah, the last part would have been clarifying in this regard. The, the, um, the whole, like this dramatic inversion of uh, the order, so to speak, um, of Spinoza's ethics and Hegel's logic is, is uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, you, you can't start with, yes, causa sui, but not starting with a definition. And in, <laughs> in some sense, I mean, the, the, the section or, uh, in, throughout the subject of um, logic of essence, towards the end, the, the, the behind, uh, what's behind is, is uh, not the definien, uh, definienum, but the definiens, like the, the Content of the definition, causa sui is what uh, we have heard it before. Uh, existentia and with ex, ex, uh, essentia and with existentia, and this uh, uh, unity of essence and existence um, is what is to be constructed throughout uh, actuality. But um, uh, in uh, exactly the reverse order, if you, so to speak, uh, as um, as in, uh, in 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 Spinoza, that we don't start with that uh, as a as a presupposed subject of a definition, causa sui, but we arrive there. So yes, I mean, the the form of the form of uh, cognition uh, or the form, yeah, form of uh, there's a canons uh, uh, as uh, definition demonstration is is implicitly or like in in what Hegel does in the logic before even though before uh, he talks about it already in the way he does the thing he does uh, this uh, critique is operative. I think uh, the inversion of the uh, order. Um, of uh, demonstration and also internal order of the definition, of the first definition of, of uh, the ethics. And res regarding origin uh, Ursprung, well, um, well, I, I think, um, well, I, maybe short answer, I understand Hegel saying like that it's, it's weird and uh, confused, or at first glance confusing that uh, in the quote I gave from the beginning of the logic of uh, concept, uh, where Hegel speaks of the original being the ursprüngliche sein as a result of the genesis of the, con this is strange because we would say, yeah, okay, beginning is being and not at the end. But the whole point is that uh, the originality, the beginning is not original, but it's the necessary abstraction. Also in the order of the, of the logic, uh, uh, of Hegel's logic, um, uh, we we don't, and therefore retrospectively, retroactively, this uh, the status of this being is uh, has to be changed. And at the end of logic, it's a full design, it's the same thing, but a different. Yeah, but I, I short answer would be like the, this: the the originality can only always be uh, accounted for as in the result. Uh, it, in le leaving, l losing it and uh, going away from it. And this is the whole logic of uh, reflection is kind of doing that in terms of negativity. Yeah, abstoßen von sich, also ankommen bei sich, die counter repulsion and so on. But then, yeah, okay, other question. Um, thank you for, for your talk. If, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, your program is to substitute uh, becoming uh, for negativity as a commonplace in the um, 
in our understanding of Hegel's critic of, of Spinoza. Well, uh, anyway, I, mm, I suppose maybe you should take into account that becoming is a kind of uh, 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 dialectics, and Hegel explici explicitly says that there are three kinds of, log of logical dialectics. It's becoming is the first uh, kind of dialectics, uh, appearing in, in others, the second kind, and development is the, s is the third kind of uh, uh, dialectics. So um, uh, Hegel would say that Sp uh, Spinoza began almost in the end of the logic of essence with sub sub substance. So, um, well, in the and that's why Hegel uses the concept of uh, negativity, which is proper of essence, for refuting Spinoza. Anyway, if you don't take into account that becoming is only a dialectic of being, um, with that kind of di dialectics, you cannot think uh, concepts like cause, uh, causality, substantiality, reciprocal action, modality, uh, as uh, uh, necessity. So all those uh, or mode and attributes appearing, appearing or uh, Auslegung des Absoluten, uh, ways of existing, uh, as it was said uh, before. So to think those, uh, um, those concepts according to Hegel, you cannot use uh, the dialectics of uh, becoming. It just doesn't work. So you, you must work with the dialectics of appearing. And, and then the dialectics of appearing is um, contained the structurally by uh, negativity, and that's why that's a common place that everybody <coughs> agrees. It's you you may use uh, it's normal to see we uh, people using other categories to interpret later parts of the science of logic. That works, but just to a certain extent, it does not justice to what is uh, at stake. Well, um, and the second point would, would be about refuting Spinoza. You very well, you pointed the place in uh, is the beginning of the logic of the concept. And the refutation of Spinoza is there, you say very, very well, uh, but it's not negativity. Okay, negativity is just a methodological form of this refutation. The refutation is simply what concept is freedom and spirit, and that's all. The real refutation is just freedom, um, singularity, and spirit, or concept in general. Thank you. Very short, if possible. Very short. Uh, second question, long, we would need a long answer, uh, I, which I don't want to kind of give now. F regarding the first question, I would just reiterate and repeat what I said before. Um, uh, again, I assume and I propose to uh, understand the term becoming in its full extension and its full complexity as internally split, so to speak, in becoming and positing. That's my suggestion. And the term genesis of the concept werden des Begriffs kind of legitimizes this, this uh, conceptual choice, or like this view on the concept. Genesis of the concept summarizes, so to speak, these two modes of, uh, this title summarizes these two modes of, of becoming and um, therefore, when I spoke of becoming, um, uh, so I don't see why I would be accused of using the uh, logic of being mode of becoming, namely becoming, in the logic of essence to say something about uh, what's going on there. Because, no, uh, of course, I, and I introduced it that way, the logic of, uh, the, the, the mode of becoming in essence is positing, no question. But, and this is, would be a rejoinder and a counter uh, question, or like, uh, yeah. I mean, Hegel himself, uh, there are several p places in the at logic of essence where the problem, uh, the question of becoming, as becoming as such as in the mode of uh, being, is uh, uh, kind of resurfacing, and these are exactly preparing the rejoinder of becoming and positing, which uh, is accomplished in in reciprocity. So, for example, in ground or in the model in necessity, uh, these are all um, uh, s passages where Hegel um, actually uh, tries to make this visible as a structure of becoming, which is uh, emerging out of positing, so to speak. And so this is not my imposed problem on Hegel's text, but I think it's in Hegel's text. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Welcome to this uh, particular section of, of the 
of the conference. This uh, section, uh, as you so uh, as the title, the legacy of the dis of the discovery, and uh, we uh, speak about uh, two uh, different discoveries: the discovery of uh, some Spinozian manuscript and the discovery of some uh, Nachschriften uh, von Hegel lectures of the Heidelberg period. And um, I would like to propose a little modification to the, uh, to the program. The program uh, is particularly fully and the discussion is uh, inevitably compressed. Um, in this sense, I think we can use uh, the space uh, of the discussion at the end of the two presentations as a general discussion and not only as a first of all to the two presentations, but uh, to the mm, presentations of, of the day, so to say. And, and it, if someone wants to uh, uh, begin again uh, a, a discussion, this is uh, an opportunity to, to do it. So the first one uh, uh, presentation is from Pina Totaro. Uh, she, is, she is a researcher at the Istituto per il Lessico Intellettuale Europeo, Institute for the, I don't know, Lessico, for the language, but uh, Lessicum, uh, uh, for the European Intellectual Lessicum uh, um, in Rome. Um, she is a, 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 a scholar about early modern philosophy and in particular uh, about uh, Spinoza. Uh, she's author of several books uh, and uh, of a wonderful uh, critical edition of Spinoza's uh, Theological Political Treatise. And the title of the presentation is The Legacy of a Discovery, the Vatican Manuscript of Spinoza's Ethics and some recent edition, editions of the work. And the floor is yours. We have only a few of his letters and two copies of the Dutch translation of the short treatise on God, man, and his well-being. The philosopher left this text unfinished, and it was not included in the 1677 edition of the Opera Postuma. This is uh, the, the frontispiece, uh, front page of the uh, Opera Postuma. Spinoza published only the Renati Descartes Principiorum Philosophiae under his own name in 1663. The Tractatus Theologico Politicus came out anonymously with the wrong name and place of the publisher um, uh, Kunrat Reivers in 1670. As you know, all his other works were published in the volume of the Opera Postuma, edited by a small circle of friends, together with the Dutch translation, the Versio Belgica of the Nagelate Schriften. We know the ethics, Spinoza's best known work, written in Latin, only through the printed text published in the Opera Postuma. Uh, figure echo two. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the index of the ethics uh, with part one, the Deo, etc. And also, this is the first page of the Opera Postuma, um, the Deo, pars prima, the de Deo. The discovery then in 2011 of a, an unknown manuscript of the ethics is therefore a document of crucial importance. The text was published under the title The Vatican Manuscript of Spinoza Setica by De Brille, edited by Lenz Preut and myself. The manuscript, consisting of 133 papers, is the only copy of the philosopher's work. It was written before the publication of the Opera Postuma. The manuscript, entirely in Latin, has no title page and no indication of its author. It is recorded in the catalog of, mat of mat uh, Vatican manuscripts under the title Tractatus Theologiae. 
The librarian who invented the volume was probably unaware of the importance of the manuscript and gave it that generic title, perhaps because the inky pit of the first page reads De Deo, about God. De Deo is in fact the title of the first part of Spinoza's Ethics. Uh, this is the, um, the first page of the manuscript, uh, and uh, um, you, as, uh, as uh, you, uh, you, you see, uh, the inscription uh, on the top, Pars Prima de Deo. Um, it is very strange that in a library such as the Vatican Library, which uh, specializes in theological literature, Nobody ever read this text. I would like to quickly mention the history of the drafting and transmission of this manuscript and explain its presence in the historical archives of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, where it was preserved for centuries. In 1998, the then Pope Benedict the, uh, XVI finally authorized the opening of, to the public of the historical archives of the Congre Congregation of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, now called the Congregation for the Doctr Doctrine of the Faith. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Many of us crowded into the archives to consult those papers that had remained inaccessible for so long. I thus found there the text of the complaint against Spinoza submitted to the Holy Office by the Danish scientist and theologian Neil Stensen on, on September 4, 1677. It contained valuable information of Spinoza's biography and his scientific interests. Indeed, Spinoza had often witnessed the uh, anatomical dissection that Stenson performed at the medical faculty of Leiden University. From Stenson's complaint and other archival uh, documents, it was possible for me to establish that one or more Spinozian manuscripts might still be preserved in some historical library in Rome or the Vatican City. In fact, Stenson expressed to the officials of the Tribunal of the Holy Office his willingness to give them the Spinozian manuscript in his possession. It was possible to establish a precise relationship between the text possessed by Stenson and the ethics manuscript and also to know, with a wide margin of probability, the history of, uh, of its transmission. The history of the drafting of the ethics have, um, have, uh, sorry, has been described in, de uh, in detail by Focke Ackermann and, and Pittstenbachers. We learn from his letters then that Spinoza sent his friends various parts of the work has uh, he composed them. They would read and discuss the texts and then sh share their observations with Spinoza. In the summer of 1665, Spinoza sent the text to Johannes Baumesters and began to devote himself to writing the theological political treatise. The ethics was being completed in the years following 1670. Starting in late 1674, copies of a complete manuscript of the ethics began to circulate among a small circle, circle of the philosopher's friends. Among them were Ehrenfried Walter von Chirnaus and Georg Hermann Schuller. But Spinoza postponed uh, the printing of the work for reasons of prudence. From documents found in the historical Vatican archives, we learn that the uh, manuscript was delivered to the Holy Office by the Danish scientist uh, Niels Stensen, 
during his, his stay in Rome in September 1677. Here. Here we can, uh, in uh, uh, this um, 133 paper folio, uh, we, uh, we can read day 23 September uh, 1677, uh, we read that Neil Stenson delivered the manuscript to the Holy Office. Stenson had converted to Catholicism and was waiting in Rome for his appointment as apostolic vicar and bishop in northern Germany. Stenson's name is closely linked to the history of the Hetic manusc manuscript, the censorship of Spinoza by the Church of Rome. He delivered the ethics to the congregation uh, of the Inquisition so that the members of the dicastery could examine the contents of the text, which the Danish uh, scientist and now theologian considered sacrileg sacril sacrilegious and uh, uh, threatening uh, to the church. In fact, the ethics was included in the I uh, Index Librorum Prohibitorum, uh, the index uh, of uh, forbidden uh, books, by two subsequent decrees in 1679 and 1690 together with the Tractatus Theologico Politicus and all works contained in the Opera Postuma. Here we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the frontispiece uh, of the Index uh, for um, Forbidden Books. Uh, here the, um, the, the page uh, where uh, you can see the burning of the books uh, in the center of the scene. Uh, and uh, also, uh, this is the, um, uh, in the center of the, the page, uh, is the indication of uh, Spinoza's censorship. In a letter dated after Spinoza's death, Cardinal Francesco Barberini asked the apostolic vicar in the United Prov Provinces, uh, Johannes van der Kassel, to gather information about a manuscript book concerning Spinoza's athe atheism. Spinoza wrote the chief of the, the dicastery was of the Jewish nation and is supposed to have composed other printed works very dangerous to the purity of our holy Catholic faith." End of uh, quote. For, uh, further evidence of Neil uh, Stenson's relationship with Spinoza is the letter in print published by Stenson in Florence in 1675. With his conversion from Lutheranism to Catholicism, Stenson gradually gave up his studies of anatomy and physiology to devote himself to ecclesiastical ministry. In the complaint submitted by Stenson a few months after Spinoza's death, and even before the publication of the Opera Postuma, the Danish scientist dwells uh, on his friendship and acquaintance uh, with the philosopher during the years spent in Holland between uh, 1661 uh, and uh, 1663. Stenson mentions in particular Spinoza's manuscripts that he claims to keep with him. With him. Uh, I always carry the manuscript with me, he writes. In Stenson's letter, Spinoza's new philosophy is described in, langui in, language, in language marked by an epidemic conception of the spread of ideas. It is judged by Stenson to be a pestilential evil and of such sedulousness that it appears indispensable to intervene with opportune remedies to stop the danger of the propagation uh, of the same uh, um, evil. 
he considered it nece necessary to prevent others from becoming infected and to intervene in cure, uh, in cure of those already poisoned by it. In the, uh, in the complaint delivered to the congregation, Stenson states that he had received a manuscript of Spinoza's only a few weeks earlier fr from a, Lu a Lutheran, of, uh, Lutheran of religion. So a Lutheran of religion had met Stenson in Rome in the summer of 1677 and handed him Spinoza's unpublished manuscript. Indeed, Stenson had frequent meetings with scholars and scientists of different nationalities and faiths at the papal court of Innocent XI. <coughs> In Florence, he had attempted to convert many fo uh, for fo foreigners to Catholicism, and with that stranger, Forestiero, he had met in Rome, he entered into many conferences on religion. This mysterious stranger was in possession of Spinoza's manuscripts that can easily be identified with the text of the ethics. The writings in Stenson's possessions, uh, uh, possession and, uh, the, um, and denounced by him consisted of the following sacril sacrilegious co contents. A belief in reason, the existence of, uh, of an infinite and eternal substance that is God and of which only the two attributes of infinite extension and infinite cogita cogitation, cogita co co cogitatio, are known. The coincidence of necessity and freedom and the denial of punishments uh, or uh, otherworldly rewards and civil disobedience as the only sin. He qu uh, quotes only this uh, <coughs> co contents. The combination of these testimonies had led me to the conclusion that uh, the unknown Lutheran stranger uh, of whom Stenson speaks is the German f physicist and mathematician uh, uh, Walter von Chirnau, Ehrenfried Walter von Chirnaus. He wrote in a letter from Rome to Leibniz in August 1677 that he had almost fallen for the strong uh, um, uh, persuasive power exercised by Stenson to lead him to Catholicism. In Leiden, Chirnaus came into contact with Spinoza's circle of friends through Schuller and Peter van Gent. Van Gent is certainly the copist of the manuscript, uh, manuscript discovered in the Vatican Library. His reputation as a follower, as a follower of Spinoza, accompanied um, a a okay. <laughs> Chirnaus even on his return home, home, and in fact, Christian Thomasius accused him of introducing the poison of the Spinozism into Germany. The manuscript of the head of the ethics in the Vatican Library is thus certainly the text that Chirnaus delivered to Stenson in Rome in the summer of 1677. Stenson, in his turn, delivered the manuscript to the official of the Inquisition his de, uh, before his departure for Hanover. The Vatican Codex contains the entire text of the ethics, uh, entire because we have here the last page uh, of the uh, f uh, fifth um, part of the ethics, no? With the, um, finis partis quinte, um, and was certainly copied by Peter van Gent for Chirnaus in the first half of 1675. Chirnaus took this te text with him on his travels by Great Britain, France, Italy, and Malta. 
From his correspondence with Spinoza, we know that the Chirn House studied the text with great care, and he inserted some annotation on the strips of paper in the manuscript. Echo, this is an example. Why then did Chirnhaus part with the precious ma manuscript after having carefully preserved it for <coughs> at least two, uh, two years? And why did he hand it over to Stenson? Unfortunately, we have no testimony to this from Chirnhaus other than Stenson's memoir. And these questions will never be satisfactorily answered. Before now, the only source for the text of Spinoza's Ethics was the Latin edition 1677 printed in the Opera Postuma and the Dutch translation based not on the printed version, but on, on lo lost manuscripts in the Nagelate Schriften. We now finally have access to a manuscript of the Latin text that predates um, and is independent uh, of the published ver versions, versions. The first editors of the Opera Post Postuma corrected some obvi obvious errors, but a comparison of the printed version with the Vatican ma manuscript also reveals some errors introduced by the editor of the Opera Postuma. After this first edition, <coughs> There, uh, after the, uh, the, this first edition, there have been several editions of the Ethics in the last two, two centuries since the edition by ha ha Heinrich Paulus published in Jena in 1802, uh, 183. Obviously, every edition, is, um, every edition of a text is always an artificial text. That is, it is the result of comparisons and subsequent interventions, a combination of the witnesses received, the original texts, or those considered to be of reference. This means that the text of a critical edition is not the text as it has been read or as it has, um, as it uh, has actually circulated, and on which interpreters um, have worked over the centuries. This discourse concerns not only critical editions, but also the different editions that have taken place over time. In the case of the ethics, for example, the edition by Paulus, with all its errors and questionable editorial choices, is nevertheless the edition in which the ethics was read by Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, and Schopenhauer. But it is the same for the editions by Van Floten and Land and Karl Gebhardt, or the more recent, uh, the more recent ones by Edwin Curley, Filippo Mignini, Paolo Cristofolini, Corinna Vermeulen, Maxim Rover, or Bernard Potra, among others. Continuing uh, the work set up by Ackermann, in 2020, Stenbachers published a new edition of the Ethics in Paris at the uh, uh, Presse Universitaire de France with a French translation by uh, Pierre-François Moreau. This edition is based on a systematic and complete collection of the three sources known, the, um, the ethics publi uh, published in Opera Postuma in 1677, the Dutch translation with the, the same uh, uh, year, and the Latin Vatican manuscript. From a comparison of these sources, um, we learn, for example, that all the early ed editors uh, of the Opera Postuma 
limited their interventation, inter, uh, interventions to simple stylistic corrections and avoided altering the philosopher's true words with uh, substantial changes to the text. Regarding the editions after the 17th century, we know that the work done so far by the various editors has always re uh, reconstituted uh, the text from a previous edition. Gefreurer took his text from Paulus, for example, or Giovanni Gentile from that of Van Vloot and Land. But the edition of Hetics um, uh, carried out by S Stenbachers and Moreau, unlike all previous attempts, returns uh, for the first time to the original editions, to the three texts of Opera Postuma, Vatican Library, uh, Vatican Library and Nagelati Schriften. It demonstrates that these three sources must all be considered as witne uh, witnesses of the same level, since each of them depends directly and independently on Spinoza's original manuscript, which has been lost. As for Spinoza's original Latin, it is uh, certainly a non-classical and non-academic Latin, but not defective or erroneous in itself. Spinoza's Latin is a living and effective language that should be preserved and reproduced as such. In the past, so-called barbarisms or, or presumed errors were of, often only considered as such because certain terms or, es or expressions deviated from the classical formulas. But Spinoza's Latin was deeply rooted and commonly used in the intellectual culture of his time. In addition, the comparison of the different witnesses makes it now possible to reject a series of hypotheses that have long been accepted as dominant, but which are now revealed to be unfounded. For example, the belief that Nagelati Schriften bore witness to a Latin text by the author other than the, uh, the one used from the opera postuma. Another long-held assumption, which is now uh, outdated, is that Spinoza wrote several different manuscripts of the ethics. In other words, Land, Leopold, and Gebhardt were convinced that Opera Postuma and Nagelati Schriften had documented different versions in the development of the ethics. According to this hypothesis, the Latin terms that appear in the margins of Nagelati Schriften would come from a Latin original which would therefore testify to variations in the author's language. The comparison of the three sources now available and the reconstruction of their textual history allow us to conclude that between the beginning of 1675, that is the time when the Vatican manuscript was probably copied from or, uh, Spinoza's original, and the philosopher's death in February 1677, no changes were made to the text by the author, nor uh, was there any real revision or, or rewriting of the ethics. This means that the hypothesis put forward by Gebhardt, according to which Spinoza continued to re uh, rework and constantly wait for his texts uh, to be rewritten in his last years can now be ruled, ruled out. I have time to read that, okay? Consequently, we must also abandon the theory that in order to define the text of the ethics, it is necessary to take into account all the insertions and additions of the Nagelati Schriften 
as Carl Gebhardt did, in particular with regard to the establishment of the text of the parts one and second of the work. All this is to underline the nu uh, numerous historical, critical, and, and linguistic indications uh, that follow from comparing different editions and that contribute greatly to focusing or reconstructing sources, the editorial history and content of the text. There are, for example, some macroscopic variants uh, in the text of Spinoza's ethic Ethics, which were introduced by 19th century authors and then taken up in every subsequent edition up, up to the present day. A truly interesting case was identified by Paolo Cristofolini in his Italian edition of the Ethics. It is the last scolium of the second part in which a poor, a child, who imagines a horse is mentioned. Concipiamus puerum ecum imaginant, imaginantem. Comparing other passages in which there is also to talk of horses, but of horses with wings, in 1896, the Dutch translator William Mayer thought, thought it was a misprint, a, a misprint and changed the passage to read concipiamus puerum ecum alatum imaginantem. The addition of wings to that horse, which are not found uh, in the Editio Princeps and in the Dutch version, was later accepted by Jan Hendrik Leopold, but Charles Hapun, and various translators in the different languages. Finally, by Gebhardt, and then taken up, taken up by all without hesitation. However, both the posthumous edition and the Vatican manuscript demonstrate uh, unequivocally that the horse Spinoza spe uh, speaks of has no wings and that it must be put back on its legs. Thank you so much. So thank you, Pina Totaro, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, we go now to the other presentation. Um, it is from, uh, which is from, uh, oh, of Klaus Fieweg. Um, Klaus Fieweg is a professor uh, for philosophy at the Friedrich Schiller Universi University, Jena. Uh, he is a very known uh, scholar uh, about uh, Hegel's philosophy, German idealism, uh, and uh, um, the notion of skepticism, theory and history of skepticism. Uh, he published a lot of books uh, on the topics, uh, and I won't only uh, mention here the biography, who was published in 2019, and the title is Hegel, der Philosoph der Freiheit. Um, the title of the presentation today is Wissenschaft der Freiheit, Heidelberger Hegel Nachschriften von Karo W. Bitte, Klaus. Ja, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank äh, an die Organis Organisatoren der Tagung für die Möglichkeit, hier äh, diese Karo W. Papiere etwas bekannt zu machen, etwas zu präsentieren. Einige äh, aus dem Publikum kennen das schon, weil es schon Präsentationen gab in Padua, in Stuttgart, in Rom, in Pisa etc. Wissenschaft der Freiheit, das ist eine Stelle aus Hegels Heidelberger Enzyklopädie. Das haben wir gewählt als Überschrift für das Projekt der Edition dieser Nachschriften. Es gab eine große Pressereaktion, 
vom Guardian bis zu Corriere della Sera, Frankfurter Allgemeine, also es wurde auch international wahrgenommen, der Fund. Besonders zwei Seiten auch dann in Corriere della Sera, also einmal eine kurze Darstellung des Fundes und dann eine, ein längerer Beitrag von zwei Seiten. Hier für die, besonders für die italienischen Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Äh, dort sehen Sie äh, die äh, Pressereaktion in Italien war am intensivsten. Mehr als in Deutschland. Äh, hier ist eine äh, kleine Information, äh, wie ich zu diesem Fund kam. Nach der Publikation meiner Hegel-Biografie schickte mir ein Historiker aus Bonn einen Aufsatz über Hegel und Bonn von 1985 und dort gibt es einen Hinweis auf diese Möglichkeit, dort, dass in der Freisinger Dombibliothek von Windischmanns Sohn Nachschriften von Hegel existieren. Ich konnte dann im vorigen Jahr diese, äh, dieses Archiv besuchen und fand dann diese Papiere des ersten hegelschen Assistenten, würde man heute sagen, in, in Heidelberg. Und es gibt einen klaren Hinweis dazu äh, in den Hegelbriefen, Briefen von und an Hegel. Das Englisch ist hier provisorisch, bitte ich um Nachsicht. Wurde schnell nicht von mir übersetzt, aber ich hoffe, es ist einigermaßen verständlich. Dort wird von Hegel an Windischmann mitgeteilt, dass Karové ihm Papiere überbringen wird. Besonders interessierten den Professor Windischmann, das war ein Professor für Philosophie in Bonn, interessierten die Vorlesung über die Geschichte der Philosophie. Das war ein besonderes Interesse und das wird dann von, äh, von Windischmann bestätigt. Das ist also ein Beleg, dass die Papiere auch dort angekommen sind in Bonn, vom äh, Our Young Friend und besonders äh, die äh, Nachschrift über äh, die Geschichte der Philosophie die Windischmann auch wahrscheinlich in seinen Vorlesungen in Bonn dann verwendet hat. Das war also äh, die Ursache oder der, äh, der Anlass des Fundes, äh, dass der Historiker aus Bonn eben diesen entscheidenden Hinweis gab auf die Existenz dieser Papiere. Es gibt aber schon einen früheren Hinweis, den äh, man nicht gründlich nachgegangen ist, auch ich selber nicht. Äh, hier steht das, äh, äh, Karl Rosenkranz hat für seine Hegelausgabe, Briefausgabe, die er vorhatte, äh, Briefe gesucht und dann hat er gesagt, es gibt noch Möglichkeiten bei Cousin in Paris, äh, bei Windischmanns Erben, also ganz klar, denn es, die Papiere liegen bei einem Sohn, äh, im Nachlass von einem Sohn von Windischmann in München, Freising, und von Kreuzer in Heidelberg. Also es gab schon im 19. Jahrhundert Hinweise auf diese Papiere. Warum sie nicht gefunden wurden, äh, gibt es einige Gründe, die ich dann noch benennen werde. Hier ist der Moment des, der Discovery festgehalten. <lacht> Sie sehen das. <lacht> ich bekam erst zuerst einen, äh, einen sogenannten Archivkarton und äh, der Archivdirektor öffnete den Karton. Und dann suchte er verschiedene äh, Papiere heraus, das waren so verschiedene Konvolute. Und dann gab er mir in die Hand sogar und sagte, hier, ja, hier steht Hegel drüber, Phänomenologie von Hegel. Und ich habe sofort Einspruch erhoben, nein, 
in ihrem äh, Buch, in ihrer Sammlung, also es gibt ein sogenanntes Findbuch, sagt man im Deutschen, also so eine äh, Hinweise, welche Papiere in diesem Archiv liegen. Da steht drin Phänomenologie von Heil, H-E-Y-L. Das heißt, es hat ein Archivmitarbeiter irgendwann falsch transkribiert. Sonst hätte man es wahrscheinlich schon gefunden. Also glücklicherweise für mich stand da H-E-Y-L und nicht Degel. Und das war dann ein Teil aus der, jetzt zum Philosophischen, das ist ein Teil aus der Phänomenologie in der Enzyklopädie, nicht die Jena-Enzyklopädie. Es geht also um die Heidelberger Enzyklopädie und das ist eine Passage daraus. Das war also das erste, die erste Handschrift, die ich da gefunden habe. Es handelt sich um circa 5000 Seiten und es sind Nachschriften zur Logik und Metaphysik. Da gibt es schon eine in, aus Heidelberg, aber die ist von einem nicht so kompetenten mitgeschrieben wie Hegels Schüler Karové. Dann Enzyklopädie, also zwei Nachschriften der Hegelschen Enzyklopädie, die Hegel-Forscher wissen das, es gibt bisher keine Nachschrift von Hegels Enzyklopädie. Das sind also die beiden ersten, überhaupt. Dann gibt es die erste Ästhetik-Nachschrift, 1818, und dann äh, die äh, Vorlesung über die Geschichte der Philosophie. Verschiedene Konvolute, teilweise überschrieben mit äh, Aristoteles, Kant und so weiter. Also insgesamt Unglaubliche 5000 Seiten. Hier haben Sie einen kleinen Eindruck über die Handschrift. Das ist ein Paragraph aus der Enzyklopädie. Und ist nicht, es ist keine Mitschrift, keine direkte Mitschrift. Wir wissen das von Victor Cousin, dem bekannten französischen Philosophen. Er schrieb in einem Brief, wie die, wie die Aufnahme von Hegels Gedanken in Heidelberg verlaufen ist. Also zuerst ging man zur Vorlesung Hegels. Das war schon schwierig genug. Dann haben die Studenten zusammengesessen, also die Hörer, Cousin, Carové und andere. Dann gab es ein Seminar mit Hegel zu einzelnen Teilen, nicht zu allen diesen Vorlesungen. Und dann schreibt Cousin humorvoll, am Abend ging man zum Orakel. Also am Abend ging man zu Hegel. Das war die vierte Stufe und erst danach hat äh, Carové die Sachen niedergeschrieben. Also äh, eine klassische, wenn man das so sagen darf, Nachschrift, nicht Mitschrift. Alle diese Papi Sie sehen es auch am Schriftbild, ich bin kein geübter Editor, aber am Schriftbild, dass das keine Mitschrift ist. Ich habe schon mal eine hegelische Mitschrift ediert und da war ein Drittel der Worte waren Abkürzungen. Da hat der Mitschreiber Heimann, der bekannt ist als Hegel-Mitschreiber, hat die ein Drittel der Worte abgekürzt. Da stand Weltgeschichte und WG stand da oft. Ja, und hier äh, äh, sieht man ziemlich klar, äh, dass es eine klassische Bearbeitung ist. Und ich nenne es, das ist jetzt etwas vorgreifend, wir haben damit, vielleicht ist es etwas unvorsichtig, was ich jetzt sage, wir haben die erste Interpretation der hegelischen Philosophie mit diesen kompetenten Nachschriften des ersten hegelischen Schülers, des ersten hegelischen Assistenten, Garové. Hier ist noch die erste Seite von Logik und Metaphysik. Sie sehen, es beginnt gleich mit Aristoteles. Also es wird gleich klar gesagt, worum es hier geht. Logik und Metaphysik. Die erste Seite der Nachschrift zu Logik und Metaphysik. Wobei, es ist noch zu erforschen, wahrscheinlich ist es die Logik aus der Enzyklopädie. Also die kleine Logik. Das ist aber noch genau, wir haben von den 5000 Seiten, um das einzuschieben, äh, bisher 500 
etwas genauer äh, transkribiert und 1000 äh, relativ äh, genau, also nicht ganz genau. Insofern äh, kann man natürlich nur teilweise etwas sagen, was in den äh, Manuskripten steht. Ja, das ist äh, ein äh, Zitat von Hans Friedrich Fulda äh, über, das, äh, äh, über die Lehrtätigkeit in äh, Heidelberg. Also dass Hegel das bekanntlich als äh, Text für seine Vorlesungen geschrieben hat, die Enzyklopädie. Na, also äh, wichtig, ne? und auch äh, eine Art dialogisches äh, Lernen damit versucht hat, ne? also dass es auch Seminare gab. Das war damals noch nicht so ganz üblich. Es begann, aber Hegel hat das dort äh, äh, praktiziert und Karové war halt äh, einer der wichtigsten Zeugen für diese Vorlesungen. Etwas zum Mitschreiber oder Nachschreiber Karové, äh, wenig bekannt, ich ha, äh, habe es äh, auch schon polemisch gesagt, es gibt Studien über äh, den Jung- und den Althegelianismus, äh, den Links- und Rechtshegelianismus, Karové kommt in keiner der Studien prominent vor, er wird mal genannt, aber er hat, äh, ich werde das versuchen nur anzudeuten, ne, also eine äh, gewaltige publizistische Tätigkeit absolviert, nachdem seine akademische Karriere zerstört wurde durch die preußische Behörden. Also der erste Assistent von Hegel, wichtig, das betone ich immer, er hat bei Hegel promoviert mit einer Arbeit gegen den Antisemitismus von Fries. Das war seine Doktorarbeit bei Hegel. Und Hegel musste das verteidigen, weil äh, die Kollegen waren wohl nicht so ganz dafür. Ne? Aber Hegel hat vehement verteidigt, das steht auch drin, wenn also äh, die äh, Thesen von Fries hätte er nicht als, äh, als Doktorarbeit angenommen, schreibt Hegel. Aber die Schrift gegen den Antisemitismus, äh, die ist wichtig äh, und das zeigt, äh, auch Hegels politische Position in Heidelberg. In, die, in diesem Kontext der Burschenschaften, Hegel äh, war sozusagen der Mentor von Karové und Karové war der Vorsitzende äh, der Heidelberger Burschenschaften. Und da gab es zwei Fraktionen, das eine war die nationalistische, deutschstümelnde Fraktion und die andere waren die, äh, die Gruppe um Karové. Und die nannte man abschätzig, hören Sie zu, die Hegelianer. Das waren die Universalisten. Karové hat erreicht, dass in das Statut der Heidelberger Burschenschaften äh, hineingeschrieben wurden, alle Studenten können Mitglied der Burschenschaft werden. Als Karové mit Hegel nach Berlin ging, wurde gestrichen, äh, Ausländer und Juden können nicht Mitglied der Burschenschaft werden. Das lasse ich mal dahingestellt, aber ganz klar die politische Wirkung von Karové und äh, von Hegel. Äh, dann die Habilitation wurde verhindert in Preußen und er wurde dann äh, ein katholischer Publizist, Buch, Buchautor, der besonders sich Verdienst, äh, Verdienste erworben hat für die Bekanntmachung französischen äh, Gedankenguts in Deutschland. Er hat äh, Bücher über die französische Revolution, über Saint-Simonismus äh, geschrieben, äh, also äh, war da äh, lebenslang befreundet mit Victor Cousin, die sich auch da öfter getroffen haben. Äh, was ich auch nennen will, äh, äh, Karové war... Mitglied der American Anti-Slavery Society. Und er hat erreicht, dass wahrscheinlich der erste Afroamerikaner Ehrendoktor der Universität Heidelberg wurde. Also man sieht, ein echter Hegelschüler, ein Universalist, der Anti-Slavery, gegen Sklaverei, 
Ja, das ist ganz deutlich. Ne? 1848, glaube ich, oder 1949 wurde Pennington in Heidelberg zum Ehrendoktor gekürt und das auf Vorschlag von Caroe. Also das ist nur eine kleine Fußnote, aber er hat auch die USA besucht auf Einladung von Pennington und äh, war ein anerkanntes Mitglied dieser American Anti-Slavery Society und hat in Deutschland die erste Gesellschaft äh, zur Abschaffung der Sklaverei gegründet. Also äh, sein politisches Wirken war durchaus äh, wichtig und für die erste deutsche Revolution 1848 war er Mitarbeiter äh, von Jakob Grimm, dem berühmt sind die Brüder Grimm für die Märchen, aber der eine äh, der Brüder saß in, äh, Frankfurter, in, in der Frankfurter Paulskirche als äh, Abgeordneter und er hat für ihn zugearbeitet. Also auch die äh, Beteiligung, indirekte Beteiligung an der ersten Revolution 1848. Äh, was, äh, auch, äh, was ich auch nicht gekannt hatte vor diesem Fund, er hat ein romantisches Märchen veröffentlicht, The Story Without an End, was in USA und äh, England große Wirkung hatte durch die Übersetzung von Sarah Austin 1834. Und es wurde literar äh, Literargeschichtlich, literaturgeschichtlich wichtig. Charles Dickens hat dann darauf reagiert mit einer Parodie. The Story Without a Beginning. Also auch wieder etwas Hegelisches. The Story Without an End, an End and a Beginning. Okay, ich bedanke mich für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Okay. okay, we can start the discussion. It seems to me to be in a talk show, in a TV talk <laughs> show. <laughs> but, um, um, so uh, we have 30 minutes uh, uh, in order to discuss, uh, in order to put questions about the two presentations. And if you want, as I uh, told before, uh, it is the opportunity in order to uh, Began again with the discussions uh, of the uh, others' talks too. So, please. Yeah, impertinent. Okay. Uh, sorry for the microphone. Okay. Is one impertinent question to uh, Mr. Fiebeck because uh, everybody is now excited and waiting for the editing of uh, the findings. But of course, um, these are the uh, this is the editing of the originals. <coughs> and my question is, what happens with the originals? Uh, are you the owner now, or where do they go to? Do they go to some uh, archive afterwards, or uh, because they, of course, I I extremely valuable, right? So and uh, so yeah. What what about this, Klaus? Are you a multimillionaire now, or you remain also on a philosophical level? Ich bin kein ich bin kein Jurist, aber die äh, Papiere, so viel ich weiß, nach deutschem Recht äh, gehören dem Archiv. Okay. Also soweit ich informiert bin, ist das im deutschen Recht so, ne? Oder? <lacht> naja, ich frage Hegel-Experten, wie ist das mit dem Besitz? <lacht> nee, die gehören. Ja, und, und zum einen und zum anderen, wo werden sie denn aufbewahrt? Was ist Im, sehr äh, in dem Archiv. In dem Archiv? Ja, und, und die sind. sind jetzt auch äh, wahrscheinlich, äh, kann das, das Archiv kann die auch nicht verkaufen, weil es gibt in Deutschland eine zentrale Stelle zur Erhaltung schriftlichen Kulturguts. Und die hat die Papiere jetzt auf das höchste Level 
der Erhaltung, also die müssen jetzt auch restauriert werden, erhalten werden, weil es so einen leichten Insektenfraß gibt und so weiter. Und äh, damit äh, können diese Papiere äh, auch nicht von dem Archiv oder von den, das ist ja die Diözese äh, München-Freising, äh, können wahrscheinlich auch nicht verkauft werden, weil sie dann zum Kulturgut im weitesten Sinne gehören. Also das ist soweit meine Information jetzt reicht, in aller Vorsicht. Darf man scannen? Nein. Ja. Ja, doch. Ja. Aha. Die sind gescannt. Sind bis, gescannt. Bis auf ein paar Beschädigte, die jetzt restauriert werden müssen. Aha. Weil sie jetzt auf dem hohen Level sind, müssen sie äh, in die Restauration. Aber das ist nur ein kleiner Teil der Manuskripte. Die anderen sind gut erhalten. Und, und, und du hast die ganze Zeit gesagt, wir. Also wer, wer wird das transkribieren? Ja, da wird ein äh, Antrag bei der Deutschen Forschungsgemeinschaft vorbereitet und wir, das ist also ein kleines Team, äh, zusammen mit einem Bamberger Professor für Philosophie, Professor Christian Iljes äh, und einigen Mitarbeitern, die jetzt schon arbeiten. Es hat sich bei uns, das habe ich nie erlebt, eine Stiftung gemeldet von sich aus, die möchte das fördern ohne dass man da einen Antrag gestellt hat. Also das war schon ein Novum. Und da hat ein Mitarbeiter, der hat jetzt diese ersten Teiltranskriptionen erstellt. Denn man muss ja mit, einem gewissen, äh, mit einer gewissen Textkenntnis muss man ja äh, bei dem DFG-Antrag aufwarten. Also es gibt einige Teile, die will ich gleich erwähnen, die vielleicht spektakulär sind. Es gibt drei neue Passagen, zu dem in der Hegel-Forschung besonders äh, wichtigen äh, Gebiet äh, der Herr und Knecht Beziehung, der Anerkennungsbeziehung. Drei, äh, also zwei aus der Enzyklopädie, also den beiden Nachschriften zur Enzyklopädie. Phänomenologieabschnitt und Hegel hat in Heidelberg das erste Mal gelesen äh, unter der Überschrift Anthropologie und Psychologie. Nur das, diese Überschrift ist nicht ganz korrekt. Er hat gelesen Anthropologie, Phänomenologie und Psychologie, also den subjektiven Geist. Und da hat er in Heidelberg äh, vorlesen und diese Nachschrift haben wir auch. Und deswegen sind es drei Passagen über Herr und Knecht, über Anerkennung. Von Karobé. Und andere Neuigkeiten, die vielleicht gibt es da noch Nachfragen, aber das ist ein kleines Beispiel, dass durchaus Neuigkeiten zu erwarten sind. Wir wissen alle, dass Heidelberg die erste Station als Professor war, also dass er dort diese Vorlesungen in diesem breiten Maße halten konnte. In Jena hat er auch schon Vorlesungen gehalten, aber eben nicht als wohlbestallter Professor der Philosophie. Und damit sind seine ersten großen akademischen Vorlesungen. Okay. Uh, okay. Wir sind Miriam again and then Steven. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, no. okay. Steven and then Miriam. Okay. Ah, no. I have the microphone. Okay, Miriam. Miriam. Noch, eine, noch eine kleine provokative Frage. Da gab es ein Zitat von Fulda, dass Hegel so eine dialogische Art hatte zu lehren. Also das ist das erste Mal, dass ich das höre. Und also mit, vielleicht, vielleicht mit Caro B., aber wer, wer war noch drin? Naja, das Wie, gab... Wer, äh, na, erstens, äh, der erste Aspekt war, dass die äh, Enzyklopädie äh, nicht zuerst als akademische Schrift veröffentlicht wurde, sondern zum Behufe der Vorlesungen. Das, ist also, ja, das war also ein Buch, ein Kompendium für Hegels Heidelberger Vorlesungen. Das steht auf der ersten Seite der Enzyklopädie, wenn man das richtig liest. Dann hatte ich angedeutet, äh, dass es so, äh, so eine Veranstaltungen gab, die heutigen Seminaren vielleicht äh, mit heutigen Seminaren vergleichbar sind. Ne? Also dass da einige der Studenten, sicher der interessierten Studenten, 
äh, dort äh, teilgenommen haben. Und sicher Carové, Cousin und man hat noch ein paar andere Namen. Der Theologe Richard Rothe war wohl dabei und ein Parkenstecher und so weiter. Also es gibt Hinweise, dass das ein kleiner Kreis war. Und dann äh, gab es die Möglichkeit, direkt mit dem Orakel zu debattieren. Denn es war schwierig genug, die neue Terminologie, die, man kann sich das vorstellen, Hegel kommt nach Heidelberg und da kommt ja aber ganz neue Sprache, Anführungszeichen. Und äh, das war natürlich für die Studenten äh, eine hohe Hürde, ein hohes Hindernis, äh, da, das nachvollziehen zu können. Und da hat Karowee eine große Rolle gespielt, das wird beschrieben. Er hat versucht, Hegel zu übersetzen. Steven. Uh, yes, I Short question to uh, Signora um, Dotaro. Can you tell us a bit more about um, any changes to the text of the ethics? Uh, I mean, w taking out winged is one thing, but yeah. is there anything more substantial? And basically, do I have to buy a new copy now, having just bought Curly's two big <laughs> volumes at great expense? Do I have to throw those away or give them to my kids? And then, um, and then, Klaus, ganz kurz, kannst du was zur Veröffentlichung äh, sagen? Du, du hast was da mitzuteilen, glaube ich, äh, und äh, danach. Äh. But first of all, maybe. Ja. Um, there are hundred and hundred variations, different uh, um, formulations in the uh, ma manu eth manuscript of ethics and the opera postum and the printed uh, uh, edition. <coughs> we um, we have many many different uh, lessons, but uh, in reality, um, there is only one perhaps uh, um, difference, uh, different, very philosophical uh, difference. Because in general, the is uh, um, the, um, mm, they are only a. Um, not, not so important, uh, fi philosophically uh, uh, important uh, um, variations. Um, but all the um, elencus, the index uh, uh, of these uh, different uh, lessons uh, are published in the, um, in the edition that we uh, published uh, in um, uh, 2011. And uh, we uh, produced um, all the uh, this um, uh, index uh, of the different lessons. Thank you. Yeah, ja, uh, before I antworte, es gibt uh, eine kleine Beziehung zwischen unseren beiden Vorträgen. Uh, die Kollegin hat das, glaube ich, vorhin nicht genannt. Uh, an der Paulus Ausgabe in Jena war Hegel aktiv beteiligt. Absolutely, ja. Yeah. Das ist eine kleine Beziehung zwischen diesem Spinoza und Paulus und, und Hegel. Hegel hat nicht mit ediert, aber er hat geholfen, äh, Paulus ja. äh, Bücher zu besorgen und hat wahrscheinlich auch, wahrscheinlich auch inhaltlich eingewirkt. Das ist, so wie, soweit ich weiß, noch nicht genau untersucht, ob Hegel da direkt eingewirkt hat. Also mit Hegel. der Textgestaltung, das... Hegel worked, uh Uh, to the annotations ja, to ja, the ja, ja, political, genau. uh, theological, ja, ja. political aber treatise. Aber er hat wahrscheinlich noch mehr Einfluss gehabt, aber ja. das ist noch ein Feld für Forschung. Jetzt zur Edition, äh, wenn äh, wir eine Förderung erhalten, äh, dann sollen, die, äh, die, sollen diese äh, Karowee-Papiere in vier Bänden der kritischen hegel werkausgabe publiziert werden. Also vier Bände, zwei zur Enzyklopädie, einer zur Ästhetik und einer zu den Vorlesungen über Geschichte der Philosophie. Für die Italiener die Edition der Ästhetik haben wir nach Rom exportiert. Logik und das soll Frau Janelli. Logik und Metaphysik? Ja, das, auch, kommt, das, das kommt auch. ist innerhalb der beiden Bände zur Enzyklopädie. Ah ja, okay. Weil es sich, vorsichtig, wahrscheinlich um die kleine Logik, also die enzyklopädische Logik handelt. Uh, sorry. Also zur Edition. Mehr kann ich dazu nicht sagen. Also äh, das ist sozusagen äh, der, Plan. der Plan, das Vorhaben äh, als Teile der äh, 
kritischen Wertausgabe. Können wir jetzt so alle kleine Beiträge machen? So für eine kleine ja, das wird, das Euro wird nicht wollen. billig. Ne? <lacht> <lacht> um, Pina, no, only, then, sorry, just a bit on. Um, this uh, um, lack of uh, philosophical variations uh, is, a, is a very important thing, uh, thing because uh, we know now that uh, uh, all the uh, ethics in the opera postuma, in the printed uh, edition, is the same text that Spinoza, on, uh, uh, on which Spinoza worked uh, um, two years before. And, so and uh, for example, uh, many, um, many authors, many editors uh, supposed that the last part of the ethics, uh, the appunto, the, the five, uh, fifth part with the um, amor de intellectualis, uh, with these uh, difficult concepts uh, in Spinoza, uh, they supposed that this last part was not original. They suppose that uh, perhaps uh, uh, the editors, uh, the, the friend, the, the circle of friend of Spinoza's friends, uh, libraries, for example, uh, wrote uh, this uh, um, this last part. But in uh, with this manuscript, mm. we know that uh, all parts of ethics are of Spinoza. <laughs> Uh, and Spinoza also wrote uh, this last uh, part. Thank you. Melamed? Uh, please, the microphone. I, I, I yeah, but it, it is no, necessary oh, for, for, for the registration. Oh, I, I can. It is necessary for the registration. No, no, no. That, that's fine. I mean, I just have a question about. Um, okay. I, I just have a question about um, um, about Chirnaus. Is there. Is there a Nachlass of Chirnaus? Is, sorry? Is there a Nachlass of Chirnaus? Yes, th there is a Nachlass of Chirnaus. Uh, um, uh, yes, and uh, um, the, the Nachlass of Chirnaus uh, is a, a wonderful uh, a Nachlass. In, uh, there is in, uh, I, I can't uh, uh, pronounce, um, <laughs> have the, the, the uh, right uh, uh, pronunciation of this. Breslau is for, for us. Uh, is a, is a in now is in Poland, uh, but it was uh, uh, this city was in uh, uh, in Germany before the uh, Second World, uh, World War. War. And now is in Breslau, Breslau, but it's not uh, the the, uh, the right uh, pronunciation. And uh, but the, the the very important thing uh, of this Nachlass is that uh, the uh, library where it is uh, uh, conservato, it is uh, it is, uh, they published online the uh, all manuscripts uh, of Chirnau's uh, uh, manuscripts. And, uh, and uh, th there are some uh, works, manuscript works, very, very important. Uh, I, um, I, I say uh, to my student, for example, to go to Breslau to study uh, the, because Chirnaus is a very important, uh, is uh, Medicina Mentis, uh, and uh, you know uh, every, everything about him. Das ist auch ein, ein weiterer Bezug zu Hegel, auch äh, in der Jagiellonischen Bibliothek, so heißt die in Breslau, liegen auch Hegel-Manuskripte, unter anderem das umstrittene älteste Systemprogramm des deutschen Idealismus. Hier haben wir wieder eine zufällige Relation zwischen Spinoza und Hegel. I, I wanted to go back to the edition uh, of the of the work uh, in the sense, uh, so we uh, know that the edition come uh, into the critical edition of uh, Minor and uh, about the Rauskabe, about the, 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 the editor. Uh, are you the editor or uh, are others the editor of the single parts? And uh, uh, again, um, it is not uh, easy to to editing a, uh, a book uh, like uh, uh, aesthetic or so on uh, and so how do you think to select 
the, the people who can uh, do this work. Yeah, uh, vielen Dank. Uh, es ist vorgesehen, das ist natürlich, hängt noch von der Bewilligung, der Förderung von der Deutschen Forschungsgemeinschaft ab, uh, dass uh, uh, Christian Ilias und ich die Bände herausgeben. Okay. Und die einzelnen Bände haben aber dann eigene Bandherausgeber. Okay. Und wir haben ein kleines Team äh, aus äh, Bamberger äh, jüngeren Forschern und äh, jener jüngeren Forschern und äh, aus Italien kommen für die äh, Ästhetik und für die Naturphilosophie. Ja, bitte schön. Ah, sorry, um, please. <lacht> ich habe auch eine Frage zu den Hegel-Texten. Ähm, die Enzyklopädie war schon geschrieben als, und publiziert als... Entschuldigung, hören genau, Sie mich? Äh, ja. die, also die Enzyklopädie, die, äh, war, die erste Auflage war schon publiziert, richtig? Und... Oder liege ich da falsch, als Hegel dann die Vorlesung gehalten hat, von denen wir jetzt die, Mitschriften ja, haben? Die erste Vorlesung, da erschien ungefähr in der Mitte oder im äh, zweiten Teil, erschien dann erst die Enzyklopädie. Okay. Für die zweite Vorlesung hatte er schon die en Heidelberger Enzyklopädie parat. Das heißt, man hat, also, oder man kann erwarten, dass man in dem Text teilweise einfach die Paragraphen der, der Heidelberger Enzyklopädie hat, aber ja. auch nicht. Also wie, wie ist das Verhältnis, können Sie dazu was schon sagen, ob das sozusagen eine Version der Heidelberger Enzyklopädie ist, die anders ist, oder ist es einfach exakt dasselbe mit Zusätzen sozusagen? Nee, das ist nicht exakt dasselbe, ja. das hatte ich versucht zu sagen. Es ist aus meiner Sicht und dem jetzigen Kenntnisstand, ich muss immer sehr vorsichtig sein, die Forschungen sind noch am Anfang, ist es eine erste Interpretation von Hegels Enzyklopädie, von Hegels anderen Teilen seines Systems. Also das kann man an einzelnen Paragraphen sehen. Ne? Das ist also nicht äh, eins zu eins Hegel. Aber das macht den Charakter ja von Mitschriften aus. Und hier ist es eben eine besonders kompetente Mitschrift aus äh, jetziger Sicht, weil eben, äh, wie beschrieben, Karo w. da eine besondere Rolle einnahm, als erster Gehilfe oder Assistent oder wie man es auch immer bezeichnet, äh, Hegels, den Hegel selber auserwählt hat für diese Funktion in Heidelberg, der geholfen hat für die bei den studentischen Debatten. Mhm. Ne, das beschreibt, äh, man lese einen Brief von Victor Cousin, er beschreibt dieses äh, Milieu und wie man sich äh, mit den hegelschen Vorlesungen beschäftigt hat. Und dann natürlich auch, das, das ist eine Editionsforschungsaufgabe, wenn die äh, Heidelberger Enzyklopädie publiziert wurde, dann ändert sich natürlich auch das Rezeptionsverhalten. Dann haben ja die Beteiligten auch das publizierte Buch von Hegel. Die beiden Sachen müssen natürlich genau betrachtet werden. Ich hoffe, ja. das ist einigermaßen klärend. Ja, ja, ja. Also ist sozusagen eine Auslegung eines Buches, was noch gar nicht existiert. Ja, ja. Toll. Also die wunderbar. erste Vorlesung, ja. ja. Und Teil, dann erschien, ich glaube, äh, äh, im Juni, im Mai oder Juni ist doch die äh, erste Heidelberger Ausgabe erschienen. Ne? Und da äh, hat Hegel gelesen. Noch. Ja. Okay. Other questions or, uh, uh, yeah, Anton Kabeschkin. Ja, auch eine Frage zu Hegels äh, Ausgabe. Ähm, ich habe es äh, hab äh, interessant gefunden, dass er, ähm, dass, ähm, dass er das Logik und Metaphysik, eine, äh, äh, einen Kurs Logik und Metaphysik wieder genannt hat. Er hat ja einen Kurs in Jena vor der Phänologie des Geistes, auch Jena Logik und Metaphysik genannt. Äh, und damals wurde das so gedacht, dass äh, Logik so, so etwas wie vorbereitende Disziplin für die Metaphysik war. 
done in the uh, Wissenschaft der Logik, uh, hat er das anders konzipiert natürlich, dass die Logik tritt an, auf, an die Stelle der Metaphysik. Ja. Uh, und er hat die Disziplin jetzt einfach Logik ja. oder Wissenschaft der Logik genannt, aber jetzt in diesen Vorlesungen uh, wieder Logik und Metaphysik. Das ist also ein bisschen ja. interessant. Ich glaube, wenn ich mich recht erinnere, äh, geht das bis äh, zum Schluss der Berliner Zeit. Ich glaube, erst die letzte Vorlesung okay. heißt nur Logik. Das war damals üblich, akademisch, dass als Logik und Metaphysik so ähnlich wie Anthropologie und Psychologie. Warum hat er Phänomenologie weggelassen? Okay. Aus akademischen äh, Rücksichten. Auch äh, wurde äh, von, äh, von den Kollegen und vom Dekan in Heidelberg gewünscht, dass er über Enzyklopädie liest. Hegel wollte über Naturphilosophie lesen. Was hat er gemacht? Er las Enzyklopädie und dann ewig lange über Naturphilosophie. <lacht> Deswegen sind die Passagen zur Naturphilosophie innerhalb dieser Nachschriften äh, ziemlich umfangreich, weil Hegel dies nutzte diese Lücke. Birgit Sandkaulen. Ja, dort Birgit. Uh, thank you. Uh, short question for Pina. <lacht> A funny question, I think. Um, could we say that it's a little bit like List der Vernunft, that the manuscript was preserved in, in Vatican? And could. No, I'm not. Yeah. Genauso wie Hegels Manuskripte yeah. im Domarchiv, im katholischen Archiv. Exactly. <laughs> And could have been otherwise yeah. lost. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, si, si. Uh, I'm not on the Vatican side, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's only to ask for list der Vernunft. <laughs> Perhaps. I don't know. In fact, no, no. It is. Uh, It is? Uh, It is, okay. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Because it's very, very strange, you know, that uh, when I, uh, I said to uh, some friends uh, in uh, France or uh, in uh, Holland, for example, I said, uh, in Rome there is some manuscript, some Spinoza's manuscript. Nobody uh, could... Yeah. Uh, um, Pierre-François yeah, Pierre uh, Pierre Moreau uh, um, said, that it was impossible because Spinoza never, um, never uh, left uh, Holland and uh, it was impossible that uh, his manuscripts uh, um, were in, in Rome. But Stenson wrote uh, if, uh, uh, that he, uh, he gave to the uh, Inquisition uh, this manuscript, and in, s in a certain way, I, uh, I, veramente, I, I searched for years uh, this uh, uh, manuscript because uh, it was possible that uh, he, no, that, no. <laughs> that he survives. No, no, no. Divide. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have to, to leave the, the, the room. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. <laughs>